Uh, I thought I was talking to myself here. It's great to be here in Cape Town. Even though Cape Town could have done a much better job with the weather. But I have it on good authority that the weather will change because this is a city of seven seasons in one. I certainly do look forward to that. That said, I would actually appreciate if the weather outside remained inclement so as to, for all of you to resist the temptation to leave this venue. You need to be trapped here, so I'm praying to the gods that the weather remain as bad as it is outside and warm as it is inside, at least until we are done, and then everybody can make merry and happy. We will start off this morning's session by something relative to the sort of engagement unusual, but in the context of Africanism, very important and certainly significant. We have Chief Regan James, together with Mama Veronica Mgomezulu, to my far left, who will invite the gods of this land to be party to today's dialogue conversations, and nation-building project. If they will, in the time we both agreed it will take for this small but significant item, if they may start, and we will then, henceforth, Mauritia, get on traditionally with the program as agreed. Chief Regan, Mamu Veronica, it's yours. Ainses kan gan si abo che che lo che sida sida era kwa kwa 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 Natasha Thank was Greetings all I greet you in the name of Tikwap I will just do a short prayer to guide us and to protect us during the day Kangansi abotse ne tsukup ngatsko kuida kais aroma itohoba netse ona saudare kaisa. Thank you, Yara, that Ions Bavari dear the Nach Sparens work as a blief gedeerend at the Niva Dach. Thank you, Creator, for guiding us through the night, guiding us during the day. Protect us, please. Amen. Peace and the environment. The Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, together with the Petroleum Agency of South Africa. Welcome you to our second pre-colloquium event of 2022. Together, paving the way for a national dialogue on the sustainable development of oil and gas projects in South Africa. Join us here today as we unpack the coexistence of the upstream oil and gas industry and the fishing industry. This is part of a series of events which will culminate in a joint DMRE-DFFE 
colloquium later this year. Transitioning to a cleaner energy future. Forestry. Thank you so much. Perhaps it is time indeed to begin. So let me begin. Igamalam Gusongezo, Mapete, Dizalwa Ehewu, Tingum Zugulanagaba Hate, Wum Timku, Lupunga, Noma Fusa Fulel and Jengelifu, Lemful. Digumanja was a Di menyiwe ukuba ndizo bekesha le ngunu tela ibalulege kanga kaka ama sebe kakulumente. Beku nye na matumi abo. Bezo kubamba ingo to ebalulegeleyo. Kweza manja na kweza ndalo na kweza kukosho no shishino. Kweli lizwe le tusonke ndi tingbangu balapa kwetu siyalaka. It is an important occasion. Not least because there is dialogue. Many times in this country, there is a lament that there isn't enough dialogue between government and her people, as well as captains of industry and the private sector at large. Your by being present today is a change in that narrative. The Department of Forestry and Fisheries and Environment, together with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, are today in a joint pre-colloquium event. This is the second such dialogue with a theme for today being coexistence of upstream petroleum and fishing industries. The first dialogue recently was under the theme, paving the way for a national dialogue on the sustainable development of oil and gas projects in South Africa. So today, here we are on dialogue on joint, on coexistence, and understanding specifically the upstream. There are many things that can be said about dialogue, hearing each other out. Joint, critical arms of government, together with the extended stakeholders in the same room at the same time, having honest conversations, sometimes emotional, at all times genuine coexistence in this room between the balance of developing the state and her capacity from a resource and energy perspective, environmental management, and commerce, and so uplifting this nation's economy out of the doldrums it seems to be heading. The question has to be, is there enough space in this room for all? Who gets how much of that space? You, by being here, a part of the solutions to that problem as has been posed. We are here to have to understand what exploration, field development, and production operations mean in the context of upstream. But there are many questions that have to be answered today. What does upstream for South Africa mean? The nuances, the context, against the resource, against the priorities. What areas of the arrangement of state institutions and resources are affected? If at all, where does the private sector fit in? What are the public interest issues that are paramount from which we cannot derogate as we deliberate this evening, or should I say this morning come afternoon? Does the environment matter? If so, to what extent? Does the current state of our nation's economy tilt the scale in any particular way? As we grapple with these issues, the question of time becomes the next. How much time do we have in the context of a majority of South Africans who are and growing and continue to be hungry? Climate change, it's a global phenomenon nobody in this room can deny. What impact does it have in the context of the deliberations that we will be having today? And of course, the global trends, geopolitical issues, 
We all know the impact of energy security, most certainly brought to the fore strongly in the light of what is currently happening in Ukraine. Before that, similar questions were asked when COVID arrived uninvited and just like that caused the world to stop and stop it did. But this question is not new in terms of energy. In fact, we entered this very millennium on that question with the invasion of countries in the Middle East. So as we engage these questions on today's theme, theme being the coexistence of the upstream petroleum and fishing industries in South Africa, some of those questions, ideally all, need to be engaged to today so that we can get the answer we require. What is upstream, some may ask. Well, there's upstream, there's midstream, and there's downstream. Upstream is the furthest from the consumer. Upstream companies discover oil and gas deposits. They drill wells to extract these sources of energy from the ground. In the context of upstream still, there are those who rig operations, who conduct feasibility studies, who rent, if not manufacture, the required machinery and infrastructure and develop the technologies to be able to work this industry. And they provide, of course, the necessary chemicals within which to engage this very critical enterprise and very complicated one at that. It goes without saying, therefore, that those involved in the upstream are far less than those who are involved in the midstream to those involved in the downstream. Because of these high barriers of entry, high costs, the state's role becomes, therefore, that much more pronounced. And a lot of this, when we're talking about oil and gas exploration, a lot of national sovereignty issues are triggered. Nations peg their positioning in geopolitical issues for international trade, global international trade, against this very critical issue. But we are, as much, talking about nature, the flora and the fauna, that which no one person alive can, once destroyed, make whole again. How great is this demand for oil and gas exploration? And that demand, is it so great that nature should pay the price? When one tries to shake a big tree, in the end, he shakes only himself. Are we as a people prepared to shake this tree? About the life at sea, from generation to generation, from before daybreak at sea to returning home after dusk, the oceans have nourished and sustained villages and towns since time immemorial. In so doing, produce men and women who have broken generational curses of poverty and gone on to become men and women who provide for the greater communities. Was it not Olomisa who tried but failed to get this adage? Give a man a fish and he will live for a day. Teach him how to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime. What happens when there are no fish at all? Ladies and gentlemen, a balancing act therefore is required. And part of this dialogue is to achieve that. But having said that, we are here to contest ideas and to develop ideas. Naturally, it would be charged. Naturally, it will be discomforting. But that is a good start. Mine is simply to implore you, as Adam Grant said, a mark of an open mind is being more committed to your curiosity than your convictions. The goal of learning is not to shield old views against new facts. It's to revise old views to incorporate new facts. Ideas are possibilities to explore, not certainties to defend. It is my honor, it is indeed my privilege, to therefore invite you to feel free to participate at the second pre-colloquium event, Coexistence of the Upstream Petroleum and Fishing Industries in South Africa. To kickstart today's events is Ms. Pumlanges, Environmental Compliance Manager and Petroleum Agency of South Africa. Her keynote address is going to be around the regulatory framework 
of the South African oil and gas industry environmental management considerations in licensing. Before she comes up, a couple of housekeeping rules, and these are important. Please keep your cell phones on silent. We're beyond the age where we ask people to switch their phones off because they don't. So we can at least ask them to keep them on silent, not on vibrate. Please be careful what you do with your face. There are three cameras in this room. This is being live streamed. Keep your fingers away from your nostrils. You laugh. Wait until you watch YouTube, where this is being broadcast and streamlined live to an audience in a couple of hundreds. The bathrooms, you exit here. You turn left. You walk some 50 meters to your right. Men and women are there. Equally, there is a holding room for broadcasters who are here to conduct interviews. Please be on the lookout for that as and when. And if you are called, please oblige the invitation. It's part of keeping the conversation alive. Now, I know you're all wondering, what about the Wi-Fi? The, the team over there very shortly is gonna put the Wi-Fi password and code and everything to do with that. Please engage on social media. Get the conversation going beyond this room. I'm going to think of a hashtag right now. It's hashtag PCECTICC. -C. Hashtag PCE, pre colloquium event, CTICC. That's the hashtag. Please use that hashtag on Twitter, on Facebook, and wherever else you think there will be traction. Without more from me, because I've stolen enough of your introductory time, please finally shall we recognize Trifosa Tswelengwe, the lady on my right. She's a sign language interpreter from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. To her, for her, a warm round of applause. <clears throat> Ms. Pumlangesi, you have 20 minutes. If at any point I have to stand here, please know 20 minutes is up. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to be standing in front of you um, to deliver this presentation to you. Okay, let me familiarize myself first with this. Okay, good. So thank you so much. And uh, maybe before I start, um, I would like to recognize um, the DDG from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy who's here. Um, the board member, PASA board member who is here, my CEO, <laughs> and um, the fishing industry. So my talk today, as um, the program director has indicated, it is on the upstream oil and gas regulatory framework but focusing more on environmental considerations or environmental management considerations. So my talk will cover the following topics. I thought it's very important um, for the guests that are here to understand what is PASA's mandate, Petroleum Agency SA, and also I'll touch on the regulation of petroleum exploration and production, focusing more on the permits and rights that we regulate, that is as the DMRE and PASA, focus on environmental authorization process, what does it entail, who does it, and just to give you an overview of the whole process. And I'll also wrap it off with compliance monitoring and enforcement because it is very important that if an environmental authorization is granted, 
when it is implemented, we need to make sure that the holders of the rights and permits, they comply with environmental authorization conditions, the requirements of the environmental management program, and applicable regulatory framework. What is PASA's mandate? PASA is a designated agency in terms of Section 70 of the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act, designated by the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy to perform various functions. One of the functions is resource evaluation and promotion. This basically involves evaluating and quantifying onshore and offshore acreage and that is basically done to identify or determine the prospectivity of our shores, whether it's offshore or onshore. This is done by using various techniques, but what we have there in the screen is, um, for instance, there will be basin modeling. This work is done by geologists within the Petroleum Agency SA. The second important function, which uh, basically um, you know, resonates well with the, with the topic of today, is regulatory and licensing. This basically involves uh, receiving, processing, and um, making a recommendation to the minister or delegated authorities to make a decision on all the applications that we would have received. So I will touch on, on the types of rights and permits that we regulate later on. And then another most important one, the Petroleum Agency is responsible for managing exploration data. So we are the national custodian of all petroleum resource data we receive that data from the holders of the right as they continue exploring. They have an obligation to deliver that data to the Petroleum Agency SA and you archive it. And what has been happening then, um, we also add value to that data. And the last one, which is also important, we are also involved in strategic projects. So from time to time, the minister would designate the agency to undertake various projects that would, um, of course, contribute to the development of regulations or legislation um, yeah, to improve where that improvement is necessary. So um, this mandate that we have we, we have an obligation as the agency, as the state, to give effect to Section 24 of the Constitution. That Section 24 basically talks to an environmental right, saying everyone has a right to a clean and healthy environment. And secondly, it places an obligation on the state to put necessary measures to ensure that pollution is prevented and environmental degradation is avoided. So not to repeat what I've just said, this basically, this schematic diagram is to show you um, the legislation that we, or some of the legislation that we um, implement as the Petroleum Agency SA, but most importantly, it shows some of the legislation that must be observed as we develop these petroleum resources. I will basically focus on the Mineral Resources, um, Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act and um, NIMA. In terms of permits and rights that we um, regulate, there are four of them. 
is, is technical cooperation permit, which largely involves desktop studies, reconnaissance permit, which involves data acquisition through various uh, methods, could be airborne surveys, it could be uh, seismic surveys, well, speculative seismic surveys. And then exploration right, which largely involves partly seismic surveys and also drilling. And then we have production right. This basically only um, the holder of the exploration right has an exclusive right to apply for a production right. And this, I mean, the holders can only proceed to the stage if there are discoveries that have been made as part of the exploration process. And then the intention really is to extract oil or gas resources that um, would be, you know, discovered. Because if you look at technical cooperation permit and reconnaissance permit, at that stage, the, the holders, they wouldn't know whether there's oil or gas, but then that can only be confirmed once they start exploration drilling. So um, these rights and permits um, that we regulate, they can never be granted without environmental authorization. So before any decision to grant the right or a permit, the applicant has an obligation to apply for an environmental authorization. This environmental authorization basically means that the applicant must undertake an environmental impact assessment to identify potential impacts associated with the activities that are proposed and provide mitigation measures on those potential impacts that are identified. It is worth mentioning as well that not all the rights and permits that I have, or maybe permits, not missile rights, that I have indicated are subjected to an EA process. For instance, spoke about technical cooperation permit that basically only allows the holder to do desktop studies. So in that regard, there's no invasive work that is undertaken. But others, like the reconnaissance permit, the exploration right, and the production right, some activities they could trigger listed activities in terms of the EIA regulations. So basically, listed activities mean, if you trigger them, then it means you must undertake this process, environmental impact assessment process, and then I will also indicate what else is done as part of that process. So there are responsibilities between the regulator, the applicant, the independent environmental assessment practitioner. So, the, and the minister, how can I forget that? Because that one is quite important. The minister of mineral resources and energy is a competent authority for exploration and production of petroleum resources, meaning that he holds a responsibility to make a decision on the environmental authorization application. But this function is delegated to uh, the DDG, uh, Mineral and Petroleum Regulation. So the applicant has a responsibility to appoint an independent environmental assessment practitioner to make sure that the process has some form of credibility and then, um, and also some form of objectivity. PASA assists the department in processing the applications. And finally, the EAP ensures that a thorough EIA process is undertaken and independently and objectively. 
So um, I thought I must just give you an idea of the timelines. So there are two forms of an environmental impact assessment depending on the activity that is triggered at that point you know, in time. There is a basic assessment process which basically involves um, you know, projects that do not really have you know, significant, or before I go to significant, that has, for instance, or have known potential impacts. And secondly, that have got um, um, not significant you know, um, impacts. So that process, the, or the EAP has got 90 days to submit a basic assessment report from the date of lodging and application. And the other process, we call it full scoping and environmental impact assessment. The EAP has 200 days to submit all the necessary documents that are required. And the reason I'm mentioning this timeline is the fact that this process involves a whole lot of activities. One of the most important activities is stakeholder engagement, consultation, especially studies that are required, which normally range from potential impacts on the biodiversity and ecosystem services fisheries and underwater acoustic modeling studies, et cetera. So there are benefits. One of them is early identification of the potential impacts, including their level of significance, identification of appropriate mitigation um, measures, and reduction of exposure of humans to risk, and most importantly, it informs decision making. This one is to show you that as part of this EIA process, there is a need to consult interested and affected parties. And the, the benefit really of the EIA process or that process is to educate, is to engage, is to encourage, is to incorporate views and comments and concerns that are raised and also provide an opportunity for responses to be provided on those views, comments, and concerns. Because those issues, they have to be taken into consideration in decision making. Um, the once an EA is, is, is granted and a right is granted or a permit is granted, it does not end there the permit holder or a right holder has got a responsibility to comply with the requirements of the approved environmental management programs, conditions of the EA, and applicable regulatory framework. There's usually um, independent specialists, for instance, on board, whether it's the seismic survey or is it re rig those specialists include marine mammal observers, fisheries liaison officers, um, and environmental control officers to monitor compliance during operations. And then if there are any non-compliances that are identified, then the agency and the DMRE has got a responsibility or have a responsibility to put the holders of the rights to task, meaning that we have a responsibility to ensure that they comply. And if they do not comply, there are, just one minute, there are um, penalties that can be imposed that could include suspension of an environmental authorization that could include suspension of the right because the holders would not have complied with the terms and conditions of the right. There could be penalties and that could lead to imprisonment, that could lead to a fine of not less than 10 million, of course, depending on the nature 
of the non-compliance. In conclusion, as I have indicated, we all have a responsibility as the authorities, as the, as the holders of the right, um, to make sure that development of oil and gas resources is done in a safe, environmental safe, and sustainable manner. And I have a question here. It says, what is the responsibility of other stakeholders, fishing industry, and other marine users if the operation is, at, is offshore? So any other person has got a responsibility to ensure that they report if they identify a non-compliance. Just last one, um, the importance of indigenous oil and gas cannot be understated. The word last means something different in this part of the world. Last three times. You know, it's nice when government gives us a lecture on what government does. It is important for us to know what government does. Interestingly, you made reference to Section 24 of the Constitution. Everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being, and B, to have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations through reasonable legislative and other measures so that prevent pollution and ecological degradation, promote conservation, and three, secure ecologically sustainable development and use of natural resources qualifier while promoting justifiable economic and social development. Therein is the basis of everything that will be discussed here today. The balancing act that the state, through her actors, has to engage. Thank you so much, Ms. Pumlangesi. You know, the funny thing is, the Constitution people will think is not a useful document, only because they do not test it. Three months ago or four months ago, I was in an audience with former Deputy Chief Justice Dikhang Museneke, and he had said in the time that he had been at the Constitutional Court, there hadn't been a single matter that was brought before it to engage the expropriation clause on land. I'm making that as an example. Similarly here, Section 24B3 has only been contemplated once before the Constitutional Court, 2007, Fuel Retailers Association against the DG of the Department of Environment, Agriculture, and Conservation in Bumalanga. That's the only case we have to test what this section means. I'm hoping, therefore, as a start, at a minimum, I'm not suggesting we go to the Constitutional Court, but I certainly am suggesting we probe this question here today. Let's develop ideas. Let's fight, open, close quote, fight each other on ideas. So that one prevails that says, okay, we are moving in the right direction. My colleague and friend, Mr. Abongile Ngongwa, Acting Chief Director in Marine Resources Management in the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment is gonna now give us an overview of the South African fishing industry. He and I agree, and we both know what 20 minutes means. Check us. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for affording me this opportunity to give this presentation. Um, I think, uh, Program Director, I would like to agree with you on the fact that this Section 24 is going to be important today. And I'm glad that definitely I will have to talk more about it. Okay, I think I did something wrong there. Oh, there we go. Hmm? 
There we go. So my presentation for today will cover the following. I'll briefly go through the introduction, and then the presentation will also take us through the background, focusing on the overview of the fishing sector and the legislation um, that is used in that regard. And then I will touch briefly on fishing operations and also South Africa's participation in the various RFMOs. And then I will also touch on the small-scale fisheries sector, just looking at the definition and the objectives of this new uh, fishery, and then how this sector can transform coastal fishing communities. Um, I think, as it has been indicated before, if you look at uh, Section 7.1 uh, of the Bill of Rights, uh, it enshrines the rights of all South Africans and affirms the values of human dignity, equality, and freedom. And again, Section 24 goes further uh, to state that everyone has a right to secure ecological development and use of natural resources while promoting justifiable economic development, as it has been stated before. And also, if you look at the National Development Plan, it sets out the vision of the country, and also the medium-term strategic framework, it sets out uh, five yearly programs uh, in uh, fitting into the NDP. That also includes uh, the ocean's economy. Then the legislation that deals with South African fisheries is the Marine Living Resources Act, uh, Act Number no. 5 of 2014, as it was amended to include the small scale fisheries sector. This act was initially promulgated uh, in uh, 1998. Then, as you might be aware, uh, during the budget speech of uh, our minister, Minister Bob Prakrisi, she reminded uh, the nation that our local fishing communities rely on the oceans uh, for their livelihood. And also at the same time, the significant contribution to the food security and also to the contribution uh, in terms of the economy of the country. Currently, the fisheries sector contributes uh, around uh, 8 billion rands a year uh, into the GDP, and the commercial fishing sector um, has about uh, 28,000 people that are employed in its value chain. Over and above that, we have your thousands and thousands of small-scale fishers who are directly benefiting from the marine resources, and you have furthermore, who are direct, indirectly benefiting from the fishing uh, space. Then, as indicated, in terms of the Marine Living Resources Act, uh, there's a section uh, 18.1 there that says that no person shall undertake commercial fishing or small scale engage in mariculture or operating a fish processing establishment unless a right uh, to undertake such is granted by the minister. Uh, the legislation further indicates that in section 18.5, in granting any right, the minister shall, in order to achieve the objectives completed in this section, have particular regard to the need to permit new entrants, particularly those from historically disadvantaged sectors of the society. Then, in granting fishing rights, um, in terms of this legislation, currently we have 22 um, fishing sectors or fisheries in South Africa that are operating in the commercial sector, and these rights are allocated for a maximum of 15 years. Then also you have uh, the small-scale fisheries sector, whose rights are also allocated for a maximum of 15 years. And currently, we have over 10,000 small-scale fishers along the coastline of South Africa, and majority of those are currently fishing under their fishing rights allocated in this uh, section of the Act. But also not forgetting the recreational sector uh, that contributes immensely in the economy uh, of spins. As you might know that uh, there are tackle shops that are opened and the number of um, uh, employment uh, that is created within the value chain in the recreational sector. 
and we have over 30,000 uh, recreational fishers uh, uh, in South Africa that buy their permits uh, at the post offices on an annual basis. And they operate along the coastline uh, of South Africa. Then, in terms of Section 13 of the legislation, um, when you are allocated a fishing right or granted a fishing right, in order for you to exercise that fishing right, you are required to hold a fishing permit, which is an annual permit that you apply for and it's granted to you on the basis that you have a fishing right. For the recreational sector, they are not required to have a fishing right. They buy their permits uh, via the post office. And um, in terms of the operations as well, you can classify the fishing operations into three, basically. The first one would be your fishing operations that are on the offshore and high seas. Uh, examples of these, it's the Hague Deep Sea Troll fishing, tuna pole and line fishing, your pelagic um, uh, fisheries, and many other from the 22 that I've mentioned before. And then you also have your inshore uh, fishing operations that are more closer to, to the shore. Uh, this may include your line fish, uh, your West Coast rock lobster, your East Coast rock lobster, your oyster harvesting, your mussels harvesting, your seaweed, and many others that are also harvested by the small-scale fisheries sector. So in effecting these uh, rights specifically for the inshore and the offshore and high seas, uh, in terms of Section 23 of the Marine Living Resources Act, um, the minister grants um, vessel licenses to all the fishing vessels that are operating. And um, there is one of the reasons for this is to ensure that we monitor the amount or the number of vessels that are operating in the fishing space and also ensuring that there's compliance in that particular process. Then um, South Africa operates um, within the international waters as well and we show a number of uh, fishing resources with uh, other countries such as your tuna species and hence it is important for us as South Africa to participate in these international forums. Um, so South Africa is a signatory and has ratified and is a cooperative member uh, of a number of uh, regional fisheries management organizations that are formed by various countries who have a common interest in particular types of species. And uh, these uh, types of RFMOs include your ICAT, CR4, IOTC, uh, CCSPT, COFI, and CAMILA. And this is just um, a map indicating uh, where these uh, RFMOs are operating. And the map that I've just flighted there now, those are RFMOs that are dealing with, uh, uh, with tuna and tuna-like species. So all the shaded areas there will indicate where those species occur and also which countries have interest in there. You will see that South Africa, on your right, there's ICAT, and then on your left, there's IOTC, and there's CSBT uh, Southeast in that particular map. And then um, there are additional RFMOs as well. Some are not uh, relevant for South Africa. And you can see the interests of South Africa in relation to a number of RFMOs. And that is the reason why, as South Africa, we participate in a number of, uh, of RFMOs in ensuring that we protect the interests of the country but also at the same time contribute to the development and sustainability of these marine resources that are shared with other countries. Then going to the small-scale fisheries sector, uh, the small-scale fisheries policy was developed as a response to an equality court order of uh, 2007, whereby fishing communities along the coastline of South Africa took government to court indicating that uh, small-scale fishers in South Africa have been marginalized and they've been left uh, behind as they depend on marine resources for their livelihoods. And out of that, in 2007, there was an imbizo in Port Elizabeth by then, and a national task team was put together that was led by government in partnership with communities and um, um, institutions of higher learning as well. 
and the role of that particular body was to start a process of developing a small-scale fisheries policy. And uh, out of that, the small-scale fisheries policy was finalized in 2012. I think it's one of those policies that took very long to finalize. And the basis for that was to ensure that there was extensive consultation in the process. That's why you will see today that many communities, or majority of the communities, they do believe that they contributed to that policy, and hence there is pressure uh, from, to government to, to implement the policy. And in 2016, uh, after the legislation was amended to accommodate this new sector, um, the department started the process of rolling out this new small-scale fisheries sector. As we speak, uh, we have over 10,000 small-scale fishers and in over 200 fishing communities. And in the Western Cape um, uh, province particularly, there will be an additional number of declared small-scale fishers and declared small-scale fishing communities who will be fishing as people who depend on marine resources for their livelihood. Then just to ensure that we are uh, all on the same page in terms of what we mean by small-scale uh, fisheries. The definition is that it's a person that fishes to meet food and basic livelihood needs or are directly involved in harvesting, processing, or marketing of fish, traditionally operates on or near shore fishing grounds, predominantly employ traditional low technology or passive fishing gear, and usually uh, undertake single day fishing trips and are engaged in the sale or barter or involved in commercial activity. So that's what we mean by uh, small-scale uh, fishers. The objectives of the small-scale fisheries sector to promote uh, the equitable access and involvement in all aspects of the fishing industry, which means the entire value chain, ratify past injustice against women, the youth, and people living with disabilities, recognizing the approaches of fisheries management which contributes to food security, social economic development, and the alleviation of poverty in fishing communities. Then the principles that are followed as outlined in the small-scale fisheries policy are to maintain the health of the marine ecosystem by all means, uplifting fishing communities by providing appropriate support mechanisms, education, training, and infrastructure, and participation in management practices. Then another principle is for communities and government to co-manage the nearshore marine uh, resources, but also at the same time to take fundamental human rights, marine living resources act principles as outlined in section two of the act, and also the international obligations uh, must take them into account. Lastly, to give due regard to promoting the interests of women, people living with disabilities, and child-headed households. Then, just as a summary, um, looking at the breakdown of small-scale fishers along the coastline of South Africa, in the Northern Cape, we have 103 declared small-scale fishers, and they operate under two cooperatives in Port Nolot and Honda Clip Bay, and they are currently fishing under their 15-year fishing rights. In the Western Cape, we initially declared uh, just under 3,000 small-scale fishers. However, this new process is due uh, to be redone in the Western Cape, and we're expecting that we are not going to get less than 3,000 small-scale fishers that will be declared in this particular province. Then in the Eastern Cape, currently it's the highest province uh, in terms of the total number of small-scale fishers. We have uh, 5,335 declared small-scale fishers, and we have 72 cooperatives that are operating uh, under their 15-year fishing rights along the coastline. Lastly, in KwaZulu-Natal, we have uh, 2,184 declared small-scale fishers operating in 36 fishing communities uh, in cooperatives. Then this map just depicts the distribution of uh, small-scale fishing communities along the coastline of South Africa, and you will notice the concentration in the Eastern Cape and also the concentration that we foresee in the Western Cape as well. Then how will the small-scale fishing sector uh, transform coastal fishing communities? This is my last slide. Um, the first one is the recognition of traditional use of marine resources to sustain the livelihoods of small-scale fishers, to provide legal right of access 
to an equitable basket of marine living resources, uh, but most importantly to enhance uh, food security, commercialization of high value uh, species, access to markets and having a role in the fish in fisheries economy, uh, also sustainable utilization of the marine resources, uh, providing orderly access to the marine living resources through uh, small scale fishing cooperatives uh, being allocated 15 year fishing rights, and also functioning of the core management structures in, all, in, in ensuring that uh, how we manage the fisheries uh, it's in partnership with the resource users. Also at the same time, most of our government is to facilitate support programs uh, which ranges from businesses maximis maximization of value of the resources and many other support programs that are recognized and identified in terms of the small scale fisheries policy and also looking at alternative um, livelihoods. So colleagues, in a nutshell, uh, that is the overview of the fishing sector in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Alala. Thank you, Abungile. I was not nearly inclined to stand up. You all know what that means. Reverend Alan Busak, how are you, sir? It's good to be with you. Finally, I get to meet you. I always interview you on radio. And I'm always in Johannesburg, and you are always in Cape Town. Now, both of us in Cape Town, I think we are certainly due a handshake and a hug and salutations, as we have always been congenial to each other on air. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this does court some serious attention from serious quarters in this country, this conversation. But perhaps just to keep our audience both in this room and on the online platform, we do encourage questions. So for those of you who are here, please write your questions down. You will forget because the more people talk, the more your mind is activated and you move from one question to the next. Write your questions down. You see there are two microfo three microphone stands at the right time at the end of this plenary. There will be an opportunity for question and answer session. Of course, I should emphasize the word question. It's not a speech. It's not a follow up. It's not an opportunity to debate. It's an opportunity to question. The time for speeches and for follow up is in the downtime of the program during tea, during lunch, at the table next to you. You are more than encouraged to engage. Even put your engagement out there on social media. But please, for the sake of time, when it is time for questions, you stand there. In a minute, you have your question and you vacate the platform. It is said, if you cannot say it in less than a minute in language that is understandable by a three-year-old, you don't understand what you are talking about. It's not me saying that. Now, the Wi-Fi code should be on your, it, it should be over there um, because it is important for us to keep engaging. Please, could we have the Wi-Fi password? There it is, explore three CTICC. And I again confirm what the hashtag is, hashtag PCE CTICC. That's for Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the like. Please participate on social media. A friend who he and I met at an interview, funnily enough, in 2008 at a law firm here just up the road, Mr. Lois Opandra, has since gone on to do far greater and better things than I ever imagined for myself. Every time we meet, he reminds me I got the job and he didn't. Right now, he's the chairperson. I am not. Chairperson of Fish South Africa, Mr. Loiso Panzo. Come through. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What maybe Songo is not saying is that uh, maybe the reason why he got the job is exactly how we're going to demonstrate it now because I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. So. <laughs> Guess you will keep beating me if we ever have to have other, present day, other interviews in the future. But thank you very much, uh, as long as I appreciate the opportunity. 
And I would like to greet uh, the DDG from the fisheries. I think I saw her here. Um, and I had uh, Ms. Pumla greet the DDG from uh, DME. And I felt that oh, I wanted to tell her that, OK, we've got also our DDG from the fisheries here. Also, the board members from PASA, uh, the traditional leadership present. And ladies and gentlemen, and also the representative of the oil and gas industry and the science community as well, who are very important in in these dialogues, at least from the point of view also of the commercial fishing industry. Now, Abongile uh, touched on the overview of the commercial uh, fishing industry um, in terms of the contribution that, uh, that we make. So I will not bore you with more details, but I do want to boast a bit um, about our role uh, that we play as a sector in, 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 in the country. He spoke about uh, the number of jobs. I think he said we're sitting at about 28,000 direct jobs that we create. Uh, that's a very conservative number. We estimate that that number is in excess of about 35,000 jobs that we create. And if you add other jobs that are downstream linked to our industry, you're looking at in excess of about 80,000 jobs that we create. And these jobs, the majority of them are in coastal, rural towns where there's hardly any other economic activities other than the, uh, the, the, the factories and also the, uh, you know, the, the activities that are, are contributed by, by, our, by our industry. In the Western Cape uh, GDP, GDP, we contribute in excess of 5%. Uh, if you look at that, uh, I mean, other than the, other, other, the fruit industry and the agriculture, we are an important contributor. I think we're sitting just about, uh, just below 1% in terms of our national our national GDP. Of course, uh, the, 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 the jobs that we create and also the structure of our industry, you have the industrial players, and those would be you know, the, big, the big boats, fleets, and also land-based operation where value-add takes place. You've got medium-sized businesses, and then you also have small, small operators who employ 10, 15, 20, 27, 27 people. And our business also um, has to I think I have to mention that our business also is an, ex a, a, an important export in some, in some species where you're looking at exporting in very, very important markets for our sector in the, in the Asian market, in the East in general, in the United States, uh, in particular also for the hake industry in the, in, the South, in the South Europe. An important uh, 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 aspect to consider as well. And there's, of course, other industries that, we, uh, that benefit from the commercial industries. If you're looking at logistics in general, transport, and, uh, and, and other smaller industries. You also have to add the fact that in the smaller towns where these fishing operations, whether on the south coast of the country or in the eastern Cape, and in some instances on the west coast, you, you also have a huge contribution from the local economic development that is also a, a benefit that comes directly out of the presence of the fishing industries. And that, you know, uh, uh, you can look at from, 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 different, from different aspects in terms of having factories in some areas, keeping some harbors that would otherwise not operate at all if there was no fishing taking place uh, in, these, in, these, in these towns. Of course, uh, uh, the other advantage that you have with, uh, with the fishing industry in South Africa is that we are unlike most industries, and certainly this is not a jab uh, on the oil and gas industry, but our jobs are sustainable. If today we created 35,000 jobs in, 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 in on the 25th of August 2022, we're looking to do the same or even more in 2022 because th that's the nature of, 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 of our operations. So as we go into the sea, we, have a, we realize the importance of the sea in terms of our business models, in terms of our business operations, that it's almost, uh, it will almost defeat the cause if we did not fish sustainably. And I don't think many other sectors can say that about their operations, and that is important. Uh, when trolling uh, started in this country around 1890, it's still happening today. You've got companies in the fishing space that have been fishing for over 100 years, and that's an important history, not only from a job creation point of view, but also it tells a story about sustainability. And I want uh, on that also to mention something that not many industries can say about their regulator, which is in this instance, 
the Department uh, of Fisheries and Forestry because of the role it plays in, in, in regulating our industry and the role we play in collaborating in that regulation. We have ensured that we have kept our resources at, 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 at minimum under very difficult circumstances. We remain sustainable and we continue to, to earn our position in the, in, in the whole world as a very competitive uh, industry. We wouldn't have done that without the, uh, the role that the department plays from a research point of view on the regulation side and other stakeholders as well, including the conservation uh, sector as well. I wanted, to, I wanted to post a bit about our industry and I wanted to highlight as well that it is in our interest to ensure that the biodiversity in the marine life is sustainable and that we coexist with other, with other sectors as well. I think in principle, the fishing industry understands that we, are not, we don't have a monopoly uh, on, the, on the operations in our seas. It would be disingenuous if we said that, we understand that we have, a, we have to compete with other developmental challenges that may come either from the transport sector, uh, the oil and gas explorations. I think our principal position is that while we understand that, we need also to pay attention to the fact that uh, for our industry, maybe unlike other industries that we have to compete with, if we take care of our environment and we do, we do the right thing, and I'm talking specifically now the, 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 the marine life, it's not only the question of, oh no, we benefit financially, but it goes beyond that in terms of the sustainability aspect of it. We already face so many challenges as a fishing industry. The fishing grounds are shrinking. The regulation, you know, keep, keep adding and adding into our sector. So when you look at it uh, from, from that point of view, the risk that we have to navigate in order to keep these 34,000 jobs, in order to keep the people employed in towns where otherwise there will be nothing else for the, for, the, for the people in those areas, in order to keep our SMMEs and also our small operators run by women in particular. We need to ensure that that marine life is protected at all costs because these jobs, will, as we say, for us, we, we want to multiply them but we want to do so in a, in a sustainable way. Unfortunately, other competing interests that we have to deal with uh, in, our, in our oceans have a lifespan. 70 years, 100 years, 25 years, you know, the drilling and whatever is extracted of that. While the value of it may well exceed the value of the contribution of our industry, but we are going to be here for 300, 400, 500 more years. Or, in fact, we hope for eternity. And, and they can't say the same. And that's an, important, that's an important consideration to make. But of course, there are a number of species that are endemic in our waters. We understand our oceans are very, are very sensitive. And this is a point that the department also uh, has, has, has made on many times. So while we are not going to stand here and say we are completely opposed in sharing the space with the, with the, with the oil and gas sector, or that we are completely opposed to exploration of other resources, but we need to be sensitive to these realities. The pressing issues, obviously, as I say, the, the, the grounds are shrinking for the industry. We have, on a number of times, voluntarily adopted certain measures that have ensured that these, these fishing grounds shrink even further because of realization of the importance of the marine resources. And I don't want to bore you with the details. But if I can just tell you, for example, on the number of platforms where we participate in, in, in self-regulating ourselves over and above what the DDG would, would, would suggest the industry should do, again, because we recognize the importance of sustainability in our seas. But on top of that, internationally, as an industry, now outside what Abongile was talking about in terms of the state commitment to abide by international legislation and its own legislation, our own markets, we want to ensure that everywhere in the world where you go and you find, where you find our, 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 our harvest, that you can, be, you can be assured that it is sustainably fished. And we do that voluntarily. Not many other sectors can do that. But of course it has an impact. It's not only financial impact, but it's also an impact on, a, on, a, on, on an industry that is shrinking. And, and, and an industry that if we, don't, if we don't take into account the sensitivity of the marine life, 
you're not likely to have that best uh, Hague in, in, in 70 years' time, in 50 years' time, in many other spaces, of course. Now, as a result of that, song, I don't know how much time I have, but I also want to touch on, on some of the issues that you've highlighted now, specific to the oil and gas uh, activities and the seismic activities that take place on our oceans. This is not a, a, a bash of the industry. I know some of the representatives are going to come here and they are obviously going to say that they take all the mitigating me measures in order to minimize the, the negative impact of their activities. So, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to be picked up after this. But we have identified on a number of times the disturbance on the migration patterns of the species that we fish in our oceans as, as a result of the explorations and sometimes the activities themselves. We, we recognize also, and I think we have shared this with, uh, with the industries that we compete with for this, that we don't believe that there's been enough research done on the, on the exploration on our oceans, both on the impact, and if I have to be selfish, also on our industry. Because we, we obviously rely on the ecosystem on the ocean in order, to, in order to be able to have that fish where it should be, and also in order to ensure that that fishing stock is sustainable. We think that there's been some research, but we don't think that at this stage, the country can say confidently that we have had a proper research that has looked at this impact. And I'm not talking immediate impact. I'm talking about an impact 25 years down the line. We have not been able to do that, and we do need to improve, also from a technology point of view, in terms of what we can do to mitigate. And I don't believe, or at least as an industry, we don't believe that that engagement has, we have, that, that engagement has taken place. Of course, it is in our interest as a fishing industry to undertake a number of scientific investigations, which we do, because it is, it is our obligation, one, and, we, and, and also we work with the department to do that. But we believe that as far as the research and the legal requirements imposed on the oil and gas industry to look into, into, into uh, environmental impacts, there are gaps. And I think that is why we need these colloquiums, and that's why we need the, the scientific community to engage so that those gaps can be plugged. And again, I'm not going to bore you with the details as to what those gaps are, but I think when our scientists from the fishing point of view meet with the scientists from the oil and gas industry, these are some of the things that need to be looked at. And one of them, for example, uh, somebody mentioned it to me, was that when you look at sound, which is, which is uh, uh, one of the things that is is, is very contentious. If you look at sound and the impact of the sound to the modern life and how the modern life lives, nobody knows 50 years down the line what that would do to, 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 to the ecosystem and the life of those resources, including the microscopic resources that, that are affected by these activities. So we need to look at a stronger collaboration from the science uh, community, from both the fisheries, the two departments present here, and also the, sci the scientists from the oil and gas sector. And we also need to develop protocols uh, on, 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 these, on these activities. And these protocols can look into various issues, the social economic impact beyond just the area that is being surveyed. And in some instances, this also needs to look at whether there are any other alternative, alternatives to what is being explored. One example, for example, in the phosphate industry, is if you've got it on land, then why do you explore, why do you want to have it from the sea? Because the sea is the most sensitive. And the other example somebody gave me when we were having this discussion was that, well, also, the risk is so high, it doesn't matter if you impose a penalty on someone who has not complied. Because imposing a penalty when those species have been destroyed for years is not going to reverse the impact. So, if you can, and these are, these are part of the discussions, I'm not saying I have the uh, ownership and the wisdom on this one. But if the state, and in particular the two departments that are here in the industry, are able to discuss these, these needs, it can't be that it's only the financial needs or the developmental needs that must drive a rush to explore in our cities, because the sea is a very sensitive area. And of course, I'm not saying that on land, if, on land perhaps you know, there's no need to develop protocols, but I think on land we can all we can all understand for many years there's been mining taking place. 
and there are certain areas where there's hardly any economic activity and the sensitivity levels are not the same. But the ocean should, is, is, is critical. The other example someone gave was that if you're looking at the risk from uh, you know, people, would, people that fly on aeroplanes, you, you would understand that it's the safest method of transport. But we know that when something wrong happens, the chances of having survivors, survival is very minimal. Well, the fishing in the, the, the marine life is the same. So it doesn't help to say we will have a lot of protocols and a lot of penalties when you have oil spills that you already have to deal with as an industry. It affects us, it affects the marine life. When you look at the fact that you already have to share the space with telecom, telecommunication lines, it affects our, 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 our industry. Of course, in some instances, where drilling takes place, even when that drilling, as the law requires at the end, the well is, is closed, we don't, have to, we don't fish within a number of kilometer radius around that. In, in some instances, pipes get installed and our, 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 fishing, our fishing grounds get smaller and smaller. Some other small operators have to go even further into the sea, the cost of diesel, and other, and, 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 and other effects come into play. I think I'm not going to speak on the effects that happen with a small, with a small scale because they're even in a, in, a, in, a, in a more difficult position. So I see Song as has as, as, as stood up. Uh, to conclude, I think as we take this debate forward, as an industry, we would like that there's more collaboration on the research. And we're talking the best available scientific research we want the, the industries, both of them, to sit down and talk on the funding of that research because some of the challenges we have is that the department is, is, it probably doesn't have the budget to assist the fishing industry. And of course, if our fishing grounds are getting smaller and smaller, it means that we need to call upon the other industries that we share the space in the sea with to say, let's improve the research. We are doing that for the benefit of both sectors, by the way and also the international obligations that the country have. There are other things that one could raise as proposals, but with 20 minutes, of course, we're not able to do that. I will, however, think that uh, as we take this discussion forward, there are many number of areas to collaborate and a lot to say between these two sectors. And I thank the opportunity that the, the department and PASA have given to us as a fishing industry uh, to participate. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, quite a low vote. <laughs> the fire has been started for sure here. But very critical points, Loiso. This is precisely why we are here. And, and I'm glad you are raising the issues as you have raised them. You know, I had the opportunity whilst listening to Abongile speak and you now just to quickly research what does EEZ mean? Exclusive Economic Zone, established by the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The EEZ is the area of the sea in which a sovereign state has special rights regarding the exploration and use of marine resources, including energy production from both water and wind. Now, South Africa has a coastline in round terms of 3,000 kilometers. South Africa, Namibia on the west, South Africa, Mozambique on the east, 3,000 kilometers. The EEZ from shore goes out some 200 nautical miles, converted into kilometers, 300 and 70 kilometers. The eye cannot see that far. That is a lot of ground, or in this case, water. I would really be interested to know what the potential thereof is versus what the production and output thereof is. I, I don't imagine that space, that EEZ, is being used optimally in this country if the numbers I'm hearing are anything to go by. Of course, I make the declaration up front. I could be completely wrong, and I would certainly encourage and invite those who have more affirmed views, opinions, or even facts, ideally, to come through and contest that idea. 
But I just cannot imagine that with so much potential at sea, what salmon is to Norway, snook is not to South Africa for the world's consumption. It, it, it baffles me. It's there, it's at sea, it is ours. But why does the world not know about it? Why is it not a delicate fish? What do you call this? Um, this Japanese thing, raw fish. Sushi. You all know it. Ask the ordinary Japanese what, Japanese what snook is, they wouldn't tell you. The ordinary Norwegian, they would not tell you what snook is. We have a lot of ground to cover here, ladies and gentlemen. And certainly I'm hopeful that it shall be covered in the final speech, speaker for this session. The South African Small Scale Fisheries representative, Mr. Pedro Garcia, who is the founder of the South African United Fishing Front. Perhaps some of what I've said he will touch on. Sergio? Thank you, Program Director. I would like to just reverse some protocol um, in terms of our greetings. The very first people I'd like to greet here today are the small-scale fishes. Fishes that have come from afar to join us for a workshop and also this colloquium and also tomorrow engaging with Minister Mantashe. Thank you very much for making the time to be with us here. I do believe that our engagements thus far have been constructive and that we are definitely moving towards the objectives we have set for ourselves. So thank you very much. Then I'd like to acknowledge the various departments um, for making this possible and for us to be able to have an opportunity to speak about the issues that we all are dealing with. To Dr. Alan Busak, thank you very much for attending. Um, we are greatly honored to have you here, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go through a program, but before I do that, I want to make something very clear, because the oil and gas has been in the media, sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes for the wrong reasons, and it has impacted on our position as small-scale fishers. So I want to make something very clear. First and foremost, we have not taken a position in terms of oil and gas, whether we are pro or anti. Second, secondly, we do not endorse or oppose any views from any organizations in terms of the oil and gas, because we believe that we are in an environment where there are great uncertainties in terms of what the, the advantages or disadvantages of oil and gas may have on our communities. And we are in a learning process. So until we achieve a level of understanding where our communities can take informed decisions, we cannot, it would not it would be disingenuous as a matter of fact, to take up a position. We are in the process of bringing that information and awareness to our communities at this point in time, and we shall continue doing so until we reach a point where we can inform all the relevant authorities, all the stakeholders, that yes, our communities are ready to engage now. But until then, we will not put ourselves into a compromising position because that is where we are right now. We will work harder and we will work faster to make this happen. So the presentation I'm doing is on the grassroots communications framework. I'd like to challenge a lot of the things that Apongile had put on the table today, but we know it's, this is not a platform for that. And I'm saying this so that uh, those who are with the South African United Fishing Plant also understand that this is about building communications um, and there's a different platform to address different issues. And then just uh, secondly also, uh, Mr. Panchua, I really thought that, that we were friends. Um, Mr. Panchua, uh, the small-scale fishes um, are now reaching out to you in the spirit of Ubuntu and cooperation. 
I, this morning you acknowledged everybody, but you didn't acknowledge us. But we are more than happy to acknowledge you and to say to you that we are ready to engage further with the big industry as well. So, a development of a grassroots communications framework, which we feel is critical if we are going to engage in a constructive manner and on matters that could impact the lives and livelihoods of our communities. And why do we need a grassroots communications framework? Because it's not just in the oil and gas sector. It is across all spheres of government. It's across all spheres of, of uh, uh, business, uh, civil society, that we are failing to engage in a meaningful way with our communities. And nobody, I don't believe that anybody can deny that. Consultation processes in South Africa has been a dismal, absolute dismal failure. It has been a tick box exercise. It has been going into communities, not understanding that the communities are attending a lot of these consultation processes to get a meal for the day. How do you understand the dynamics in those particular communities? You would not have come back and said, we have achieved our objective. You had not achieved your objectives. You had given a very hungry person a meal for the day. Whatever the message was is lost in that. You cannot deal or negotiate with angry people. You cannot deal or negotiate with people who are hungry. So you cannot expect a positive outcome in any form of engagement in communities where abject poverty has become the norm. So we are saying that we need a grassroots communications framework that takes into account all of the challenges that are currently being experienced by our communities, not just in the fishing communities, but every community where abject poverty is now almost the order of the day. We have to acknowledge that we're dealing with a 40% unemployment rate in this country. So we need to think outside the box. It cannot be a focused approach on fisheries alone. It has to be a focused approach on communities, how we build communities, how we build the institutional capacity that keeps that communities going and that gives them the ability to, regardless of what consultation passes through that community, they have the ability to negotiate in an informed manner and a constructive manner and make decisions that will impact on their lives and livelihoods, knowing then that they then end up with what is commonly known as free, prior, and informed consent. So I just need to go through this very briefly. I'm not going to go in, into much detail. I want to get to the phased in approach of this project so that I can also then just uh, give some more detail on that. So the introduction is that the South African United Fishing Front proposes the development of a flexible grassroots communications framework that will provide effective communication support to stakeholders who are engaged in consultation processes pertaining to the exploration and production of oil and gas in accordance with the national regulations. The GCF will, shall be beneficial to all stakeholders. I reiterate the point again that we are talking about a flexible communications framework, something that's adaptable, something that takes all local dynamics into account, and something that can be used all across the world for that matter because what we've done in collaboration with PASA at this point in time is nothing less than groundbreaking. This has never been done anywhere in South Africa. We are not aware of it being done anywhere on the continent, and we're not even sure whether there are any best practices on an international basis. So this is groundbreaking work for everybody that's involved in this. So the, the grassroots communications framework aims and objectives is to achieve our collective vision of grassroots community-based engagement platforms designed to ensure meaningful and informed participation between communities and a proposed multi-stakeholder consultation group. Now we will get back to that because what had initiated these discussions, the framework has been out there for many years. We've been working on it forever. For the first time, somebody decided they're going to listen. 
and lend an ear and see what we can do about it. So it's been out there. All that we had to do was to keep on pushing, keep on pushing. We are civil society. That is what we do. We never, never, never give up. We represent people. We represent communities. We represent members. So we never give up. And this is what we've done. This is where we are now. So we look at a system with integrity. And the integrity is based on maintaining the neutrality, promoting transparency, transparency and inclusivity, the universal approach to adapt to any community dynamics, ability to withstand peer review and legal scrutiny, independent oversight, very important, allocate critical tasks to people with the highest occupational intelligence on those tasks, credible assessment tools, credible reporting mechanisms, and accreditation and certification. That is the, is the medium long-term goal, so that it can become part of a policy framework and that it can be introduced on a national level. We're looking at parallel processes at this point in time, being the development of the actual grassroots communications framework, which is an ongoing process, multi-stakeholder platform for oil and gas, the multi-stakeholder platform for oil and gas, this is where I'd just like to pause for a minute. We had written a letter to both ministers, Mantashe and Krisi. Uh, we were dissatisfied with the communications consultation processes, and we had therefore asked for a multi-stakeholder platform to be established. The purpose of the multi-stakeholder platform speaks directly to the challenges that our, our people are dealing with at a grassroots level. As recently as two weeks ago, uh, we were still experiencing challenges with, cons um, with consultation processes where people could not really respond comprehensively to questions being put by the communities. And this frustrate uh, it frustrates the communities. So what we had then a couple of months ago, what we had asked for is to develop a multi-stakeholder platform where everybody comes together and Emanating from that multi-stakeholder platform, there should be, we recommend that, a multi-stakeholder consultation group. And that is what we are looking for to enter our communities when there's consultation processes, so that everybody who is involved and can give the answers is there to give the answers. So if somebody goes to Buffalo House Bay, I'm looking straight at Kishan now, so Buffalo House Bay comes to mind. Um, and you have a consultation process there, and it's about oil and gas, then it shouldn't just be the environmental assessment practitioner. It shouldn't just be the principal. It shouldn't just be government or the regulator. It should be a multi-stakeholder consultation group so that the answers, it can be a one-stop shop. This is vitally important because when you go in as separate entities, the immediate perception is that you're pushing a singular agenda. Whether it is government, whether it is industry, whether it is the EAP, it doesn't matter. But when you move in on your own, it creates the perception that there's a singular agenda that's being pushed. Our communities don't want that. When our communities ask you a question and you cannot answer it, you need to refer the community to the next person that's sitting on the panel that's part of the multi-stakeholder consultation group. And then the fourth one is an interim community engagement program. Now, as much as we understand, and it was indicated by PASA this morning as well, as much as we understand that there are time constraints, there's penalties, there's lots of money involved, it cannot become our problem. Not now. Bad planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on our part. You need to give us the time to develop the proper tools for our communities so that they can engage effectively, constructively, and meaningfully with yourselves. So the interim community engagement program is basically about putting an interim structure into place to assist, once again, in the spirit of Ubuntu, in the spirit of cooperation. Let's see if we can assist, but we will not, we cannot compromise any of our principles as communities.
the G GCF's values. I'm just going to go very briefly through this because I really do want to get to the implementation phase. Um, an adaptable tool that bridges the gap created by most common barriers in, the effective, in effective communications, prior dissatisfaction and disinterest in proposed projects, lack of transparency and trust. There's no doubt about that. The levels of acrimony that exist in our communities, not just as a result of colonialism, apartheid, as a result of everything that is to do with the marginalization of our communities. So those levels of acrimony needs to be addressed almost as a matter of urgency, or, yes, or as a matter of urgency. Conflicts and inability to listen to others. We, we tend to be aloof when we go into our communities. We think we know what our communities want. We don't know what our communities want. Our communities know what they want. But do we listen? I don't think so. When we talk about local and indigenous knowledge, it's, it's almost been shoved away completely. And yet, if we integrate the local and indigenous knowledge into mainstream data, it can make the world of difference to the livelihoods of our people. But we keep on fighting. That is who we are. Cultural and social differences, as well as language. We need to consider the social bonds of our, of our local and indigenous communities to the land and to the sea. It is of paramount importance, we need to respect it. It's part of dignity, it's part of what our constitution stands for. Communication styles. This is formal at its best. When you go into the community, how do you negotiate with the community? How do you communicate with the community? Do you take the time to think that maybe you should just be sitting around a little fire with a roasted broiki, and that that type of communication could be the most effective for that particular situation. So the communication styles needs to be really looked at. And then an effective tool that provides information which confirms readiness of communities to engage meaningfully around exploration and production of oil and gas. I'm not going to get there. I see the man in my left corner here standing up. All right, so basically, what we will do is we will put the framework up again. There simply is not enough time to go through this, but the framework is basically about creating a mechanism that, has, that, that can withstand legal scrutiny, a mechanism that can ensure that there's meaningful participation and meaningful input by communities, especially when they discuss matters that's going to impact on their lives and their livelihoods. Um, I really would like it. <laughs> All right. I submit to the, uh, to the program director. <laughs> Thank you. Quite a disciplined panel I have, certainly. The first session is always the most difficult to moderate. You set the tone. You give the speaker a minute. You have to give the second one that same minute, now we're sitting at 21, and then he or she becomes entitled to take another minute. So you have a 20-minute speech becoming a 21-minute speech, then the next speaker speaks for 22 minutes in a 20-minute slot, and so it goes on. So thank you so much to all of you for honoring what we are about. You know, Sergio, Everything you have said, I have seen it in my lifetime here in this country. 1994, there wasn't a South African who did not know what was going on. At the end of this last millennium into this one, there wasn't a South African who could not converse on HIV and AIDS. In the last three years in particular, present continuous, there isn't a South African who cannot speak about COVID. What does that tell you? The CGF to which you make reference to, the tools are there. They are on the ground. If you don't know, wait until 2024. You will know exactly what's happening in this country. They will even tell you how to do it, where to put that X. 
We have the capacity in this country, Sergio, to speak to one another, to all understand what it is that is being spoken of and how to engage ourselves around that topic. It's a fact. Question is why we don't do it on a protracted basis on critical national priorities. It has to be a question of interest. Whose? That's the next question. You raise critical points in how we engage. Who are we using to engage our communities? What language are they speaking? At what time, timing is everything, are they doing it? These are the things, and what platforms, media, radio, television, social media, a combination of those, none of the above, the value of schools, more particularly in the environment where perhaps the literacy levels might not necessarily be as high as in the mainstream, use the children to communicate that message in their homes or where they come from. So there is certainly scope and value in what you say. I simply propose, if I may, that we only need to draw on what we know we can do and formalize it, multi-stakeholder platform. Now, I see there is nobody at a microphone, and there are four of them. If you have a question that you wish to pose to any of the panel members in Pumlangesi, Environmental Compliance Manager at the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, Abongile Ngongwa, Acting Chief Director, Marine Resources Management in the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, Loiso Pandra, Chairperson, Chairman of Fish South Africa, and most recently, Pedro Garcia, founder, South African United Fishing Front. If you are going to ask a question, please, I reiterate, one minute and no more. Ask the question. Don't follow up. Don't comment. Don't think out loud. For now, just ask the question. There will be time for everything else afterwards. I saw Mama first over there. Mama, please introduce yourself. And if you come from an organization, you do so as well. And in a minute, in line with what we have seen here. Yes, obviously in line. Could we have the microphones on, please? Could our acoustics I'm Rita, but team short assist? is fine. Yes. My name is Bridget Oppelt. I'm the chairperson of the Mitchell Fishing Forum. I just got two questions, one for Mr. Louiso. A question, please, Mama. A question, A yes. singular. Singular one for Mr. Louiso. Um, for Mr.? Louiso, Pansa. I met him a few years back, so I wanted to know that in the conversation we had, engaging with the small-scale fishers of South Africa, yeah, I asked him, ask him those years back, how will he engage with us? Because he, as we are two different sectors, deep sea and small scale, so that question is still by me for today. And then Mr. Pedro Garcia, I see, yeah, you talk about um, multi-stakeholders multi engagement. So I want to know who's all included as per your vision for multi-stakeholders engagement? Because uh, there is a question hanging, but I will do that personally. Thank you so much, Mama. Much appreciated. I suppose you can ask 10 questions in 60 seconds, if you will. I'm not going to prescribe how many questions you ask, but thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, well, my question is to uh, Nobet, uh, Mr. Pancho. Um, I want to check, uh, Mr. Pancho, uh, considering um, the pressing issues of uh, high fuel prices in South Africa that affects millions of South Africans as a, as a result of our exposure to, uh, of course, external shocks because we import a lot of our fuels. Now that there's some uh, presence of uh, gas uh, availability in our shores, do you think the research that we're talking about, we should do it after 25 years uh, living the pressing social issues that are currently taking place now, or should we do this research concurrent with the activities so that we can see the impact while the activities are taking place in our shores and not use, of course, a desktop research from, uh, of course, we're going to use from other external uh, experiences, but for us to have an effective research, of course, we need to do it here. Thanks. Thank you. I see there's one more question at the back there. The gentleman, if you may. Microphone is on. Let me just see if I can. Microphone on, please. Assistance us, acoustics team. Yes. There we go. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dr. Greg Stephen Fick. I am the chairperson of the First Indigenous Nation of Southern Africa. 
My question is as follows. Fishing is a part of our first indigenous people's culture and identity. And we have our own legal authority that regulates our fishing and our ways. According to ILO 169, which is an international convention uh, regulations, free, prior, and informed consent is a principle protected by international law as a human rights law that's the standard that states all people have the right to self-determination. Hence, we have a constitutional right as indigenous people to freely pursue our economic and social and in cultural development. How can we do it if we come to an engagement such as today and we ask ourselves when we look at the panel, where are the very first people that fished on this continent? here in Southern Africa, when their voices are not even represented by a panelist. And so my question to the conveners and to the panelists, do you foresee any prosper if the very first people who have the right to the resources, it's our resources, it's our fishing, it's our territories, that you people come to invade? but we are excluded continuously and purposefully. When will our rights be respected? Thank you so much, Doc. I don't know if there's a, sp a particular responder here to that, given the fact that they are all invitees, but certainly your point is well noted, and I'm sure during the course of the program, one of the representatives of the entities who sent the invitations out will throw a word out there. For the sake of time, if you're not standing up right now, stay there. I've got two more questions. One here and one at the back there. One here first, please. Concha, Tumelang, Abokshene, Sanbonana, Namaste, Assalamu Alaikum, Molweni, Good morning, Ebatu. All I was saying is I greeted everyone in most of the languages and no one responded. I don't know, but we'll pass that point. Um, my name is Gokob Dikam Klop Khami in Korakobab, which is my native tongue. It refers to I am a chief under the descendancy of Kora. I am a cultural leader representing the first indigenous nations under the Kora Tona, which is the Korana nation. Um, my question is unfortunately uh, uh, going to to be raised for the purpose of the meeting, um, because it was mentioned by the officials from government. Um, I am, as I've introduced myself, I am also a member of the National Executive Committee of the Congress of Traditional Leaders, which is Contralesa. I am here representing of that institution as well. So um, my question relates to um, Section 7.1 of our constitution, which clearly states um, equality and human dignity. So it has to echo with what the previous speaker said. In terms of equality, we are not treated equal. We are not treated equal, irrespective of the notion that we are the first indigenous nations of this land. We are not treated equal. Right now to my question, the Marine Living Resources Act 18 of 1998, section 18.5, uh, states that in granting any right, now I, I like to highlight the important section. My brother, I'm going to granting ask you to please right. be precise and ask your question now. All right, my leader, I will do this. When Deputy Minister David Mabuza spoke to me in, at the land summit in Johannesburg a few months ago, I was suppressed by um, MEC Notolo Kibit, and I told her that this platform is cre created to raise my opinion. If, my, if you need to silence me, I will be silenced. No problem in that. If you feel I need to be silenced and no, take sir. a seat, I will the, do that. The, the mm. idea is to have a question being posed so your views can be engaged. It's not meant to be in any way hostile mm. whatsoever. 
there is no convention of people that is without rules to precisely engage the questions that ought to be engaged. I understand Please you completely. Please ask your question and no more. I am asking the question. Remember, I have to highlight the legal statute that they are using against my people so that I can show the inconsistencies of applying a foreign law which is a law of Roman Dutch origin, not a customary law. We as the people, we have been fishing these shores way before the first arrival of the European to the shores. Yet today, the control of the uh, um, aquamarine and the marine life is not in our hands, but it's in the hands of the European. Hence, me referring to their law. And which is why I was trying to highlight the historical uh, disadvantaged sectors of society. That is the crux of that particular uh, 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 um, section in the law. That says that we will be not included, prioritized, meaning that sh we should become the pinnacle of prioritization. Yet, My brother, mm, with a greater sense of respect, yes. I'm going to have to move on. Yes. I appreciate your passion. Mm. I mean no disrespect, I hear you. not to you, not to anybody in this room, not to anybody who should be in this room and mm. feels they should be in this room but is not in this room. Mm. May we please go on to Mama who has been duly waiting for her time to ask her questions. Mama, please go ahead. Watindu Mama, Watindu Mbogoto. Mandbulele El Tuba. And we are Mr. Mbanjwa. Diti Mr. Mbanjwa, jongo uba tina ke singabantu be small scale. Sine mafia, gangsters, ezi zakuti. Tina kule pemeti ngingu, zifike, zitate le pemeti yetu ngingu. Zitu kuba kwazo, ziti zi hausu bambe la intanzi, ziti magetel intanzi. Mzi yadu kubazi kuba u magetel intanzi, ziti intanzi yetu waipumange manzini. Ziti si share getina, singa peyanga, no peye, singa fumananga, kwa no cent. Dikala kuwe ke Mr. Mbanjwa, Usingwete, Jogoba Ningo, Ni Papezu Lunina, Nisingwete, Lentans yet to Squas, we maget a guni, Sikwas, who can't say, I don't get into in Nati Squas Banento, Sisikrello, Yakailam Tagata, and course. Thank you so much, Mama, much appreciated. Loiso will just quickly, when he replies to that specific question, just rehash what the question is. I am being flooded by questions coming from our online platform who just as much are in this room, just not physically. Roy Harrington, to the current speaker, and of course this is in reference to Ms. Ngesi who spoke first, what contingencies are in place when these seismic survey blastings again negatively affect the migration of valuable species to communities? And another one to you, uh, Ms. Ngesi. What is the duration of the exploration rights and how many, or how may SMMEs in fact be granted such rights? Putela, Mr. Ngongwa, what is the potential of developing an industry in South Africa where fish skin is used to treat burn victims with the target market being the African continent? What is the potential number of jobs this industry can create? I'm trying to scan through the questions so that all of my panelists at least field a question. And for you, um, Pedro, from Nomatamsanga Simons, how do fishermen obtain their fish at sea? How do they fuel their ships? Oil and gas exploration is not unique to South Africa. The rest of the world has been doing it for years. Please be mindful that the GDP of this country needs to grow and the oil and gas industry needs to develop to provide jobs to young, educated, semi-skilled and skilled youth population. This economy can't live on fish alone. Everyone needs to pull their weight to making this country great and transform South Africa from developing country to developed country status. What is the GDP contribution of the fishing industry? There are more questions. During the course of the today, I'll find time to highlight those. If we can start with Loiso, and then go to Ngongwa, then come to Ms. Ngesi, and finish off with Sergio. Sorry, Pedro. I, I think Garcia and I think the golfer, I beg your pardon for that, I mean no disrespect. Pedro. I'm sorry, man. Pedro Garcia. Loiso, very briefly, please. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Songezo. I think I will start with you, Mama. 
And uh, just to apologize to the audience, I'll, she asked me in, in, in Isikos, and I would like, like to respond in Isikos, and I will just briefly paraphrase at the end. Mama, in Tlungu, Gelen, Ubegayo, Kubage, Enyansu, in small scale, Namatube, Nwafumana, Ayoba, Ni participate, Kuko, Kosho, Agamelang, Babe, Ayosho, Tongolo, Shob, Getam, Sang, Kukona, O Mr. Ngongwa, Olap, O Chong, Enega, Enyen, Ale, Department, Enoga, Small Scale. The acting again over Gaffneg in the back, Sibe no Kala Pansi, Kakumbi Uba Apa, who members there too, Ziga Commercial, Bacona Banda, Babanda Ranyayo, Kule Mafia, that you spoke Utetengay. Kobage, I am Keleganga Londole, and I think Masi, Masi, Masi Vesa Wangu, Balapa, E leadership, yet department, Ilapa, O Mr. Nongo Lapa, a non party UTG, Ulapa. I think this is something that needs to be looked at. If no call a cell or a cool or Siam Gale, if Kukoni members as from the uh, co commercial fishing, Abezaguni, Ba 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 Bani Moshang or Lashob, the Akel Ndobangabana, Uba Uba Kale, good department, Natike, Ustale, Logan, and Amon and Kale, Baba Korn, Connegas Senzikuelo, who missed them wrong, Indoba, Omama with small scale, Naina Bana with small scale, Sayasla resource. Baba no to know about Catala leg, but Catala leg, Clamber Bacon and community safety, Ebe involved as well. So in the Shalom Telem Gainigam, Mama, Apa Gonfagan Longa, and Dova, Clambinae, a critic Sulu for Lock and Alomba, Nogayam Kelaganga in Dolo Shop. Thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, all I was saying was that with the question about the mafias that affect a small scale that was raised by Umama there, the, small, the department is here. Oh, Mr. Ngongwa should look into that. Is of course it's unacceptable that you can have a vulnerable sector that is trying to uh, earn a living, you know, uh, that being taken away by criminal elements. But I have challenged Mr. Ngongwa and the leadership of the department to uh, look into that. And on behalf of the sector, if any of our members are involved in that, of course we, it's something that we are prepared uh, to look at as well. On the other question that was raised by a gentleman here. And that, that spoke about the high levels of poverty uh, and the availability of, of gas uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the marine space and whether we, we, what we would then say in that respect. Because, of course, I think we recognize the socioeconomic challenges that are faced, facing the country. But I don't think that the rush to the sea, you know, without looking at the impact, uh, you know, is going to become a solution for various reasons. But I won't. I won't go into all those reasons now, but we must also remember that all of us here can speak for all the problems that our, our, our sectors face. I can speak about what the commercial fishing industry is facing and its problems and the poverty levels in the communities, but who speaks for the environment? And that's why we are emphasizing that while we ask for uh, the core existence of these activities on the sea, let's have the science community speak for the marine uh, for the marine species in the sea, to, because we will never know what impact we do if we do not emphasize that. So we are not opposed to the sea being uh, being explored in order to fight the poverty, but we need to say somebody's got to speak for those resources, and the people that can is the science community. Thank you, Loiso. Perhaps it is due just to somewhat break with the program and to honor, respect, and respond as such. The DDG, Ndogozo Nwabe from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, would like to take this opportunity to respond to the two particular questions in relation to the First Peoples and the views expressed therein. Ms. Ndogozo Nwabe is the DG in the Department of Mineral Resources and energies. So, Sindogozo, if the camera could focus on that particular microphone, please, I would appreciate that. Sindogozo. Thank you, uh, Program Director. Good morning to everyone. I just want to respond to the question about um, the exclusion of indigenous people. Firstly, I think the speaker that raised that concern is quite correct that. Um, Indigenous people, like all of us, everyone in South Africa is protected by the Bill of Rights in the Constitution, and the department does recognize 
um, that protection in the Constitution. Secondly, Minister Mandashe has over and over publicly indicated that he is crisscrossing the country consulting all stakeholders. He is not being selective. Thirdly, there has been a letter that um, was sent by indigenous people to the petroleum agents of South Africa, and that letter has been brought to the attention of the minister. And as recent as I think yesterday, there was a response sent through indicating that minister will create time and space to consult. But lastly, I, lastly, I wish to indicate this. Consultation is a process for all. It does not discriminate, it does not exclude anybody. And whenever adverts are put out for consultations, I will plead with all of us in this room that let's not isolate ourselves. Whenever there is a call out, there is a publication for consultation, let's all go out in our numbers and participate <coughs> in that process. Because it is through that process that we are able to get a sense of what your concerns are, what your views are, what your expectations are from government, but also what your expectations are from private sector. And I think in that regard, we have made some strides. I'll give you a practical example of something we did recently. About two months ago, um, CEO, I think we we're engaging with uh, the oil and gas, in one of the oil and gas companies. And we raised this concern sharply with them to say, when they send out documents, for consultation, they need to translate them into different languages so that you are able to read and understand in your own language, so that you are able to meaningfully then participate and respond to what has been given to you. And some of the companies have already started doing that. And it is our intention that we, 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 we do better and better on that. But the plea is that let's all come out in numbers and participate whenever there is a call, but also to emphasize that Minister is still continuing with his consultation rounds, and he will reach all communities in all the provinces of the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, DG. Abongile. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Um, I'm going to respond to two issues that have been raised. I think the first one relates to the Marine Living Resources Act. The act does not exclude anyone from participating um, in the fishing space. And in doing so, also at the same time, we do recognize that there is a need uh, to equitably provide access to marine resources for people to participate uh, in the fishing space. And the Act um, provides for that, and that is one of the reasons why we have this new small-scale fisheries sector. However, in terms of the Act, um, and also based on the engagements that we've had uh, with the fishing communities and the general stakeholders, uh, what we want to indicate is that uh, the department is in the process of amending the Marine Living Resources Act. And the main basis for that is to clarify some of the issues that are already in the Act that are not as clear as we would want it to be. One of the things that we are going to consider in, in, in amending the Act is to properly clarify the issue of customary practices and the issue of customary rights. And we are inviting um, everyone to participate in that process. Then uh, another issue that was raised, I think, via the, the social media was the issue of the use of fish skin for treating bands. I think these are some of the innovations that government in general uh, definitely supports, specifically for the department in understanding that uh, one would want to utilize the entire fish and limit uh, any wastage that comes from the fish that is landed. So it's an innovation that will definitely um, support as the department in ensuring that um, it, it puts uh, South Africa uh, in a map and in ensuring that um, uh, there's creation of jobs uh, in that particular process. So I think it's something that would be definitely interested in as a department. Thank you very much.
Okay, I will start with the second question that I had very clearly um, on the duration of the exploration rights and also how many SMMEs do we have. So the exploration right can be, um, okay, the first initial period, maybe let me start there. A right can be issued to a maximum of three years, first initial. And then it can be renewed for three times over a two-year period, meaning that it's two times three, which is six years. So in total, an exploration right can be granted over a nine-year period as per the current regulatory framework. In terms of the SMEs, um, I can't say from the top of my head, but I do request the person who raised the question to send that um, to an email colleagues at the back. If you can ask this person to send an email to that event so that we can provide him or her with the stats. What was the, other question? the second question from Roy Harrington to the current speaker. What contingencies are in place when seismic survey blasting again negatively affects the migration of valuable species to okay. communities? All right, thank you. So what happens is um, seismic surveys, they can take place over a certain period. For instance, they can take place between December and May. And the intention of limiting them to that period is to make sure that the migratory species are avoided. In addition to that, in areas where there is, for instance, um, peak fishing, I'll make an example of pole, is it pole tuna or tuna pole? Fishing, yes, uh, yeah. So um, usually it takes place over a certain period, and what normally happens there, and those are the things that come out during consultation. So what normally happens then? Then the seismic surveys would avoid that season. So as a way of an example. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to respond to the one question by Bridget Opel. I'm not sure whether I got it properly, but let me attempt to at least respond to that. The grassroots communications framework and the multi-stakeholder platform is a proposal at this point in time. You will have noted that we have spoken about the integrity of the process, and that integrity is also based on inclusivity and transparency. It's based on peer review, and it's also based on us being able to, at a later stage, say that this particular uh, document or process can withstand legal scrutiny. So we've covered all the bases, and the, part the participatory process becomes part of the proposal. It is not a one-stop shop where we said, this is the proposal, these are the parties involved. It cannot be. It has to be everybody. But it's also impossible to expect to get everybody together at the same time. So there has to be a follow-up process to the proposal, and it has to be taken further into the community so that we can ensure that the integrity of the framework stays in place. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, well, that's the end of the first session. I think you can all give yourselves a round of applause. And more importantly, there is one person who has made every presentation, who has made every follow-up, who has asked every question and answered every question. It's the lady here on my right. What a force Triforce and Zulengwe is. I think you have earned your break. Let's take a break, ladies and gentlemen. I'm trying to cover time, 15 minutes. 
and we're gonna open up with a strong voice in Dr. Ellen Busak. You don't wanna miss it. In 15 minutes, he's starting. If you know Peter Vainen, Sarah Wilkinson, and Mark Meekin, and Miles Parsons, please send them my way. Peter Vainen, Sarah Wilkinson, Mark Meekin, Miles Parsons, and Stephen Kirkman, please send them my way. They are the next speakers in the next session.
managing that? Uh, can anybody hear me on Teams? Is there anybody on Teams that can hear me? I need you to be able to talk back to me, please. Yeah, but nobody's talking to me yet. Hi, I'm coming to you from the ballroom. I just want to confirm that I can hear everybody on Teams, please. Can we do a camera test, a camera test and an audio test via Teams, please? Peter. Hi, Peter. Can you hear me? Peter, can you hear me? I'm coming to you from the ballroom. It's the tech team, yeah? Okay, do me a favor. Just go into the audio settings quickly in Teams. Audio settings in Teams. Okay. I need somebody in Teams to talk back to us. We want to make sure that we're receiving the team's audio, please, before we go live. Just go into your audio settings quickly. Um, settings on top there, go to more. Uh, speakers is what? Just go to your speaker. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hi. Mimi, hi. Talk to us, please. Okay. Keep on talking. I heard something come through, but it's very soft. No. I saw the signal come up, and then it's gone again. Mimi, can you talk to us, please? Or oh, Peter, somebody. Yes, I'm here, but okay, my sound go, is delayed. Go. Have you got that? Hi. Hello. I'm here. This is Mimi. Hi. Can you hear me, Mimi? Yeah, this is Mimi from Pasa. I can't hear. Can yes, I'm talking to you. Can you hear me? Oh, can you speak to you can hear Yes, we can hear you. We, we can hear you. How's, how's your sound? Can you hear us clear, loud? Mimi? Mimi? No, the so the so yes, welcome back yeah. to the second session of the pre-colloquium event. Guys, please don't put me on yet. I'm just trying to get them in. Everything should be coming. Don't go live yet. I'm just trying to get them in the room. If you're in the room, you're not allowed to leave. The tea break is over. We are starting now with the second session. Two of the three slots for this session are virtual, and one is physical. And so the technical team will ensure that the virtual presenters, that's Peter Vainen, Chairperson of Energio Alliance Committee, 
will be virtual, that's presentation one, and the case study that Mark Meekin and Miles Parsons, both doctors, research scientists at the Australian Institute for Marine Sciences, they will be presenting virtually and physically will be Sarah Wilkinson and Stephen Kirkman. Sarah and I introduced each other just now. There she is. Welcome, Sarah. Come through to the platform, please, and bring your presentation notes and pick a chair. Of course, we can't always guarantee that we start on time simply because, well, people are people. TIA, you know those things. I wonder if I have a... I'm, I'm going to try my luck again to try and get the members in. Please bear with me, everybody. Peter is standing by for you, Peter. The Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi password, password is on the big screen. Please continue to use it and use it to help garner traction for this pre-colloquium event at hashtag PCECTICC, pre-colloquium event, Cape Town International Convention Center. 
Of course, we acknowledge that we have people in the venue physically as we do in the virtual space. Their questions are coming through thick and fast. I really, I really cannot keep up. I certainly do acknowledge, appreciate, and encourage their continued participation on the platform. Dr. Busak. Dr. Busak. Pedro. Pedro. Before we start, Before we start it has come it to my attention, my attention we nearly, we nearly did, not did not have a full a first session panel. Because Mama on the screen last night passed away. And Mama gave birth to Pedro behind me on my right. One cannot imagine the pain and the grief of losing a mother, not least the day before where you have an obligation to society as Pedro had committed himself. Where it comes from, I don't know. He summoned the strength to present himself and to honor this occasion. There can be no greater commitment known to this platform. Dr. Busak, we know what you can do. Relieve Mama's spirit from this mortal world. Usher hers to where she belongs, to meet with her maker, and please hold our brother Pedro, his hand, and give him the courage and strength to soldier on, however difficult right now it is. Thank you so much. This is unexpected. And I would ask every one of you to please stand for a moment as I dedicate the spirit of Pedro Garcia's mother and ask God to embrace her as she embraces all of our children here today. Pedro said to me, the reason why he is here and not with the family at this moment, discharging what he sees as his responsibility to be with us this morning, is because he says, my mother would have said, that's where you must be. That's her spirit. And so she is inspired by God who has called her home and she inspires her son to in turn inspire us to continue with this important work. There is much pain in his heart this morning. And there is much pain in this room this morning. And I heard some of it as our people were speaking. I ask you not to suppress that pain but not to hold on to it as if it means nothing. But let that pain not be your pain only, but know that it is shared by millions across this land. And everything that we hear is a call to our rededication to truth and to justice and to do what is right. For our government, they know that the first obligation of any government is to take care of its people, not just to hear what our people need, but what our people deserve. And that is what I hope will come out of this gathering today. And so with the panels that must come today, but these are important conversations. Let us make them also policy-changing and life-changing conversations. And so that what we commit ourselves to today, we will make a reality in the lives of our communities. And we know that there is an urgency about it, it cannot wait. And so with that, I would ask you just to close your eyes for one moment with me, and let's have a moment of silence. You who have brought us together, oh, 
Holy One of all of us gathered here. Be with us in this day, be with every single heart, whatever the pain, whatever the struggle, whatever the hopes, whatever the desire, whatever the aspiration for ourselves and for our people all across this land. Guide those to whom you have given responsibility to make sure that the lives of our people are worthy of living. Give strength to us as we continue the struggles for justice and for dignity and for genuine peace and for a true democracy. Guide us, help us, lead us, sustain us so that we never give up knowing that what we do is always worth it because we do it for all the reasons that are right and just and peaceable. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Pusak. Strength to you, Pedro. Isabella Garcia, 13 August 1927, 24 August 2022, 95, not nearly a bad innings. Presentation one. Understanding Seismic Survey, a virtual presentation by Mr. Peter Vainen, Chairman of Energio Alliance Committee, to talk to the history of technology, technological advances, different applications of seismic surveys, and how often that is used. Peter, I don't imagine you don't know the drill. In fact, it is so much easier to cut you we simply press a button and we move on. Of course, we're not going to do that. We're going to respect each other. Welcome, Peter. Are you on? I, I, am, I am on, and I hope you can hear me all. We certainly can hear of course, you. Of course, the acoustics team here is going to increase the volume a bit so that the sound can carry can throughout, carry the, room. throughout the room. But all the very best all for your presentation, best for your presentation Peter. Peter. Thank you very much, sir. Um, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, of course, my sincere condolences to Pedro and his family with this, uh, this terrible loss. And um, to continue, thank you, of course, to the organizers of this symposium um, for the opportunity um, to give you a brief overview of what it is when we talk about seismic in reference to exploration in an, in an offshore environment. Um, as you can imagine, as geoscientists, we we often, or actually we often look at what's beneath the surface and we're always very intrigued and fascinated what's below the land and or the sea. And seismic is an important tool or a critical tool to be able to do that. So um, in, this, in this overview, um, what I have for you today, I will touch upon uh, the importance of, of exploration and seismic uh, surveying, and we'll, I'll try to give you a better idea what geophysical seismic surveys are. A little bit about the, the history, um, some of the technology, uh, technological advances over the years, um, but also I, I'd like to spend quite a bit of time to, 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 to show you what a, a seismic survey operation uh, really entails. Um, as already mentioned before, my name is Peter Weinen and I present to you as a, as a member of the Energy Alliance. Um, the Alliance is a, a global organization representing the energy and geoscience industry. Uh, we have members all, all over the world, and we form an organization which aims to, to ensure a, a safe, sustainable discovery and development of energy sources. And that is all energy sources, conventional hydrocarbon sources, as well as alternative energy and, and low carbon energy solutions. Um, and that's obviously what, uh, what the world is, is looking for. I can be fairly brief when it comes to, to the importance of explorations. So, some of it has been touched upon by previous, previous uh, pre uh, presenters. Um, and I will primarily focus on, on the importance of seismic and how, uh, what, what, what uh, role seismic plays in this process. 
So, um, as mentioned by by several in in the room and and also by pre in in previous symposiums um, uh, uh, held held a few a uh, few weeks ago, uh, the global energy demand is continuing to to increase. Um, it's potentially even accelerated somewhat due to recent political events uh, and. The industry at this point in time is looking at Africa, especially, um, uh, and, and to to meet some of that demand, and that's only fueled by some successes in in recent uh, in recent months and years in in, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Namibia, and also in in South Africa, of course. For the Republic of South Africa, I think developing. Um, uh, these resources uh, has a potential great benefit. Um, of course, when we talk about um, the, the availability of energy, the energy security, uh, the creation of jobs, and, and, and when you think about the overall trade and, and economic growth, it, uh, it can bring. So investment had to, 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 get, to, to, to get those benefits, the investment in, in conventional uh, hydrocarbon exploration remains an essential, uh, an, an essential thing to, to get to that demand. And geophysical analysis through seismic surveys is, 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 is where that exploration journey actually begins. So when we perform seismic surveys um, at the beginning of an exploration program, uh, the main aim is to obtain an as accurate as possible image of the subsurface. Um, we can interpret this image and, and define areas of interest uh, of, and, and of possible accumulations of hydrocarbons. Uh, creating such a, a detailed image ensure that the success rate on the wells we drill is, is higher. Um, the detail in these um, seismic data sets, they can highlight areas of, of large interest uh, and they can even delineate certain reservoir boundaries. But at the same time, it could show areas where we, we have less interest. Now, in addition to, in addition to that, the, the seismic is also very, um, very useful uh, to reduce the risk in, in further exploration parts of the program or in, in further parts of the exploration program. Uh, for example, the very um, detail in the very near off, uh, near surface uh, and understanding high pressure shallow gas zones, for example, and, and that's just to name a few. It also enables engineers to, to accurately model reservoir properties, and, 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 and that's, that's obviously very important throughout the cycle. And if we use seismic throughout the cycle of the, of the asset, it can even prolong and extend the life of the, of the field. So, Geophysical exploration and seismic in specific is a, is a, is a safe, proven and efficient tool which, um, which we can determine, uh, which can re determine the resource, resource potential in this particular environment. Now, now, seismic is not only used for hydrocarbon exploration, just to give you an idea, it's, it's also a, a critical tool when we talk about uh, carbon, ca uh, carbon capture and storage, for example. It's also required to understand the near surface complexity or the very shallow subsurface complexity when we are talking about wind farms placements and, and so forth, also to, to, to locate marine, man, uh, marine minerals. But even in, in non-energy related uh, parts, seismic is used. It's used for the prediction and monitoring of earthquakes, tsunamis, and, and, and you, can, you can in theory look for, uh, for lost shipwrecks, for example, with, with this type of technology. But this technology in itself is is not new. It's um, sorry. It, uh, the technology itself is not uh, is not new. In fact, it's been used for uh, for many many years. Uh, certainly, the last 50, 50 years or so, we've seen an enormous amount of use of of, of seismic, and the technology has dramatically improved. Uh, and major advances have been made uh, over time. So, from two D, from simple two D or two dimensional images of the subsurface to very detailed 3D volumes where, where details um, are, are such that we can even accurately predict uh, reservoir properties. So let me go into a little bit more what it's involved in, in seismic uh, operations itself and, uh, and what seismic actually is. So what we do in a seismic survey is, is send sound waves, uh, which are created by, by high pressure air into the, into the subsurface. Now, these waves, they propagate, 
through the water layer into the earth and they reflect from geological boundaries in the subsurface. Now, these reflections are recorded by, by sensors um, uh, and re receivers, which in this particular case, as you see in the image, are towed behind the, in, in a cable behind a, a seismic vessel. Now, using sound waves uh, to image structures, is, uh, uh, which we can't really see by the eye, is not only used uh, for seismic exploration in, in, in our industry. Actually, uh, seismic imaging is, is very similar to, to ultra, ultrasound technology, for example. And the principle is the same. Uh, the sound, wave, sound waves are generated and received by, by a, a specialist receiver or and the resulting data, which you can get, is is processed and interpreted, uh, and 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 the data is used uh, used used further. So it's not a, it's not a unique type of uh, of of technology only for the exploration industry. Now, when we go back to the the the, the, the actual marine seismic acquisition, uh, the main elements of of this are are, are pretty similar for all marine seismic uh, systems, and they they can be described in three three components. Uh, we have a marine seismic source, which produces the sound waves sound waves which uh, propagate through the earth. Um, we have uh, receivers um, or listening devices which record the energy which is reflected in the subsurface and, and then we have a recording system which takes all the data, uh, accumulates it, stores it uh, for further analysis, uh, processing and, and, uh, and interpretation of course. So if we look at these individual items, uh, first of all, the signal we sent into the Earth uh, can be as an, uh, an extremely important part of the uh, on, on the effect of the quality of the end result. So for many years, uh, the most effective way of achieving this is by using a seismic source array, as you can see on the image here. So the seismic arrays, they rapidly release compressed air. This causes a bubble a bubble to be formed and this uh, formation of the bubble produces a sound wave and this sound wave that travels through through the water through the to the ocean floor and into the subsurface now these these arrays they usually consist in the order of six or seven smaller smaller sources and and we use multiple arrays uh, to produce this acoustic wave now most modern seismic acquisition still arise on, on these acoustic sources. Now, new alternatives, they, they are being, being in, in, in development too, and they may offer some advantages in certain areas. So a lot of research at the moment is going on into the use of, for example, smaller but single sources, um, but also in the, in the form of uh, electrical vibrators, which are being developed and tested with the aim to, uh, to improve or to, to give a different output characteristics when compared to the, the, the compressed air sources, for example. But a lot of research still has to be done in order to give the same, um, the same results and end results, uh, which, which can be used for further exploration uh, purposes. Um, the next component of the seismic acquisition system is the receivers. Now, the receivers are, if we look at a marine environment, are located in streamers or cables, which are, are towed behind a vessel. Um, in early days, that was only one cable, uh, but as technology advanced, more streamers were uh, are, are being used. This uh, has multiple benefits for quality, resolution, and also efficiency, of course. Now, modern surveys, on average, they use a, a streamer length, a length of cable of, of almost eight kilometers, but it's not uncommon to see them even longer at 10 or 12. Uh, that's especially the case when you have a more complex subsurface. Now, these cables, they are towed below the sea surface at, at a depth, well, between eight or up to 25 meters in, uh, or, or even deeper in, in cases. Now, the image you see on screen here is, 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 show, is showing a vessel with, with 16 streamers uh, being towed behind it. And that's, that's what you see. You see the front end of those streamers within the blue circle. And, and the red circle uh, de depicts what we call a paravane or a, or a door. That makes, that makes sure that the, the, the spread of streamers is, is staying, uh, staying as, it, as it is and doesn't collapse on itself. Now, for exploration surveys, the, 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 um, the width between the streamers, uh, the separation between the streamers is in the order of around, say, 100 to 150 meters. 
So if you look at the whole object uh, for, a, for, for 10 kilometers long, it could be uh, for 10 kilometer long streamers, it's an object of, of almost 20 square kilometers, which is, which is moving uh, through, through the ocean, through the water. The final component of the seismic acquisition system is the is the recording system. So as the data gets collected on the on on the receivers, it's it's recorded on the systems which are on board this this seismic vessel. On board, we we check the quality. We make sure the equipment performs to specifications and that uh, the positioning and everything is correct. Now. Initial processing steps can also be performed, uh, and and you can get a good idea what uh, what the data looks like and if the quality is is as ex as expected. So you can see this 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 um, this part of the operation is, is the main communication center of 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 the survey of the operation with open links to all other aspects of um, of of the survey. Now, it's. Clear that an operation like like this, as I've just been describing, cannot be achieved on its own. Um, so, depending on the size, the location, uh, several other vessels are part of the fleet uh, performing a project like this. So, in addition to uh, a seismic vessel, we make use of a dedicated supply vessel. So, this vessel brings in supplies from 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 shore uh, that can be food and other 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 bits and pieces, but also fuel uh, and crew members if they have to have to be transferred in and out. On top of the supply vessel, we make use of what we call chase boats. Um, their primary task is to uh, to to guard the in sea equipment. So they make sure that um, that no one uh, passes over and damages the equipment. Um, and they're also an inter integral part to communicate uh, with uh, the fishing and other vessels in the area and to coordinate the best approach to ensure that all parties can can continue their work as efficiently and as effective as possible. On top, on top of that, they perform scouting work uh, in front of the vessel to make sure that, uh, that we're not um, sailing into unknown or undocumented uh, obstructions. So just everyone has an idea. Um, there is a variety of seismic vessels uh, operating around the world. Uh, but just as a guide, a, a seismic vessel is usually in, in the order of 8 to 100 meters, 8, 80 to 100 meters long. A width can vary between 30 to 50, 60 meters. When operating in a survey area, so when we are acquiring um, the seismic data, the vessel usually moves with a speed somewhere between say, four to five knots. That's eight, eight, eight and a half kilometers an hour. Of course, this this speed goes up when we're uh, when we're transiting uh, between between work and between survey areas. At any one point during an operation, there are 60 to 70 people working on a, on a seismic vessel, and that obviously includes marine crew, seismic crew, so the crew who takes care of the, the sources and of the and all the receivers. It contains marine mammal observers, client reps, fishing liaison officers, and and uh, and passive uh, passive acoustic monitoring operators. And, and 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 I'm sure I've forgotten a few, but those are. Uh, important part of the of the operation. Now, the way we acquire a seismic survey is is to ensure we uh, we do this efficiently. As, obviously, we want to do this as efficiently as possible. So, we plan to acquire a series of what we call salines with the aim to image the subsurface completely. So, what you're seeing in the image here is 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 one saline track uh, with the streamers in in blue behind the, the vessel. And the, the the coverage we we image in the subsurface is is described by the yellow by the yellow um, the yellow box as such. So you can see in general the wider the acquisition setup, uh, the larger the subsurface coverage, and the more efficient uh, we can make this uh, we, we can make this survey. So to complete a full survey. We acquire all necessary salines uh, to create a full coverage of the subsurface. So the way we do this is, in practice, is we acquired it in what we call a racetrack mode. Uh, so given the size of the vessel and equipment behind this, this is allows to to make efficient and effective line turns. So usually we start at one side of the survey. So in this particular case, we start at, uh, at, at, at the top line number one, and we go to line number five and acquire it in a different, in, in the opposite direction. Then we go to two, six, three, 
seven and you uh, you get uh, you get where we're going to so in principle we are only uh, sailing once in in every location so depending on the survey setup uh, the distance between these lines uh, is is anywhere between seven to to nine hundred meters in uh, particularly in in exploration surveys So depending on the survey size, and I, I have to have to highlight that, uh, the, the duration of a survey is, is anywhere from, say, three weeks for a, a small survey of four to five hundred square kilometers um, up to um, four to five months for, for, for surveys uh, which are which are larger in size. So anywhere between, say, five and ten thousand square kilometers. Now, this doesn't mean that we're operating constantly. Uh, the, 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 this time period, this total time period, also includes line changes, periods of maintenance where we have to obviously make sure we maintain the, the sources and, and streamers we have uh, behind our vessel. A typical line change or a typical non-operated time uh, is, 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 can be in the order of four to six hours on, a, on an operation where we use uh, 12 to 14 cables uh, of eight kilometers length, for example. Finally, in the, in the overview up to now, um, I've primarily focused on single vessel and, 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 and what we would call more exploration type of, of surveys. Um, but there, obviously there are more, more flavors of, of seismic and more, uh, more, more acquisition geometries we can deploy. This is often the case uh, if, if the subsurface complexity becomes more challenging. Uh, then we're looking at what we call high density surveys where some of these cables are closer together. Or, or we acquired a survey in, 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 for example, in different directions when we call uh, what we call dual or multi azimuth surveys, and that's uh, that's uh, that's what has been uh, depicted in the in the image you see on uh, on the screen now. One step above. Uh, above this, a single vessel operation is a multi-vessel uh, operation. This is often the case for what we call wide azimuth or continuous long offset or, or full azimuth surveys, as well as ocean bottom node surveys. These are, are often applied uh, when we have even more complex uh, challenges in the subsurface and, and even more accurate elimination is required to, to get a good idea where and, and, and what is, lies beneath the, the surface uh, below us. So concluding, um, obviously uh, in 20 minutes or in 20 minute presentation, I can't go into every detail about seismic operations but at least i hope i've given you those who are not familiar with this technology a slightly better idea what it is and what's involved it's clear that geophysical exploration and, and seismic in particular plays an important part in the exploration efforts going forward in order to meet uh, energy demands of the future now seismic is established is an established method it's proven to give the required results in a, in a safe and efficient manner um, of, of course, continuing advances in, in seismic technology only make this, this more safe, more efficient, and, 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 and further improvements are, are, are always coming. So with that, I'd like to conclude this presentation. Uh, of course, if you would like to, to learn more, uh, I think a good starting point is the Energeo Alliance website, which you see here online. Uh, it also contains some interactive material and, and video material uh, for reference. So. With that, thank you for your attention. Baie dankie Pieter Weinen. Dit was vir my ook een baie interessant voorlegging. En ek sien na ook die volgende sprekers en wat, wat hulle vir ons sal sê van die wetenskap van oil and gas exploration. Oom, goed genoeg? <laughs> I had one of the gentlemen come to me in the downtime saying, you know that the Western Cape has three official languages. He didn't need to say more. I knew what that meant for me. <laughs> Interestingly, Peter did not once use the word blast. And that, and is, that such is such an, such important, an important bit of detail. Bit of detail. That, that, I even plead my, own, plead ignorance my own ignorance here, here had somehow had associated, associated what, seismology what seismology 
in a net effect meant. I thought it was about blasting. Loiso, are you here? You had raised the question of the impact of sound. Um, I think somewhat you have been answered. It might not be everything you had anticipated you would hear, but the scientists are in the room now, and I'm hoping your antenna, just as much as I, are attentive to the detail because some of the learning that comes from Peter's presentation surely exists in the exploration in the Orange Basin, Orange Basin in Namibia. Earlier this year, two giant oil companies have found oil and they're excited about the prospect. And of course, the Orange Basin is not limited to the territorial waters of Namibia. It spans into South Africa's territorial waters in that EEZ to which I made reference earlier on. And the question then becomes, what about South Africa or when South Africa? And some of those answers to these questions already exist if we can use some of the science that has come through from our neighbors in Namibia. Thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. Dr. Stephen Kirkman is a specialist scientist at the Oceans and Coast Department in the Department of Forestry, Fisheries, and Environment. He is going to present now before Ms. Sarah Wilkinson, who is from Capricorn Marine. We're just swapping that around. They are here in person. And then, of course, we will continue the program as it is. We are trying our level best to catch up with time. Of course, it is not for me to speak and not to speak, but I can only conscientize us that we please continue to be conscious of time. As for the questions and answers, please keep them coming through. There will be a session at the end. Stephen. Thanks, Nkeza. Um, I think both uh, Sarah and myself prepared more towards 20-minute presentations each. So. Um, to fit us both in, we have to reduce. I'm going to have to gloss over some of the slides, um, I, um, I'm afraid. But um, yeah. do I have, do I control it from here? Uh, yeah. OK. OK, there we go. Um, let's just, uh, I think, first remind ourselves some of the acoustic characteristics of the air gun noise that, that's relevant to us. Um, we know that the, 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 greatest, the greatest energy output, um, acoustic output, is downwards, of course, but significant energy is also radiated in other directions, including almost horizontally, so we, it, it's almost omnidirectional in the ocean. And um, the greatest energy is radiated at lower frequencies, and this energy can transmit quite far or very far in the marine environment, you know, hundreds, even thousands of kilometers, it's been showing. This is very much uh, dependent on the um, characteristics of the, um, the, the sound propagation characteristics of the environment. Um, and considering a pulse is, uh, a, no, I call it a pulse, not a blast, is generated every few seconds. Um, background noise can be um, elevated near continuously during, the, um, uh, during operations. And um, this, of course, exposes a wide range of species and habitat to chronically elevated sound levels, uh, noise levels, during the course of a seismic survey. Um, so the predominance, we, we, we know that the predominant frequency range of seismic surveys is within the hearing range of many marine organisms, uh, including cetaceans and, and most fish species, and such animals rely on low frequency sound and hearing for, um, for survival functions such as communication, um, finding mates and that, uh, detection of prey and predators. So the noise of course can interfere with the way in which they receive acoustic signals, in other words by masking the natural signals that they're supposed to receive. And the noise can also have a, um, a range of other biological effects. Um, these include behavioral and stress responses um, among animals, or uh, for those uh, more acutely exposed to the noise, um, there could be physical and physiological effects, um, such as temporary or permanent hearing loss or other organ damage. This is all uh, potential effects. And it's important to note that even if the, um, the hearing frequency of animals doesn't overlap with that of the seismic noise, um, they can still be impacted by the loudness of the noise, which um, I think is equivalent to um, sound pressure levels of around about 260 decibels, if I remember as it's emitted. Um, 
and um, so potentially the, 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 this, the, the emitted sound can result in mortality of animals, e either directly, those that are acutely exposed to the sound, or indirectly by affecting um, various, uh, a range of different functions that are necessary for survival, like feeding and reproduction. Migration has also been mentioned. Um, and if severe enough, these effects on individuals um, can translate to effects at the population level, um, especially when um, combined with impacts from other stresses in the marine environment. And um, they can also ultimately lead to ecosystem effects, for example, if trophic, in, if trophic um, interactions are um, severely disrupted, or, um, uh, and, and also socioeconomic impacts, for example, if fisheries catches are reduced or something like that. Um, Lots of the, um, there's been quite a lot of research on the impacts of underwater noise, including seismics. A lot of this has focused on um, whales and dolphins, for example. There's still many gaps in our understanding, especially with regard to other groups such as, as fish and invertebrates. invertebrates. Um, and then again, some of the research has produced very conflicting results. If you look in the international literature, a good example of this is the impacts on, fat, on, on plankton, um, including zooplankton and ichthyoplankton, which is the larvae and eggs of fish. Um, most uh, lab-based studies have shown that there's, there's no impacts on plankton beyond about 10 meters from the sound source, but then there was one study in Australia that reported mortality um, and reduced abundance, um, severely reduced abundance up to about uh, more than a kilometer from the sound source. So this, of course, sends shockwaves around, um, knowing the importance of, 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 of zooplankton for marine ecosystem functioning and the potential impacts on, 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 on fish and whales and so on. But um, subsequently, a, at least one field study has, um, one further field study has then shown results that contradict this and once again confirm that um, the impacts are only up to about 10 meters, no more. So there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of controversy still around this. Um, just looking at other groups, and I'm going to have to um, gloss through some of these, including invertebrates. I'm going to skip to the fish, which is probably more relevant here. Um, there have been um, um, studies on fish, lab-based studies, for example, um, also done in freshwater rivers, looking at impacts of seismic noise or simulated seismic noise. Um, some of these studies have shown that the, um, the noise can have uh, can cause injury to fish, including permanent threshold shifts in hearing, uh, barotrauma, which is um, pressure-induced uh, injury to, um, to, to the gas well chambers in the fishes, and, um, and also behavioral responses um, in, in the wild, um, in the field. Some studies have shown changes in vertical distribution of fishes up to about, as far as about five kilometers from the sound source. Um, and another study, other studies have shown um, changes in hori horizontal distribution, namely, uh, or essentially displacement or avoidance behavior as far as eight kilometers from the sound source. And um, it's important to note that for some of these fish species, not only fish species, but other species as well that are resident, if they are, uh, if they are displaced from the area that they are familiar with or um, uh, 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 their preferred area, um, it can have other impacts. Uh, in terms of stress, um, in terms of um, increased vulnerability to predation, for example, or reduced, reduced efficiency at feeding or at reproduction. Um, I'm going to skip through some of the other groups just in the interest of time. Uh, penguins, um, turtles, um, whales, I think they have less interest to the, to the audience here, but I think it's quite important to note that um, for these groups, Unlike maybe fish and invertebrates, um, experiments um, to actually determine what are the physical effects of these sound levels on the animals are considered unethical, so they haven't really been concluded. And um, the, the, they can only really be observed in <clears throat> if they actually happen, if they actually occur in the wild, if the mortality actually, uh, in other words, if mortality is observed. But even then, for example, in marine animal strandings like whales or dolphins, it's very difficult to determine causality. And um, that's basically uh, uh, very much a theme if you look in the literature um, that, that these events happen, but it's, uh, it's, it's often very difficult to determine a clear effect between a seismic survey and um, uh, mortality events or anything like that. At the same time, it's quite difficult to, um, to rule such 
uh, effects out. This, this is also relevant to um, possible uh, relationships between seismic surveys and fishery catches and so on. Um, other survey techniques, I'm going to skip through that briefly. Now, regarding um, mitigation um, and associated monitoring, there's, there's no real agreed international standard for this per se, but the, the mitigation and monitoring guidelines that were developed in the United Kingdom have um, provided a, a basis for guidelines that have been adopted in other regions and countries and adapted accordingly. Um, and one can draw from these that some of the critical elements of a robust mitigation and monitoring program include substantial advanced planning, um, also uh, if required by law, uh, an EIA should be an intrinsic part of that planning as, as it is required here in South Africa. Um, and of course, appropriate communication and consultation with stakeholders um, and affected parties um, at the out from the outset. Um, and during operations, there must be adequate mitigation measures, um, and this should be um, uh, th this should be associated with um, appropriate monitoring. This includes uh, observations and acoustic monitoring. Um, this is both to as part of the mitigation measures, also to monitor the responses of animals to the operations and the mitigation measures, and to collect scientific data. Um, and finally, um, the systematic analysis of results after the surveys to help to um, uh, inform future planning and mitigation measures. Now, just touching on some of those, um, on, on some of those um, critical mitigation measures, I'm not going to go through all of them. Some of them are quite well known. The lowest practical air gun volume, um, but looking at the, at, at the buffer zone, or, or no, not the buffer zone, the exclusion zone or safety zone, this is basically a radius around the sound source, and that's, um, that should be visibly clear of animals before and during the operations to avoid any acute effects to the animals. Um, and this is obviously the animals that are visible, which is mainly cetaceans and other things, uh, fish are not very visible. Um, and this, the, the, the distance of this or the radius of this is meant to be roughly equivalent to the zone within which injury or discomfort to sensitive animals are expected to occur, um, as per that theoretical diagram over on the top right there. Um, there was also um, associated with the, ex with, with the exclusion zone, um, uh, there should be pre-shoot searches, uh, slow starts, gradual starts to allow animals to move away from the area, um, and shutdowns or delayed starts if animals occur within that exclusion zone. Now also with regard to mitigation in planning, um, Planning must include spatial and temporal planning where applicable to avoid sensitive areas or seasons for species and their life history functions. Um, and these, also these sensitive areas, uh, including MPAs, should be surrounded by appropriate buffer zones where no seismic uh, survey activity can occur. Um, and this should be equivalent to the distance beyond which no acute impacts are expected um, depending on the what the species of concern are. For example, in Norway, the um, seismic survey uh, surveying may not occur in critical spawning areas or migratory areas at the, at, at, in those particular seasons. This is to prevent the seismic noises uh, scaring away the breeding adult fish or causing damage to the spawning products like the eggs or, or larvae and so on. And they use a buffer zone of five nautical miles at least of no activity and beyond that even up to 20 nautical miles where uh, uh, full strength sur surveys may not occur. Um, but the, the sizes of the exclusion zones and the buffer zones may differ between country. Um, uh, the extent often seems arbitrary, and this is something that it's generally agreed needs more of a scientific basis using modeling, uh, modeling methods. Okay. Um, next slide. Now, these the mitigation, there are a lot of unknowns, of course. These mitigation measures are, are not fail-safe. Um, they are, I mean, they're largely to re avoid or reduce the acute impacts on marine animals, but the actual effectiveness of these measures are largely unproven. Just in terms of common sense, we think they must work, but there's not a lot of science to back it up at this stage. Um, also, sound doesn't always behave as we would think it would behave. Um, for example, it may decrease with distance from the sound source as expected, but then due to reflections or refractions or whatever, the sound may increase again. Uh, this could result in animals actually 
swimming towards the sound source to try and escape sound, or else being exposed to greater levels when swimming further away. So, um, also animals may not try to shift horizontally away from the sound source as, as expected. Some may dive vertically and then inadvertently become more greatly exposed to, to the sound. Um, and finally, of course, I'll just skip a few points there, but the mitigation measures, um, they may be effective in a lot of ways, but they can't address the habitat degradation and associated impacts on individuals, populations, and the ecosystem that may arise through long-term repeated persistent seismic surveys um, and, and the exposure, or the cumulative effects and or synergistic effects between these between this activity and other surveys. And at, at least some of these issues uh, maybe point to the need to explore alternative survey technologies, as mentioned in the previous um, slide, in, in the previous presentation. But for the foreseeable future, it, it does seem as though seismics is definitely with us. And um, there's, so there's a continued need to really understand the environmental and management impacts of the surveys on our marine life and how to address them better. So, Sarah. Okay, with this in mind, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give it over to Sarah just to mention that um, the, the department has come up with a, a research plan. Um, this is still a plan at the moment. Um, it's, it's only been developed this year and uh, potential endpoints of the plan will obviously include recommendations for national policy on this. Um, in various standards and guidelines. Um, there's a lot of work involved, a lot of expense. We're going to require cooperation with the oil and gas industry. Um, uh, it's going to be essential for several elements of the research that we do propose. I'm going to skip the next slide and hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. I don't have uh, much time left of our al allocated combined 20 minutes for our presentation, but uh, my name is Sarah Wilkinson, uh, and I am from Capricorn Marine Environmental, which is a con consulting company uh, based in Cape Town that um, uh, works with fisheries data. We have a, a broad-based understanding of the commercial and small-scale sectors that operate in South African waters. Uh, and myself, I've been involved uh, with a number of, uh, as a specialist, um, a specialist uh, in terms of the fisheries assessments for a number of applications that have taken place uh, for petroleum industries offshore South Africa. And I'd like just to uh, provide a little bit more information about the assessment process when it comes to the fishing, fishing industries and identifying and um, uh, identifying impacts and rating these, the significance of these impacts on the fishing industry. So thank you for um, the invitation from PASA. Um, So, uh, f firstly, uh, just to put into context, there's a number of different, um, we've, heard, we've heard about the seismic surveys from uh, Peter a couple of presentations ago, and the technology that's used. Um, this is, there's a number of different phases uh, during the oil and gas life cycle. So we, we are looking at primarily the exploration phases here, seismic surveys, for instance, are done during exploratory phase of, of the process and also um, drilling of appraisal wells. Finally, after that uh, comes production and until the end of the particular life, uh, uh, the, the, until the, um, the de decommissioning phase at the end of the, of the um, viable lifespan of the, of the resource. So in terms of the EIA regulations, uh, proposed projects require environmental authorization. It can uh, trigger listed activities. Ultimately, um, an environmental and social impact assessment uh, is done in these instances. And um, part of this ESIA process is the undertaking of uh, specialist studies 
for different affected users of the marine environment, of which the fishing industry is one. Ultimately, the EIA has to answer uh, four basic questions, which is, firstly, what, what is the impact of the proposed activity on the fishing industry? And the, what is the magnitude of this impact? Uh, magnitude of an impact is generally reflected by a number of uh, factors, including the intensity of the impact and the extent uh, of the impact, as well as the duration. What is the importance of the impact on the fishing industry? And this is reflected in the assessment in terms of the significance rating of the impact. Where sensitivity also refers to the vulnerability of a particular sector to a project-induced change. And once this has been assessed, we also rate what possibilities exist within the scope of the proposed activity to reduce these impacts or the significance of these impacts on the fish fisheries. So it's the specialist's duty to make specific recommendations on what possible mitigation measures are appropriate. For instance, uh, I think uh, Dr. Kirtman was mentioning timing of a survey to avoid peak spawning areas or peak spawning seasons, as well as possible um, redesigning of survey areas to not overlap important fishing grounds of, of particular sectors. So the fundamental, um, fundamental, well, this is a list of what is covered in the uh, fish, fisheries assessments. And primarily we're looking at a description of all the commercial and small scale sectors. We give um, a historical, uh, so historical background to each of the sectors as well as seasonality of their catch and effort. Uh, we look at um, the gear technology that's used as well as the areas in which they operate. It's very important to undertake um, rigorous mapping of the different sectors. Uh, I've listed here a number of, of the different commercial sectors on, in the table. Uh, the stocks, the fish species on which they, um, which they target the areas in which they operate, and what we would end up doing is superimposing the impacted areas or the uh, affected areas on, e on the spatial distribution of each of the fishing activities. These impacted areas, uh, for instance, depending on the type of uh, activity that's occurring, uh, may range from for on the, they may range from the impact of exclusion around a seismic survey vessel uh, to the impact of area, impacted area uh, of, the different of the noise generated during a seismic survey or during exploratory drilling, uh, the spread of noise into, the, into fishing grounds, whether this noise um, reaches any significant fishing areas or particularly sensitive spawning areas what are the risks of um, altering, altering spawning aggregate, aggregations on which fisheries depend. So I'm going to have to uh, call this roughly the end of my presentation as I've run out of time. But it's just really the take home message is um, what is needed is a, is, a, is a very thorough interrogation of the, of the various fishing sectors that operate around our coastline. Uh, we do know the sensitivities and the um, vulnerabilities of each of these sectors with regards to the proposed types of exploration activity uh, occurring in the petroleum industry in our South African waters. And um, I will have to end my presentation here, I think. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Sarah. Talking the impact of seismic surveys and other upstream oil and gas activities on marine life. Perhaps I should have engaged it a little bit more. The conversation before we went live 
at least for this session, was how they were going to break the time up. It was confirmed, 10 minutes each. I did confirm to Sarah that 10 minutes will then be 10 minutes. She confirmed that that was okay. The reason why that is important, I don't want to be misunderstood or somehow interpreted as having muted one voice, profiling the other, or vice versa. That all said, there will certainly be time in the Q&A session to address what shortcomings perhaps there may have been in offering perspectives on both sides, if you will, of the spectrum in relation to just this very critical topic. I absolutely do not, and perhaps I should underline that, I do not want this to be profiled in a manner as opposition or proposition for one at the expense of the other. I beg your indulgence. The integrity of the day's proceedings are pegged on time and how it is used. And I would certainly please call on, at a virtual level even, Dr. Mark Meekin and Dr. Miles Parsons, research scientists at the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, to the extent that their case study will be jointly presented, they are conscious of the time. How they distribute it among themselves, of course, is up to them. I am bound by the protocols and, pro and, and, and practice we have established today to honor the time. The conversation now is case study, the effect of marine seismic surveys on the movement abundance and community structure of demersal fish assemblages on the northwest shelf of Australia. I understand that at a virtual level, Mark Meekin is on together with Dr. Miles Parsons. Can I get confirmation from the technical team that they are on? Mark, Miles, gentlemen, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Here we can. Can you hear us? I can hear, I can hear you, now, you now, and I can and see I you can now. See gentlemen, you now. Welcome. gentlemen, welcome. We've, we've got some unfinished business this weekend between ourselves happening in Adelaide. Story for another day. <laughs> Let's deal with this for now. Right. Uh, I'll share the screen. Thank you very much for having us, by the way. Well, th yes, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having us, and uh, our condolences to, to Pedro and his family for his loss. Um, our thanks also to Peter and uh, the previous speakers for their um, introductions into the, uh, the questions and uh, techniques that we're going to be discussing here. What we are going to be talking about is a large research program that uh, we recently completed on the northwest uh, uh, shoals of Western Australia, an area that is a, an important oil and gas uh, region for, for Australia. Now, that area, um, we were tasked to look at the effect of marine seismic surveys on the movement, abundance and uh, distribution of demersal fishes. Before I go into that, you see a little map here of the northwest of Western Australia. I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the uh, sea country and land that we were working on and pay our respects to the Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging. And this screen you see, this is a very large project. It was about $12 million worth. It had a large number of contributors and, uh, and funders. And although Miles and myself are here presenting this information, it was really a massive team of people, some of them listed there below, that actually contributed to this work. So before we go on, just a little bit perhaps about AIMS. AIMS is an acronym for the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And our work is basically tropical. It ranges from Ningaloo in the west of, the, of, of Australia across the top end of the Great Barrier Reef. And we do marine research that aims to improve ocean health and protect coral reefs from climate change. And the overall thrust of our, our institute, the research there, is to create economic, social and environmental benefits for all Australians. And hopefully some of our work uh, resonates internationally as well. Now, today's presentation is not new data. It's actually been published in a couple of journals, um, most recently in the journal uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the United US, 
Um, and you see the cover of that journal there. Fortunately, the, the, the work was form, uh, featured on the cover. And in another article in the Journal of Marine Science and Engineering that details some of the, uh, the measurements of the uh, commercial seismic survey array and implications for environmental monitoring. Now, Miles and I are going to tick tack in this um, in this presentation. Miles is the acoustician, the scientist involved for the acoustics, and I'm an ecologist. So I'll present the ecological results. Miles will present the results of the acoustics. First off, a little bit of background. Um, assessing, fortunately, Peter actually uh, managed to give a very good introduction into what a seismic survey is, what it does, and why we do them. As I mentioned before, um, the northwest of Western Australia, this area of the shelf up here, has an awful lot of oil and gas reserves. And these green lines you can see here, the green hatch lines, show where seismic surveys have occurred in the uh, in that area. So this was our this was our area of the um, of the study uh, that we were looking at. Well. There's a lot of um, issues about, you know, whether or not seismic surveys affect demersal fish communities. And so we got together um, with industry and with commercial fishers and with management agencies, and we asked the fishermen and the management agencies, what were the questions that they wanted to know about real world seismic surveys and their effect on fish assemblages? And the questions that the, the, the fishermen told us that they wanted to know were, firstly, if fish moved away from seismic surveys, how far they moved and for how long, and at what distance from the seismic survey were they affected? Did it affect all fish or just some members of the community? And was there any impact that was species specific or in some way related to the size of an individual? Juveniles might have been affected, say, more than adults. And the importance of those questions was because if we did find an effect, we'd be able to say, well, what's the safe distance for seismic operations and, and basically roll our results into management um, recommendations for the industry. So the species that we're looking at or the, the target species on this tropical area of shelf is actually very diverse. The fisheries here are, my, are trap and trawl fisheries, and they catch, because it's the tropics, of course, they catch a very diverse array of species. You can see some of them up here. Um, we are looking at, uh, we had also, in, in addition to this whole sampling of the whole assemblage, we also had a focal species, and that was Red Emperor, Lugana Cebu. It's a commercially and recreationally important species right across tropical Australia. It's abundance. It's resilient to capture and from depth and tagging, and it's sight attached. So it also uses sound as a cue for life function. So it's a very good species if you want to study it. It's, a, it's an excellent study species. So we did some focal work on that species, but we're also interested in a demersal assemblage as a whole. Where to study it? Well, here's where we are in Australia. This is the Northwest Shelf here. And that those pink dots there show the distribution of the study, one of the, the focal study species, Red Emperor. They're right across the top, the tropics of, North, of Northern Australia. Now, we wanted, we wanted to use this area called Area 3. The red box there shows an area that's been close to commercial fishing for the last 20 years. It's a place where we know our target species abundant. There's been very, although there's been a lot of seismic surveys on the Northwest Shelf, there's been very little seismic activity in this red box area that close to fish, the Area 3 that's close to fishing over the last 10 years. There are, of course, some shipping fairways that run through the area, but we were careful to try and avoid our sampling, um, uh, sampling within those. Of course, ships make noise. So, how do we study um, the, the fish, the effect of seismic in fish communities? Well, we wanted to use a thing called a BRUV, which is a, called a baited remote underwater video system to look at the potential impacts of seismic activity on fish abundance and structure. There's a good reason for using that. Bruvs sample remotely. You essentially have a bag of, of bait that's set down with a paired camera system, and it, can, it images the fish that are attracted to those baits. So the alternative way of sampling those fishes might be to catch them, but then you're actually removing your study species from your study area. With bruvs, we have a permanent record and video, and we don't have to actually affect the fish.
Um, and the other approach was to monitor tagged fish and to infer the impacts of uh, seismic activity on their movement patterns and on behavior. So we'll get into both of these programs. Okay, now in the Sully Stamping Design, I'm gonna hand over to Miles and he'll explain how we did this. Thanks very much, Mark. So there are a lot of elements within this that Peter has very nicely described for us. And um, the first of which will be the fact that we were, we were trying to follow a real world design or a, a real world situation. Um, and we had a, a stakeholder workshop um, and a technical workshop to make sure that we were following that, those sort of guidelines. Um, Peter talked about the distance uh, of seismic sail lines and the distance between seismic sail lines. Um, and what we were looking at was having 20 kilometer sail lines um, that were 500 meters apart. And we followed that racetrack style design that Peter mentioned, where a seismic vessel will run along one line, run away, run down another line, and continue in, in circles. Um, and what we did was to have eight active um, sail lines um, where uh, the array, the seismic source was operational, and that's described over here, and eight inactive lines where the seismic vessel was just traveling along. Um, and we, we looked at the uh, experiment in two different ways. One was what we call a before after control impact design, a backy design. Um, that means that we look at an area that has high exposure um, and we looked at an area that was essentially a vessel control and we had another area that was a, a control zone. Now we sampled all of these areas three times before we conducted our, our survey. So that was three times before from five months out. And then after we ran the survey, we conducted um, our sampling another two times over a three month period. The other method that we were looking at was what we call dose response. So as Mark mentioned, this was to decide whether or not there is a, a safe distance or how far away the fish might move. Um, so we had different zones where the fish would be exposed to high levels of sound, medium levels of sound, low levels of sound. And then at the control, there were, would be essentially no level, no sound from the seismic survey. Um, and then we had our vessel control as well. And collectively, they create an, an essentially what we call a dose response. If you follow the, the red dot here, I hope you can see the red dot, um, that drops from the high area, um, high exposure area where they receive a lot of sound um, down through medium low um, to areas where there are, uh, uh, is no sound coming from the survey. But to do that, we actually had some constraints as well. As Mark showed you, we were working within that box, which is about 2,700 square kilometres. And within that, we needed to make sure that we had similar habitat and we had a similar fish assemblage, which we could confirm by using those video systems. So we need to make sure that across our whole survey area, we're dealing with the same situation. And as Peter also mentioned earlier, we have this seismic signal, the sound that, that propagates, it travels through the water. Um, and to ensure that we were meeting some of those conditions, we knew that we had to have the high exposure area, a certain distance from the control, a certain distance from the vessel control. Um, but we were also constrained by the amount of time that we were able to, to, to have the seismic survey vessel for. We did this survey over five days and we ran eight lines, um, eight seismic sail lines within that five days. But to do that, we had to be able to drive the vessel at a certain speed. I think Peter mentioned four and a half knots, which is exactly what we used. Um, and so we're constrained. We had to have certain distances so that we could actually complete the survey. We also had to have um, a, a design that meant we were staying within that commercial um, fishing area or commercially managed fishing, fishing area. So all of this had to be within that area three zone. That's that box there. So initially we went out and we mapped the whole area with what they call a multi-beam sonar. That allowed us to look at all of the habitat on the seafloor, um, and it meant that we could actually map out areas of um, high um, or, or good habitat and areas of low habitat. Um, it, it's not as if the fish are completely evenly distributed over the whole area, as, as the fishermen will know. And what we found is that we could position some of our sampling sites and sampling zones within area three and pick up some good habitat for the fish. So we could design our racetrack 
to go around this area and have a high exposure area, a vessel control and the control area. So we managed to meet everything that we needed to in our requirements. We had our active sail lines and our inactive sail lines that were 36 kilometers apart, which is exactly what we needed. When it comes to the methods, we were, uh, uh, as everyone's been talking about, um, these, these sounds that might well impact the behavior and the, um, the, the health of the fish, we needed to confirm that we were getting the right levels. Now, the seismic signal itself has really three components. One is pressure, one is particle motion, and one is ground motion. And what's important for fish is that they can sense pressure, but they can, some can sense pressure, but they can all sense particle motion. So we had a number of different sensors that we deployed around the area throughout the entire survey period to be able to confirm that we had the correct signals that we were looking for. Um, and this, this, this slide just shows you that we had to move those um, those sensors all around the, the whole site, looking for pressure, looking for particle motion, looking for ground motion to confirm that we validated all of the signals that were being emitted by the seismic survey. Um, and we did that regularly um, throughout the, the survey itself. So I'm going to hand back to Mark because he, he is quite happy to talk about the, the bruvs and the fish. So here we can see the um, bruvs in action. Um, basically, we've got a little bit of video of what you would see if you put a bruv down on a seabed there. Notice a fairly sparse habitat. Bruvs are great because they collect data on relative abundance, size and behavior of the fish. You can look at things like range to the camera, time to first feed, probability of feeding or not feeding. And for each, because they're a stereo camera system, we can accurately measure uh, with a great deal of precision the actual sizes of the fish. So you can gather an, an enormous amount of information from the video without actually harming the fish involved. Um, and we analyze those using a, a commercially available software. Now, for our MBAC and dose response designs, for those statisticians amongst you, um, this is basically a setup how our, uh, how our experiment was structured and replicated. And we use an e-power package to look at the power of the analysis for our MBACI design. And we analyze them using Bayesian generalized linear mixed models, a type of uh, statistical analysis. And we compared two models um, before basically and after, um, before and after control versus impact. And to do that, um, we basically looked at uh, a posterior distribution, and you'll see a few of these plots because I'm going to go through them now. Essentially, what, it, what these plots will show is that if there's a shift of the distribution towards the right here, there's an increase in abundance or an increase in feeding time or some sort of increase relative in the high exposure area relative to the controls. And similarly, if they move to the left, then there's a decrease in abundance or, or um, in some sort of behavior in the high exposure area relative to the control. Now, our focal species and groups, these are the most, most abundant species that we found down there, some pictures of them all, basically Luke Janids, some Leith Rinids, and uh, groupers, snappers. Uh, sorry, um, uh, snappers, and snappers and cods, thank you. They're all demersal species, they're all important target species of the commercial fisheries out there, and they're those three key families. So um, our, for our telemetry, which is our tagging study, we focused on Luke um Red Emperor. And for those, we put out some uh, tags inside the fish. We tagged them internally, and we put out two arrays of receivers out in our um, high exposure. And these are the vessel lines you see here put out uh, arrays of receiver there, and in our vessel control uh, area, we put out another array. So if a tagged fish swam past, we tagged uh, in through our array, we could basically record its presence. Um, and here's basically how we went. did that. We, tra we trapped the fish uh, just as you would in a normal fishery, brought them to the surface, anesthetized them, opened up a small incision in their gut, inserted the tag. We inserted tags in 387 fish, and from those tagged fish, we received 4 million odd detections. Um, we also did some range testing and, and had sentinel tags down there. We basically, what they showed was that a tagged fish swam within about 480 meters of a receiver, and you see a receiver here, 
we'd basically pick it up, we'd hear it. And so there's an array um, with Sentinel tags in it. And we used uh, the Sentinel tags, they recorded ambient noise. And that's important because we had to scale the likelihood of hearing our fish depending on how much ambient noise was around. Now, not every tagged fish we put down survived the experience, as perhaps you might expect. And so uh, quite a few of them were actually eaten by larger predators. So when that happened, um, we'd get uh, detections on the arrays that look like this. Um, rather than our tagged fish, which we might expect there's their site attached and fairly sedentary, we might expect to see them on two or three receivers. Instead, we see these detections over a whole range of receivers, and these receivers are coloured in different colours here. And then, once the tag was basically expelled by the predator, it would sit on the seafloor and would just get it at one receiver. So when the tags were eaten by something else, a larger predator, generally sharks, we would actually know when that happened based on the pattern of hits on our receivers, and we could remove those data from the data sets. We didn't have to analyze them. Now, back to some results. We're starting with some results now with um, seismic signal levels. Okay, so the reason behind the next few slides is just to show you that what we actually produced was um, essentially similar to a real world commercial seismic survey and that the exposure levels that were experienced by the fish were similar to those that would be experienced if a commercial survey was operated in the area. So there's a, a couple of graphs here and the, the way to look at it is uh, along here we have the vessel approaching and passing a recorder um, and Peter mentioned uh, earlier that there were steps um, to ramp up um, what we call it, um, the, the signal to warn animals that the, the, the seismic survey is coming. And what you can see here are these little steps as a signal is ramped up as the vessel is moving um, and the signal increases as you get closer and closer to what we call the closest point of approach and then decreases as they go away. Um, and what we actually have in this graph here, and I'm going to show a, a few of these very quickly, is that we had quite a uniform um, decline in the signal as you move away. Um, I think one of the talks earlier talk, uh, discussed the fact that you can have some signals that um, increase uh, as you go past a certain habitat or as you go past a certain area. Um, the reason for that um, is that some of the seabed structure changes how the, the signal propagates forward. So we actually needed this uniform signal to be able to map out all of the exposure levels around our survey. And just to show you what it looked like on every single day, we had some very uniform received levels with each of our survey lines. And that was good for us to be able to reliably, reliably predict the signals that we would be received by the fishers. The other thing that I wanted to point out here is that we can look at the different frequencies that are actually being um, it's emitted by the seismic source um, and how they propagate through the, the water column and how they propagate um, horizontally through the area as well. And the point to note here, someone mentioned earlier that these are, are very low frequency signals. You can see with the red here being the high energy, all of the energy is below 1000 hertz. Most of it is below 100 hertz um, and, and down here at, at naught to 20 hertz. So this is very low frequency that we're looking at. It's the low frequency that propagates far away. Um, and that is actually the, the low frequencies that the fishes would hear essentially. When we were going through all of these surveys, and I mentioned before that we did three surveys before and two surveys after um, the seismic survey. Um, in total, we, we deployed 651 BRUVs across those five trips. Now, out of that 651, there were a few obviously that landed upside down. There were a few that were recording during um, high tidal periods. So there was a lot of sediment in the water that in impeded the analysis, but we still managed to have 629 deployments to use. That included at least 100 per zone, with the exception of the, uh, the low exposure area. So I'll hand back to Mark to show you the results that we went through as well. So uh, community composition, essentially 148 demersal species we saw in the BRUVs. Um, 35 of those are known targets for commercial fishery. And the most abundant was this nemipterid, uh, the rosy broom. So 
how did they change through time? Well, the maximum number of species per deployment was 33. Mean number was 14, but here's our five periods of sampling, three before and two after the seismic survey, which is shown here in blue. The first thing you can see is that species richest, richness in terms of the number of in, uh, species we are seeing per hour and above change very little across any of our any of our sites, across the controls, the vessel controls, or the, the site was, that had high exposure to the seismic survey. And we were confident that we got most of the species that were out there because our species accumulation curves, that's the number of species we were seeing per BRUVS deployments, plateaued at around uh, 100 BRUVS deployments. And you remember that we got at least 100 BRUVS deployments in each one of our high exposure vessel controller control zones. OK, what about in, in terms of relative abundance? Well, exactly the same pattern. We had our five, um, five periods of survey, three before, two after, and our blue line shows our seismic survey. Um, mean abundance was about 19 individuals per hour. No consistent patterns in terms of changes in abundance prior to or after the, um, the seismic survey. And that include all target species or in, even all demersal species. So again, no consistent patterns. And this is probably one of the most important um, analyses for the, the project. You remember I talked before about how, how to interpret these graphs. If these distributions lie right over the top of the zero line here, it means there's no change uh, in terms, in this case, abundance. If they're shifted uh, after the seismic survey, if they're shifted to the right, then things might be more abundant after the seismic survey. If they're shifted to the left, then they're less abundant. And what we've done here is we've broken it up to all demersal species or target species for the commercial fishery, then down to some very abundant species, some target families, and some very valuable species for the fishery. Now, the key take home message here is in our broad surveys, there was no evidence of a decline in abundance of any of these groups after the seismic survey. Um, if anything, there was evidence of a slight increase of all demersal and target species, but that was really driven by this very abundant species here. So if anything, some fishes were slightly more abundant after our, after our seismic survey. Okay, well, what about lengths then? So here we've got plots of size frequency distributions of the fish that we were seeing in, in the brubs. Remember, we measured them, we were able to measure them because we were using stereo grubs. And the green shows the distribution before the seismic survey. The red shows the distribution of these species after the seismic survey. What you see first off is that the length distributions, the fish we were measuring were predominantly adults. So fish that would be targeted by any fishery. And we had very similar size classes in those fish in those different species to other studies that have looked in the area before. So we're not doing something wildly different from others from other um, surveys. And what we found, of course, is that the green lines, um, the the pre distributions, and the red lines, the post distributions, pretty much overlie each other. So what that's saying was that sorry. So what that's saying is that there's very little difference in size distribution of any of these species before or after this, the seismic survey. Right, if we look at that um, as size distribution structure as a Mbaki approach and we have, and we look at this uh, again against zero, essentially we have 3,200 uh, length measurements from different fish. Um, and we can look at length differences down to centimeters. This is very accurate uh, data. What we effectively find is that there's a tiny increase in uh, length of animals and size of animals after the seismic survey, but it's it's really it's not significant. There are no no very little statistical support for any change in uh, in abundance in size of these uh, animals. Well, what about time at first feeding? So the nice thing about BRUVs is that you also get a lot of behavioral information out of the out of the video. So what we looked at here was the time taken from when the BRUV first landed on the bottom 
the time taken for some species to feed. Um, again, no strong evidence of a change. If anything, a slight decrease in the, in the time um, for first feeding after the seismic survey for some species. And, and very little statistical support for any change whatsoever. Um, a little bit of statistical support for a couple of species. Uh, again, uh, they weren't some of the most abundant species in our, in our survey. Distance to bruvs. Well, this is the distance that a fish was likely to approach the bait bag. And that could be important in, say, a trap fishery where it might be that after a seismic survey, a fish might be more reluctant to enter or come towards a trap. Did we find any evidence for that? Um, we found a slight reduction, if anything, a fish were more likely to come towards the bruv after the seismic survey. And there was really, that, that was a trend. It, there wasn't a lot of statistical support for that change of behaviour. Um, what about the actual feeding? You know, what, what happened to their likelihood to feed? Well, the problem here is that of that big array of 148 species that come towards the bruv, many of them simply look at the bait bag but never actually feed on it. Others feed all the time. Um, so, so looking at a species that change in feeding of a species that never feeds or a change in a species that feeds all the time is actually pretty useless. So we had four species though that had moderate feeding rates. And when we looked at these, again, very little evidence that uh, these things were changing their, their likelihood of feeding uh, th through the after the seismic survey had passed. OK, um, now we're going to move to one of the, the focal study species, the red emperor, and our tagging study when we put little uh, acoustic tags that were picked up by acoustic recorders. Um, Effectively, 57% of the tags were direct detected by a ray, so we got a good detection rate. But about 43% uh, of the animals at, at the high exposure zone and about 22% were actually uh, eaten by sharks and the like or other big predatory fishes prior to the survey, the seismic survey occurring. So that reduced our sample size. For up, down to about 43 individuals in the high exposure area and 23 in the vessel control area. That still gave us quite a lot of detections. Um, and here's what those detections look like. Now, each of these is a, um, a coded tag, and each one of these is an individual fish, of course. So here we are inside the high exposure array and the blue, and this is time along the bottom. We monitored these fish for about six months. And here's where the seismic survey occurred. And what you can see is that each one of those individuals tended to hang around and didn't really disappear after the seismic survey had occurred. We did see some three individuals that were less abundant after the seismic survey, um, but there's no evidence at all of long-term displacement for those, uh, for those fishes. Now, in the vessel control rate, we saw exactly the same thing. We had fewer individuals, each one of these is a tagged fish, but some of those also disappeared during, uh, after the, um, the seismic survey. So in, in that case, we can clearly say there's very little effect on the movement patterns uh, of, or residency of these fish. So no evidence of long-term displacement. So what's the summary then? Bruvs, we had no shifts in fish community structure seen in the bruvs due to the seismic uh, survey, no decline in relative abundance, no major changes in size distribution of fish, no consistent shifts in feeding behavior that might reflect their catchability for fishermen, and no evidence in the displacement of our study species, the red emperor, using that acoustic telemetry approach. Um, no evidence of shifts in spatial or temporal space use. OK, what does that all mean? Well, there's obviously some, uh, some caveats around our sample and around our work. We're not looking, we're looking at demersal site attached species, fish that don't move very far anyway. Mobile fishes, things such as maybe mackerel, or, um, other pelagic species, they weren't sampled and we couldn't sample them using this sort of approach. That would have taken a completely different sampling setup and simply wasn't one, even though we had $12 million that our budget could stretch to. 
We're talking about adult fishes. Remember, the Brovs really sampled adult fish. The, the effects of seismic surveys on, say, juveniles or on spawning stages of fish is really unknown. Cumulative impacts. Well, we only subjected the fish to about eight days of sampling. So fish out in the uh, in the wider area of the Northwest Shelf may get, uh, well, cer almost certainly get mul subjected to multiple uh, surveys, seismic surveys. And we had to look in shallow water because we wanted those species to be able to tag. And of course, if you go into deep water, there's no light. So our, uh, our video systems wouldn't have worked. So we're basically working in shallow water species at around 50 to 70 metres depth. Of course, we have absolutely no, the, the study doesn't tell us anything about plankton, which is, uh, which is of course, uh, a, a different study again. Okay, I think what our study does show, though, is that a collaborative and a well-resourced study um, and a, coll a collaboration between fishermen, the management agencies and the industry itself offers a really good long-term uh, return on investment but because, at least in the Northwest Shelf, we've provided some definitive answers to some of the key questions that the fishermen wanted to know and, and really were creating uncertainty for stakeholders. Okay, thanks very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, that was quite the science lesson, all right. And if what I am drawing from the room is anything to go by, um, we still there's clearly a lot of room for engaging the subject. It was technical, and I suppose appropriately technical because that's the reality of what we are dealing. I do, though, probably wish to just give you an opportunity, without referencing to the slides, perhaps in prose, um, Mark. Miles, just essentially in the South African context, we are of course in the nascent developments of the oil and gas exploration space. It is a charged environment and there would ne necessarily be teething problems associated with this. I'm sure you have been following the developments of the colloquium hitherto. You would have heard some of, let me call them tensions, between land-related concerns. There are, of course, environmental concerns which are inherent, and that is what you are dealing with. But, of course, there's technology that is used and deployed elsewhere to try and allay such fears. And I am just wondering, because tried as I might, there were times, um, if I may, where perhaps I was a little bit lost. I don't imagine I'm isolated in that. And if I can recall a request, I beg your pardon, for you, perhaps on the other side of some of the questions that we're going to take now, especially when you have contemplated the questions that have come through and the responses, just to sort of feel the South African context a little bit more so that you can answer this, answer this fundamental, and, fundamental simple and simple question. For South, for Africa, South Africa, with her challenges, with her challenges what then, what can, you then say can you say to environmentalists, to environmentalists in, particular, in particular, as well as, as, well as small, small fishing, fishing communities? communities Around small, Around fishing, small towns fishing towns who, who use, use fishing, as, fishing a as a primary economic, economic activity, activity from which from all, which of, all their of their other econo economic, economic, activity economic activity is predicated, is predicated or upon which all other economic, all other economic activity, is predicated. activity is predicated. What can you what say can in you language say that, in that language is easily accessible, easily accessible to them? To them about, about seismology, seismology as, the as the discipline, as the practice, practice, as the practice technology, the technology that's, deployed that's deployed in relation, in relation to, their to their source of life. I would please, I would request, please that request that either of you, either take, of that you take that mark that and miles. There are a couple, are of, a questions couple of questions for Peter that have Peter come through during the course of the presentation. So Peter, so Peter, please, please be alert be and available, alert and available to, to answer a question from Putela. Being. Being. How comparable, How comparable is psychological, is psychological effect, of effect of sound waves on whales, on whales versus krill or, or plankton regarding marine regarding life marine with life no skeletal no structure, like, structure jellyfish. like jellyfish? What is the what impact, is the of, impact this of this energy on their circulatory, on their circulatory systems? systems? Still for Still you, for you Randall, Bentley Randall Bentley asks, asks how many of How the many thousands of, the thousands of, poor of poor fishes, fishes that will be that hungrier, will be hungrier due, to due to the steam rolling of the greedy, of the greedy agenda, agenda by the already, by rich, already rich will be, will employed, be employed or compensated? Or compensated. Chief, Chief, 
Kaisen, Mart, and I hope I got that right. If I got it wrong, I beg your pardon. Did I get it right? Listen to that man. I got it right. I got it right. And of course, there's an exclamation mark and a K. That means that means Chief Kaisen, Mart, to Dr. Stephen. How can you justify these seismic surveys if the impacts are so detrimental and distortive on marine life? Seismic air guns are firing blasts that are repeated every 10 seconds, 24 hours a day for weeks at a time. And that sound can travel tens of thousands of square kilometers, disturbing communication, navigation, and eating habits of marine wildlife that is essential for their survival. For Sarah, for Sarah final, question. final question. Why is Why it, is it that, Cap that Marine, Cap that's Marine, Capricorn that's Marine, Marine organization, organization you came to represent has to date rated the impact of, of seismic surveys, of surveys on small-scale small fisheries, fisheries as negligible, as negligible but yet but they yet have not they considered, have not the, considered the, impact the impact of species that the SSF, the SSF targets, targets that move that between, between, the, between near the near and, and the, offshore. the offshore. If I may if propose I may this, propose Peter, this. Please, Peter reply please reply first. first. And then I'm going to go to Stephen, and then to and Sarah, then to Sarah, and then if you, then like, if you like, in layman's terms, terms the Australian, Australian colleagues, Mark, Mark and Miles, and Miles will, respond will respond to my initial to my question, question contemplating, contemplating perhaps, perhaps what are some, what some of the salient, salient issues, issues coming issues through, coming from, through the from, from the floor. Peter, are you Peter, there? Are you there? I am here, and I yes, I yes, can so see please, you and hear you. So um, yes, I will try to to, uh, to to go into some of those questions. First of all, I think when it comes to the impact on on certain species, I think there are other experts here in the room. Uh, Mark Miles, you can uh, probably take take some of those specific questions. Um, but when it comes to uh, the impact, obviously on the on the fishing communities, and then I've seen a few other other questions here. I, I, the, 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 uh, the, the challenge or the challenge and the biggest thing we have to do here is, is to find an, uh, a mechani mechanism to coexist. I think, first of all, I think the most important aspect here is, is communication and, and understanding um, each other's situations and being able to take that into account when planning these type of activities on both on both sides, I guess. I think we also need to take into account what I've, I think I've said earlier is that these these surveys are not uh, they're, they're not 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 a year. It, it, it is it, it, it is sporadic in, in such a way. Uh, yes, there is an, uh, the, 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 there are activities ongoing and sometimes and, and, and we have to make sure from a com uh, communication point of view, these things are, uh, are, are well tackled. So I think that to me, that is the most most important uh, aspect here that we understand uh, what uh, what both parties try to achieve and and try to find a, a, a way to to coexist. And and I think that can be done, and it's proven to be done in 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 other parts of the world. So much, Peter. Stephen, do you want to come through? Thanks. I, I try to capture the question. I don't know if I captured it all. Um, I, I don't think it's for me to justify that 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 kind of work. Um, I, I think it emphasises the need for um, for clear research, cutting edge research, such as our Australian colleagues have produced for us so well. Um, I think we also need to keep some perspective. Um, I, I went I had to go through my slides quite quickly. What I would have emphasised if I had a bit more time was um, just. Just keep the context of the um, other sources of anthropogenic noise in the marine environment. Um, seismic is one of them. Yes, it's a very sound, intense sound. Yes, it can travel very far. But, um, but um, in, the in the there's the many, there's many other sources of marine sound, sound as well, and shipping, and shipping is, by is by far the, uh, the, uh, the, the, greatest, the greatest source of, of, noise, of noise pollution in the ocean in terms of both the spatial and the temporal scales of shipping. It's of far greater magnitude than, for example, seismic. I think we just need to keep that sort of context there as well. Thank you. Uh, the question, uh, the question I, was I was asked to, to respond to was uh, regarding the small-scale small fisheries and um, why the, the, the impact, impact assessment, assessment came, came up with a, came up negligible, with a negligible 
rating or significant negligible significance rating on the small scale fisheries, even though the species on which the sector depends moves from the neutral environment to the offshore environment and vice versa. So this question is linked to the impact of the sound generated by the seismic survey technique. And, and what we do what know, we do is, know that is that sound spreads, sound spreads as it, as it, uh, as it uh, travels, uh, travels um, it, attenuates, um, it attenuates, so the sound, so the sound levels decrease the further away, the further from, away the from the seismic source. source. Uh, and uh, and what, is what is generally done during the uh, specialist, specialist assessment studies, studies is that is a, a um, noise modeling noise assessment, assessment uh, is commissioned, uh, is commissioned and, and this looks particularly, particularly at, at the, distant, the threshold distances from the sound from the source, source from, the survey from the survey area that sound would travel. Uh, uh, and the distance, the distance from source, from source at, at, which get at which you get different types, different of, types of impacts on impacts fish. On fish. So, so what is found is that, is that in the immediate in the vicinity, vicinity of the seismic, of the seismic source, source is where you have the most intense impact. For instance, you can have mortality of fish and temporary threshold shifts in the hearing uh, uh, at distances of meters from the source, but that at distances of hundreds of meters to kilometers, you you could get behavioral disturbance. So it's a lesser effect, not um, not uh, mortality or injury, but you can have an opportunity for fish uh, to alter their normal behavioral response. So for instance, change in distributions could have um, related catch effects uh, associated with those disturbance effects. But uh, what, I, what I wanted to say was that, you know, small-scale fisheries, they, they do target a number of lionfish species that do, at different life stages, have an onshore, uh, offshore uh, component. Um, and, you know, there are other species that are targeted by other commercial fisheries that are also taken into account in the assessment uh, with offshore, in, inshore comp um, life stages. And really it comes down to the rating of the significance as being negligible is in response to the overall extent of the impact, uh, the timing of the impact, so if it's short term or long term, um, and also the intensity of the impact and the sensitivity of the, of the different sectors. Yes, I do, I do stand by that uh, rating that has come up for previous um, survey applications of negl negligible significance, and it just means it's, it's not considered to have uh, a significant impact in those particular cases. But each case is um, assessed on a case-by-case, project-by-project basis. Thanks. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you so much for your response. Mark Miles. I take it you have heard everything and will now please kindly, as our dear friends in Australia respond to my initial invitation and perhaps to sum up some of the remarks that have been offered in response to some of the questions that you have heard. The arguments we're hearing today in front of us with, with everybody there gathered are exactly the same arguments that we have had for 30 years in Australia. And it's those arguments and a, will, and a willingness for all parties to get together to actually move forward rather than just repeat the same arguments again is the genesis, it's the basis of this the experiment on Northwest Shelf. We got everyone in the room. We listened to the fishermen. We listened to the managers. We listen to the oil and gas industry and we ask them, what do you really want to know? And we came up with a list of questions that was then allowed, um, funding provide, provided by the oil industry and by our own organisation enabled those questions to be finally answered and answered in a definitive way. That is the secret. You know, it's it's really answered those questions for for the Northwest Shelf and for Northern Australia. If if you if you want to lay this ghost to rest, then you really have to be able to uh, have that conversation at the start. Find out what the questions are, 
and really go after them with science. The Australian Institute of Marine Science is an independent government body. We have, in what we say in Australia, is that we've got no dog in the fight. We've got no uh, a priori basis to, to expect any result from a study. We simply produce the best science we possibly can so that everybody involved, all the stakeholders, can make the best decisions about how they move forward. And that's what we've done with the Northwest Shelf to Shore Project. So honestly, it, the acceptance and the uptake of our results in Australia has actually been pretty good. We know their limitations. We've spoken to the limitations. It doesn't mean every species of fish. It may not be the same situation in South Africa, but at least for our context, we have answered the question. We've done it definitively. And that the, the benefits of that will now flow forward you know, for industry and for other stakeholders. That's, that's the direction we've all got to move in. Do you mind if I add something to that? Sure. Well, one of the things to remember is that, that the response, the way that sound propagates can be very site specific. Um, and the responses that you can get from lots of different animals, whether it's fish or, or mammals or invertebrates, it can be species specific and it can be context specific. So as Mark said, what we needed to do was to get the people that fished in our particular area together, look at the species that they had of concern, work out time periods and, and behaviours that would be of concern to them and try and match the experiment to what they were concerned with. Um, and that will be key in terms of moving forward in South Africa for that, is that some of these things can be very specific to the context, as someone mentioned earlier. So it, it, it's something that does require a, a long discussion. It certainly does. Um, you are aiding, aiding that, discussion that discussion to be pointed in its engagement. I'm going to ask this question, and then we will take the second and final round of questions, ladies and gentlemen, now from the audience physically in the room. If now, please, everybody who intends to ask a question could please go. I'd rather know exactly what it is with what I'm dealing than have continuous pop-ups. We are trying to manage time. We are running behind time. I apologize for that. But how can we not have this discussion? Of course, time is a guideline in most instances in colloquia and conferences. It can't, it, it, it can't ever be definitive. One, and if we can try and get different voices, I'm not muting anybody. I'm encouraging different voices to participate. Mark, Miles, in South Africa, our context with the uh, Aboriginal equivalent, if even that is appropriate, the first peoples, the indigenous communities, have a strong claim to natural resources by virtue of land and how settlements have developed over time. What has been the Australian experience to the extent that your research has uncovered in relation to the competing tensions and claims to the natural resources. In this instance, natural resources at sea. We will always in South Africa have that contestation, that debate, in the light of the developments that, by some accounts, suggest that the San and Khoi communities, the original peoples of Southern Africa, are not contemplated nearly enough in the institutional and state capacity building projects of the kind we are now talking about. If you could please share your experiences in relation to Australia and the Aborigine community. That's the question for which you can of course respond on the other side of these questions. I see one, two, three, four. Doc? <laughs> are you standing, Doc? You are standing. They say at a wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you are sitting down, you are not allowed to get up. I don't care what the call is for. If you are sitting down now, you are not standing up. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people standing. We have to absolutely be clear on time. One minute is one minute. Let's go there. One, two. Goeiedag, ek is Carissa Soudens. Ek kom van die Noordkap, Honneklebaai. 
Ik verteenwoordig die El Wantle vrouwengroep van Honneklebaai. Honneklebaai is ook een van die dorpen waar een gedril gaan word. Nou, oor een maand. En ons het nou so klomp goed gehoor, die programdirektuur het gesê, daar is tyd aan verbonde. Maar daar is nou so klomp goed, sommer in ons kiele afgegooi. Dat ons nou nie eens meer weet, hoe om dit te kan verwerk nie. My, my probleem is, dat ons, wat op die grond is, is nou dier mekaar. Uh, seismiek. Wie is seismiek? Wie is Chong, Chonga? Yes, yes, yes. Ik ga in mijn eigen taal praten. En ik zoek een antwoord in mijn eigen taal. Natuurlijk. Ja, onze zo dier mekaar. Hier olie en gas companies verskil en hulle verander van naam tot naam jaar na jaar. En ons raak al dier mekaar. En honneklebaai was nou al baie olie en gas maatskapie consultaties gewees. En nou is ek baie dier mekaar. Ek is alleen van die Noordkap wat hier opgekom het. Vanmorgen het ek hier kans gekrim te praat hier. Want ek wou onze, onze regering uh, of as uh, uh, ambtenare wou ek gevraad. Maar ek wil nou vraag. Aan wie mevrouw is jou vraag? My vraag is aan onze regeringse mense. Onze regeringse mense? Yes. Ek hoop hulle kan vir jou. Ek hoop hulle hoor. hoor. En dan wil ek een vraag aan meneer Maak. Daar in Australië. Maak asjeblief gauw mevrouw, ons het die tijd hier nee. Ek wil, ek skies toch. Asjeblief mevrouw. Ek wil vir meneer Maak vraag. Of hy dink, dit wat hy nou gegeet, is rechtverdig ten oor ons vissers in die Noordkap. Want die meeste drilwerk gaan daar plaas vind. Is dit rechtverdig ten oor ons mense, wat afhankelijk is van die seese species. Aan onze regering wil ek vraag, ons is in klimaatsverandering, maar daar is die daar aan gedink nie. Ons regering moet vir my vandag antwoord Daar word snoek en honnikle bijgevang. Ma'am, I'm going to have to move uh, on to the next speaker. Nee, uh, uh, we program have director. offered time. We unfortunately do not have the time. Wat wil praat? Aangezien die mense nou so baie gepraat het. En, o, en ons kon dit nie stil maak. Dit is onbeskof. It is unfortunate that we have to engage as we do. Unfortunately, to an extent, I'm, an, I'm a creature of the program, contemplating the many interests there are in this room. All I ask is, say what you want in the language of preference, please, within the allotted time. Sure, I asked for a minute and I gave indulgence in that regard, and I'm just simply at the mercy of us, dear friends, to work with each other on that. Next question, please. Hi, Chase. First of all, wil ek eers die traditional layers, kooi en san layers wat die binnen is, wil ek sê, my greetings aan amelie layers, en dan wil ek aan ons TDG, Sue Mulleton, greetings to be here, and all the sports officers. I, ek het hier question nie, ek is hier om te kom sê, wat die traditional lijn visse manne sê, van die weskaap. Ek represent visse manne, wat traditional lijn visse manne is uit die Noordkaap uit, soos my moeder gesê het, sy ken wie ek is, ek is een traditionele lijn vir sy man, ons wil niks hoor, van, van servies, in ons ook seewater, ons wil niks hee, van olie en gas, binnen in ons seewater, genoeg is genoeg, laat government besluit, dat er nie met 
doe voor ons als die indigenous mensen van Zuid-Afrika. Onze livelihood wordt gedestrooid die olie en gas. En dingen wordt gedaan bij een big doos. Ik is ook een van die applicants of the first case of survey. Wat is Australia? I'm one of the applicants in that case. And the court did interdict the survey. Why are they still pushing for survey in our waters? Stop destroying our livelihoods as indigenous people. We say no in South Africa for oil and gas. Because it's our livelihoods you busy destroying. Hey gang guns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We move to the back. Uh, thank you for our platform and the opportunity to be here and present uh, my fishing village, a dominant Afrikaans fishing village, Dwarangbai. Uh, my name is Fabian Mohamed. I'm an active small-scale fisher, also a scupper. Um, I actually have a concern. Um, we was having previously problems with uh, the uh, scientific reports and surveys. Uh, they said our resources is depleted, and then the DAF, DFE, reduced our TC dramatically. And afterwards, more than 20 tons of lobster came out in, in Irland's Bay. How? Oh, till today, they couldn't give us an explanation. They didn't tell us what happened. So I'm actually concerned myself. How liable is these scientific reports? Is our fishers on, 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 on the ground level, are they involved when they're doing their service in our coastal coasters? At our seas, are we involved? So how liable are they actually? They, they're talking about the resources is depleted. They're talking about what they found. And we believe it. And then Mother Nature, Mother Nature shows them the opposite. So they still own us an explanation. Do we think of, we, do we as fishers think we can trust that reports, the scientific report, if we are not ourselves involved? Yeah, sure. Thank you very Good much. Point. Thank you very much. Next question, comment, please. I think I might be saying similar to what the sister before me has just said. Um, uh, doctors Mark and Miles from Australia, thank you very much for that presentation. I don't know if you think that that is conclusive and that we as the House should view that as completely con conclusive and whether it takes into account South African waters versus Australian waters. I do want to point out that your presentation handled the issue of dimersal fish. I don't know if anybody in the house knows what's a, what's a di dimersal fish, uh, as opposed to the pelagic fish, fish. And that opens up a discussion. Why do you go and concentrate on the effect on dimersal fish and you ignore completely pelagic fish and other species that are in those waters? Is your information one-sided or is it really... Um, Fair. Um, I also hear that you mentioned the blasts that affect the fish at 100 hertz, at 200 hertz, at 1,000 hertz. All I can tell you is that it will hurt. It hurts. It hurts the fish. It hurts other uh, the species. As mentioned, noise pollution, sound pollution, it's going to hurt those fish and make them run away. And then once your cameras are on again, it'll come back, you know. It's, it's, it's going to affect the fish, as you have already uh, said. So I have a solution. I have a, a point, um, a suggestion. The, the fisher people from the communities like what was mentioned in Out Bay and um, Hunterclip Bay and so forth, why don't you listen to what the sister just said? That if you're going to take 120 no, $12 million and, do, and invest it in research. Invite those youngsters that are in colleges to come and in, get involved in that study and fund them. So I want to suggest, please, that at lunch we exchange some, some numbers with the persons involved in, um, in the department, in our department, DEF, to engage the youngsters in Outbay and perhaps even fund them to go to schools for marine and auto... Um, 
um, yes. uh, aqua yes. projects so that they can get the, the education so that they can challenge and or at least uh, engage with yes. with this discussion uh, in a, in an in a in an intelligent way so that they can understand the the, the pros and cons of well. issues like Thank seismic. You, sir. Thank you. Much appreciated. Ma'am, at the back. Good day, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I just want to say uh, I agree with all of the speakers that was talking now. First, with Chief Regan, agree with what he said, that there must be more impact and more looked at the Aboriginal indigenous people, and also that we must be part of everything in this country because we are indigenous. And then um, scientifically, like the previous speaker also said, like Fabian said, the scientists said that um, there wasn't enough fish in the water, West Coast rock lobster. And just a couple of months later, over 15 something tons walk out. So how, 500 tons. So how can we trust the scientists that's there today? Why don't they trust us? We know. By feeling, we were born with all of this. We know by nature what is happening when, where. So why don't they use us? And then my question, um, we're in this workshop now for two, this is the third day. We, at the first day, PASA came up. They had a love story there that by 14 and a half years, were they, um, were they do their research in the communities, digging here and trying there and whatever. And by the 14 and a half year, only then is the possibility that they can maybe get some oil or see some oil possibilities. And only when it goes to the produce side, only then the laws say that then only they are eligible to look into socioeconomic for the communities. Why can't there be an amendment made to that act to say that when you start messing on our grounds, on our lands from the very first day, you start giving within that community so that that community can also be part of whatever's happening. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks, Program Director. My name is Avuile, and my surname is Klabati. I have a question for Dr. Dr. Stephen. Uh, I just want to check, Doc, um, have you come across with a study or studies uh, that points to the extent of the surveys such that these mammals extinct, or have they ever extinct? because of these uh, activities, uh, maybe from, from other areas that did the, the, the survey. Then the other question is to, of course, uh, Dr. Mark and Dr. Miles. Um, I want to check, uh, on average, uh, how much uh, are these studies and how long uh, uh, do they take? Uh, uh, also, what are the difficulties they face when they did the study? Um, uh, uh, and how these studies can 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 be transferred to 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 to, to Africa, and the rigorousness of the methods that they use can can they give us confidence on on how the the, the methods how rigorous the, the the methods are such that uh, they can be uh, transferred to to other jurisdictions. Uh, uh, lastly, does this mean? there was no effect on the mammals on the area that they studies. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Doc, final question. Uh, thank you once again. It's quite difficulty for me when you have Doc, a constituency. Just quickly adjust the mic, please. There we are. Uh, better. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank the team that has really presented a very well prepared an educational uh, pro uh, program for us today. 
That being said, in 1770, we, the indigenous Aboriginal and Khoikhoi and Sand people, were also classified as a subhuman species. None has really studied us, and I find it quite uh, amazing that so much money has been uh, invested in the study that has been presented. Uh, to uh, Ms. Sarah, I would love to ask, what is the impact on the life and the custom practices of the indigenous people, and where can we find recent case studies uh, to show us or that we can study ourselves on the impact that it might have had on indigenous communities, fishing communities to be uh, specific. To Mr. Peter, I would love to ask, how did these impact uh, 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 surveys benefit the economic development and advancement of the indigenous and Aboriginal communities, keeping in consideration that history have taught us until date that the only people that uh, prosper and benefited out of these studies are the huge gas and petroleum companies and not the communities that they affect. To Mr. Miles and Mr. Mark, I would love to ask, how long does it take these impacted areas, these mining territories, to heal once the mines are exhausted and once they have gone. We recently witnessed, as you have heard, I just want to bring to your correction, 500 tons of West Coast lobsters that uh, was caused by what they call the red tide. We know that this happened right after Shell. Petroleum and gas started to do their mining. And so we want to know when we see as the community and the people that is suffering what these mines are doing, how does it, it, can it justify 500 tons of red lobster being coasted and we cannot go and fish or take out of the, the ocean 500 tons when we are told, as you have heard, there are no lobsters in our waters. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the question and answer session for this session. Not that there are no further questions to engage. Unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end. We're going to take the responses in this order. Stephen next to me, Sarah, and then Mark and Miles. Um, I will really, I struggle to hear. Um, I just want to confirm your question, if you, if you don't mind. I think you're asking if we found any evidence that um, the seismic survey activities have uh, resulted in extinction of any species. Was that the question? Can you confirm for me? 100%? Okay. Uh, Abangili, no. Um, no evidence of that at all. Um, uh, I think also one of the points I wanted to make was that even where there have been um, uh, sort of mortality events of individuals around the time of seismic surveys, um, so far it hasn't really been, it's been very difficult to um, definitively say that the cause of that was the seismic surveys because other things also happen in the marine environment. There's other things that can result in animals being killed and I think um, there's other survey techniques in the ocean, other, other uses of sound. We talk about mid-frequency sonar that is used by, um, by the Navy. Um, it, it's, it's, quite, it's used a lot in the oceans from submarines. Um, a lot of, for example, strandings of, of whales or dolphins have been attributed to, to that, which is a mid-frequency sound, which is much more um, in the frequency, within the frequency of um, a lot of the uh, smaller whales and dolphins um, and things like that. Um, there's only been really a, a few strandings of, of whales, um, also smaller whales, beaked whales, um, that have happened around the same time that seismic surveys that, that happened in South America nor or Central America, North America. Um, but once again, it, 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 um, there could have been other causes. No one's really sure. So there's, there's very sp sparse information um, and, and very little um, actual um, definitive studies that have actually attributed the causes of, of things like that to seismic surveys, to be honest. There have been, um, there have been sort of more controlled kinds of studies which have shown um, that how, how animals can be affected. 
and, um, and, and, and behavioral responses and so on. But um, to answer your question directly, no evidence of anything of that scale. Thank you. I'm not sure, I heard one question addressed to me directly, but I also wanted to just to pick up on a couple of comments uh, from, from the floor earlier, which were on um, the need for more focus on the small scale fishermen, and that historically small scale <clears throat> fishermen have, have not been the, um, the topic of focus uh, in the past. So yes, I, I, I believe we, everybody is aware and, and that everything must be done that's possible to get as much information as there exists. You know, information is key. Everybody, all scientists would like as much information as possible to work with so that an re informed decision can be made. So um, also a point was on you know what that the the Australian uh, study was based on demersal fish, which is fish that occupy the seafloor habitat, and and how does it relate to other fish stocks that our fisheries depend on? For instance, pelagic fish, sardines for the Persane fishery, uh, the lionfish for um, lion fishermen, and uh, you know tuna. Uh, which are also large pelagic species. And there is international research that's been done on these different kinds of, of species. Uh, so those, that information is, is available for the specialists to draw on. Um, there's a vari variability in the findings of those studies. Some show knock-on effects to catch rates, some show increased catch rates, some show decreased catch rates, but you know, it's, it's up to the specialists to really do a thorough literature review and try to apply it to a local context so that it me makes sense for the fishery, the fishermen that operate in South Africa. Um, but yes, the key is uh, it would be great to have more research uh, funded so that um, local context can be really applied here. And then, yeah, there was a question on the impacts on indigenous communities, and, and I'm not in a position to the impact of seismic survey on indigenous communities, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question, but you know, there are social specialist studies that are commissioned for this type of, these type of uh, projects, uh, and it would, it would be best addressed uh, by a specialist in that area. Thanks. Finally, Mark and Miles, it falls to you to end the session, please, with your responses. Uh, so the question, as I understood it, was how do we interact with traditional owners um, when we do this research? Ames has a very um, solid policy that the first thing you do is start an interaction with traditional owners of any sea country in which you're working. And that uh, interaction involves the traditional owners granting free prior, what's called free prior informed consent. That means we go to the traditional owners of the sea country, we explain to them exactly what we're doing, exactly what the results will, um, will show and how it might benefit them um, or, or, or not, and um, essentially ask for permission to do that research on their sea country. So none of our research is done without firstly interacting with the traditional owners and wherever possible engaging traditional owners in the research itself. So much so that we now have many research programs that are run by traditional owners in which we advise, we help them interpret the results and, uh, and help, help them write it up. Um, not, that's not the case in this particular study, but it is. It, we have a large number of different research projects across the top end. Um, and we recognise the the original the traditional owners as an important part of um, that process, and as the best scientists on that land.
I think the other question for us was about why was it why was the focus on demersal fish species and why not pelagic species? Um, the first part of that, or the answer to that, is because the, the area that we were working in, where a lot of seismic surveys have occurred over the last 50 to 70 years, um, is that the demersal species are the species of focus within that area. Um, there are fewer pelagic species that are, uh, are around schooling in the area that we were looking at. There are in deeper waters, um, but we were focused on what is essentially called the trap fishery, um, and they deal with demersal fishes, fishes, which are essentially bottom fishes. They are linked to the habitat that is on the bottom rather than in the, the midwater. To look at pelagic species compared to bottom dwelling species, you need a very different suite of, of, of tools that can observe what their behavior is. Um, and that is key, coming back to how we designed the experiment, is when you're moving forward is to discuss what species you're looking at and what the attributes are of that species and identify what the best tools are to be able to monitor them and observe what they're doing. Gentlemen, mine is only to say thank you. It absolutely is very late in Australia where you gentlemen are. We do not take your time for granted. And thank you so much for the indulgence, even by engaging as deeply as you have in the responses to the questions put to you, emotive as in South Africa necessarily they were. Thanks as well to Ms. Sarah Wilkinson at Capricorn Marine, as well as Stephen Kirkman, specialist scientist oceans and coasts at the Department of Fisheries, Forestry and Environment. That then brings us to an end of this, the second session. And if you'll note the time, 13.57, we should be three minutes away from starting the session after lunch, lunch which is an entire hour. With your indulgence, and only with your indulgence, might I please request that from 60 minutes we go to 45 minutes for the lunch break and try and just steal some time back. Of course, conferences and colloquia have a life of their own as they want, but we can at least try and exercise what control we can in the circumstances. Not at all designed to curtail or to suppress any divergent views especially, but simply because there are those with obligations beyond today's appointment. Thank you so much for First of all, your emotions, this is important. That's what a colloquium is about. Nobody's here to make friends, but rather everybody's here to make sure that South Africa is a country that develops, and if there is a voice that for too long has been suppressed, now is a good time for that voice to be made. Just as much as there is a time for us to then hold back on our own ideas. Remember, we are here to contest ideas and not to necessarily defend them, but to test them against other views. I welcome the emotions. I appreciate that. If you see me at lunch, please give me a hug. I need all the strength for the next two sessions. Thank you, guys. It's lunchtime.
Welcome back. Welcome back. This room is a lot louder than what it was an hour ago. It's amazing what food can negotiate. This room, I'm even getting laughs. This is great. I even scored a couple of hugs during the lunch break. Always welcome. Keep them coming. Good afternoon, everyone. Are we still here? Session three, South Africa's major fish stocks, historical offshore and gas exploration in South Africa, ensuring energy security and socioeconomic benefits from oil and gas industry are but some of the conversations we are yet to hear this afternoon. The Wi-Fi password is on the screen. The hashtag, remember, is hashtag PCE. CTICC, that's the hashtag for today's proceedings to be used for all social media engagement. Please, IT team, please just confirm again what that Wi Fi password is. I imagine everybody who will be using Wi Fi knows it by now, but for clarity's sake, there it is Explore 3 CTICC. Apologies for those who are joining us online. By the fact that you are online, you don't need this Wi-Fi password. Not that it would work anyway. So great to see so many smiling faces. Very different look to what it was before lunch. There's plenty of coffee to go around. Please use the facilities on offer. The hospitality here from PASA has been great. Mrs. Pindi, your team has done well. Thank you very much. I propose that we start, ladies and gentlemen, and, and perhaps we should now get into the facts of what it is that we are talking about when we are talking about South Africa's marine life, particularly from a food security perspective. It was a conversation that came through early on, particularly in the first plenary in the submissions of Abongile Ngongwa as well as Loiso Pancho. And this clearly is an important feature of today's dialogue if some of the questions are anything to go by in relation to just at their heart, they are speaking to the steady promise, supply, sustenance of food. And that food comes from our marine life in the context of this conversation. So, Let's offer a round of applause to the Chief Director, Fisheries Research and Development at the DFFE, Dr. Kim Prochaska. Is that it? Oh, well done. Thank you. Dr. Kim Prochaska, South Africa's major fish stocks. No rules have changed from the first session. 20 minutes is 19 minutes. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Before I get into the presentation, I would just like to uh, register on behalf of the Branch Fisheries Management, the DDG, Ms. Middleton, um, and the other colleagues from the branch, um, our sincere, sincere condolences to Pedro uh, on the passing of his mom. From my perspective, when I saw her picture on the screen earlier, she just looked like a lady who I wanted to get a great big hug from, and if that happened, it would just make the whole world right again. Uh, so sincere condolences to, to Pedro. Um, right, this, uh, this presentation to try and keep you awake after lunch uh, is about the status of South African marine fishery resources. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go through every resource because that would take us three days. Uh, so what I am going to give you is first an overview uh, of the status of marine resources, so really a summary uh, of the current picture, and then we're going to drill down and focus on some key resources. Uh, due to time, we may not get through them all. Um, I think the one I would first chop out would be the demersal sharks in terms of who's in this room 
um, but we'll see if we can get through it all. Uh, the program director has agreed to pop up and jump up and down and let me know when there's five minutes left so I can speed up to try and get through everything at the end. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up at the end. All right, so here is the summary of the current status of South Africa's marine fisheries resources. Uh, this little robot picture shows on the left-hand axis it shows the fishing pressure, that is how hard we are fishing uh, those stocks at the moment. The bottom blocks are low and the top blocks are high. And along the bottom is stock status. So that is uh, the current status of those fish stocks from poor on the left to good on the right. So we start with the obvious, the most obvious block, which is the red block. Those are the things where the status of the resource is really poor at the moment, plus fishing pressure is high. So these are the ones that we're really, really worried about where we need to put in effort um, so that we can try and uh, not only maintain those fish stocks, but so that preferably we can also rebuild them to higher levels so that in future we can get more catch from those fish stocks. Moving to the right then, the orange ones are ones where um, the status of the stock is good, um, but fishing pressure is still too high and we need to do something to try and improve the situation on those. In the bottom left, the block with the yellow, uh, the yellow species in, those ones have a poor stock status. Um, so the stocks are, are low, um, but fishing pressure is also low, so there is hope that those stocks will improve over time if we can maintain that situation. And then the good news stories are the green block on the bottom right where the status of the stocks um, are good and fishing pressure is low and those are the resources which we consider uh, to be sustainably uh, and optimally fished at this point in time. All right, if we start then drilling down into some of the details, the first, uh, the first resource we're going to look at is the hake resource. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, this, the hake fishery catches both shallow water hakes and deep water hakes. They catch them together. Uh, they're caught by uh, both the offshore and inshore trawl sectors, and they're caught also by longline and handline fisheries. They're also caught to some extent uh, in the midwater trawl for horse mackerel as bycatch in that fishery. Um, and the, the Hake uh, fishery is by far South Africa's largest fishery. Uh, the value of the fishery equals all of our other fisheries put together. So it's a really big one. So the graphs show uh, a good, it's clearer on your screen than on the small one in front of me, but those show um, catches of Hakes uh, over the years going back to 1917 is the first record. That's how far the information goes back that we have uh, on catches of hake. So you can see how those have changed uh, over the years and they've remained relatively stable uh, for a long time now. Um, so the hake trawl fishery is the only one of South Africa's fisheries that, uh, that is certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, which is essentially um, an eco-labeling that allows access to European markets. Um, this certification, while it gives the benefit to the fishing industry, it also comes with responsibilities for both the fishing industry uh, and for us uh, as the government management authority. So we have to do, for example, regular surveys of abundance of hakes. We have to estimate catches in a reliable way. We have to do regular scientific assessments of the resource. Uh, we have to have some fancy uh, rules about how, um, how the, the resource is harvested each year and how we determine annual catch limits. We have to have independent scientific observers on the vessels. There needs to be adequate monitoring, control, and enforcement of the fishery. And then there need to be measures to reduce 
uh, the wider impact of the fishery on ecosystems such as damage to seabed or uh, limiting bycatch of other species, various things, and that's checked on an annual basis by auditors who, who come and visit. Um, the most recent assessments of Hake indicate a continued steady decline uh, in the abundance of the shallow water hake, M. capensis, but a more recent decrease um, for the deep water hake. Um, but there's no cause for alarm because both species are well above the level at which the resource is considered happy and the level at which you can catch as many fish as possible from that resource. Um, and then the, the operational management procedure used for hake um, it, uh, it changes, it's set to change the level of the total allowable catch every year in response to that kind of information. And for last year, that then meant reducing the TAC by, uh, for, for this year, by 5%. Uh, that plot, that figure there, shows a projection of the abundance of hake uh, going into the into the future, and it shows that if we continue managing hake the way we are doing, it will continue to be sustainable <coughs> going into the future. <coughs> All right, so we move on to the small pelagic fish, these little ones that swim at the top, the anchovies and sardines and, uh, and round herring, or red eye. Uh, sardine catches are very low at the moment because they've been um, some issues with sardine recruitment, particularly on the west coast over the last few years. Um, but there has been some slight uh, positive noises more recently. Uh, a total of 243 tons of anchovy, red, red eye and sardine were caught in the 2021 year. Um, and, but those were also below the long-term catches, but there's no huge cause for concern other than sardine. If we look more closely at the anchovy, the anchovy abundance uh, <clears throat> increased in 2020, um, and the blue bars show you the abundance of anchovy. As you can see, that went up again in 2020. And then the line that's attached to that shows the recruitment. The recruitment is the baby fish that it coming from uh, into the fishery new each year. So recruitment did, um, it did look like it was going down, but it's still within the average. You can see it's still within the range of those spiky blue lines. Uh, looking at the sardine, it's not quite as happy. You can see there the red bars show sardine biomass since 1984. Um, you can see sardine biomass went up dramatically in the early 2000s, but then went down uh, equally dramatically and has stayed, uh, has stayed very low. So this remains a resource uh, of concern, um, and we are managing uh, that resource in a precautionary way um, so that we don't, uh, don't do any damage to that resource. It's thought that these are natural fluctuations um, and that this is based on low recruitment, so not enough baby sardines coming into the fishery each, each year. Uh, we're not entirely sure what the causes uh, of that are. All right, so we move on to abalone. I know that's one that's close to the hearts of some people in this room. So uh, abalone has suffered major declines in abundance uh, over the years, um, despite all the efforts of trying to manage this resource sustainably. So measures that have been tried have been closure of the recreational fishery, reductions in the total allowable catch each year, closures of areas to fishing, and an area management system, um, but none of these have uh, halted the decline. Uh, the commercial, because the situation with abalone was so bad, the commercial fisheries closed in 2008, um, but then reopened again uh, for in 2010. And if you look at the green bars, um, 
those show the um, those show the catch of abalone over the years dating back to 1953. So that's a very long record of data we have. And you can see that the abalone resources went down drastically in the sort of 1960s, stayed at a level for a while, and then just went down and down and down again from there. So not a very happy situation. Um, <clears throat> so the data that are available, which are data from the from the current commercial fishery, as well as data from our own surveys that we undertake, uh, don't show any recovery of this resource as yet. Um, and the projections that we have done uh, show that the resource will continue to, to decline uh, if the current levels, it's catch in total, but it's primarily the illegal catch uh, that is the biggest contributor um, in this case, the illegal catch is far greater than the legal catch. Um, in some areas, re recovery of the resource may still be possible, um, but this would require some drastic reductions in the catches, that being the legal catches plus the illegal catches for that to be achieved. Uh, in some other areas, um, it is not possible to recover that resource. Um, because of the biology of the resource and there just aren't enough animals there to produce and to get that cycle going again. So those areas would only be able to be recovered again if one put, uh, did a stock enhancement program and if you uh, grew some baby abalone in your, on your abalone farm and then went and put them out in the seas would be the only way to do it in some of those areas. All right, one that I know that's very close to most people's heart here is West Coast Rock Lobster, the Kreef. Uh, so the fishery generates around 500 million rand per year. Uh, it employs about 2,400, about 4,200 people. Um, it's traditionally focused on the West Coast, but resource shifts during the 1990s uh, resulted in some new fishing areas being opened up uh, in the areas east of Cape Hunclip. The fishery consists of four sectors. There's the offshore commercial, the, which uses traps, the inshore commercial, which uses hoop nets, the interim relief and small-scale sectors, and the recreational sector. So declines in, in catches, and the blue line on the graph shows the catches going back to 1890, that's quite a long time, it's before any of us were here. Um, and that shows that the catches have declined, uh, particularly since the 1950s and 60s, for a number of reasons, because of changes in fishing methods, because of stricter control uh, on catches, because of declines in the resource abundance, uh, illegal harvesting, uh, reduced growth, of rock lobsters and environmental changes. And this resource is currently experiencing overfishing. As you saw at the beginning, it was one of the ones in the red block. I'm going, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over demersal sharks and move to lionfish, because I think that's more, has a broader interest. So the most recent stock assessments indicate that reductions of commercial fishing effort that have been implemented since 2000 as a, uh, in response to the declaration of the state of emergency in the line fishery, um, have resulted in the partial recovery of some species. So there's really good news. Um, however, other species, uh, species such as silver cob are still being overfished and we still have work to do to try and turn uh, those fisheries around. It's important to note that it's not only the lionfish sector that impacts these species, but uh, some of them are also caught in other sectors, and the inshore trawl fishery is, is one of those that also impacts on some of our lionfish species. Good news is snook and yellowtail um, are optimally exploited. They're in the green block. Um, and then we know that we have good years for yellowtail, and we have good years for snook, and we have bad years for both of them. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no relationship that can be found with, any, uh, with time or with any environmental uh, parameters. They just seem to, uh, they, 
they just seem to be random. They seem to just be naturally very variable. So when we have bad years of snook, it's not that the snook are bad, they're just not here that year. Um, so some, some lionfish uh, remain severely depleted. These include species like red sternbrass, duggarod, and white sternbrass. Um, and we need to change something uh, because of the way we're going, these are going to continue to decline. We have some difficulties with lionfish management at the moment in that it is very slow for us to translate uh, the, the information that comes from the science into management, um, mostly because of the SAIS uh, requirements these days for changing regulations, which means we can't manage things quickly as we need to manage them. It's a very, very slow process. And then there are also illegal activities um, that, uh, that also impact on, uh, on these species. And drone fishing is one of those, which uh, some of you may have seen in newspapers and all over the place. That's been a big area of contention. So I think the concluding remarks are that some resources, particularly those nearshore ones which we can access easily, um, are overfished and continue to experience overfishing. So we need to look after those. Um, and then other resources are sustainably managed. And the good news is that, you know, if we, we can put in place interventions to reduce overfishing um, and we can put in place interventions to lead to stock recovery so that in future we can uh, get more catches out of the fish stocks that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I was actually just sitting here wondering to what extent, and this might not necessarily be a DFFE or DMRE competency, how do we protect particularly these overfished and seriously pressurized stocks? And I'm minded to think the role, if any, of the Department of Defense, particularly the Navy element, in monitoring our territorial waters. Every now and then, as we know it happens, there will be an unaccounted for vessel in our commercial zones. Not so long ago, in fact, a Chinese vessel was arrested. And there are quite a few of them in international waters as well as in sovereign waters where they don't belong are not accounted for and particularly where there is no monitoring of that marine life and protecting thereof. They are just running amok. And the question then becomes beyond the two departments who are inherently charged with the responsibility of what we are talking about here in protecting marine life. What jurisdiction extends to the Department of Defense, particularly the Navy, in ensuring that what we are talking about now is protected? I mean, it's a sovereignty issue, surely. If we're not talking about fish, it'll soon be, if it should happen, a question of protecting those oil and gas infrastructure that would still be out there at sea. And the question is, are we sufficiently protected? And by extension, is our sovereignty anything that can be targeted through, of course, what we are not protecting? out at sea. So thank you so much, Kim, for that. The last point in relation to the conclusion, I think it can come through in the question and answer session, particularly the overfishing of the near shore stocks. It obviously then has to engage the question of the fishing communities who would more than likely be in that space of extraction of the mineral resources and what can be done to upscale or to give or to offer concessions towards the necessary um, vessels to be able to go beyond the near shore to catch those stocks that are now from your presentation under pressure. These are some of the questions and conversations and I'm hoping will be considered in the moderated session. We move on. Historical offshore oil and gas exploration in South Africa. Mr. Dave van der Spey, Conventional Resource Manager at Petroleum Agency of South Africa. So um, 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, G DDGs, PASA board members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I particularly want to uh, recognize the presence of the fishermen and fisherwomen that I met on Tuesday and interacted with for quite a long and robust session. It, I must say I found it extremely educational, and thank you so much for that. Today, a bit of change of subject from me with those people. I'm going to be talking about the history of offshore oil and gas exploration in South Africa. So many of you might be surprised to know that South Africa has been looking for oil since the 1940s, and that was by, led by the Geological Survey on shore in South Africa. And then later, about 25 years later, Sukho was formed, and they started to explore the Karoo on shore, and also two small onshore geological basins known as the Olgo and Zululand Basin. But by 1967, we had the Mining Rights Act, and onshore concessions were granted to international companies. You can see some big names there, like Total, Gulf Oil, Esso, people will remember those, Shell, of course, Arco CFP, and Superior. Superior came in in 1967. Off, they spent two years doing some studies, and they were the first people to drill South Africa's very, very first offshore well, which was known GAA-1. That was off Plettenberg Bay, and it discovered gas. In 1970, Sukho uh, got together with Rand Mines um, and US Natural Resources, and they drilled their first offshore well in 73. And at that stage, Sukho moved completely offshore. Also, at around about that time in the 70s, early 70s, sanctions started against the apartheid government and international companies started to withdraw. So that left Sukor operating from around about the mid-70s uh, into the 90s, just before democracy, as the sole explorer operating for the entire offshore for South Africa. Because of sanctions, the apartheid government was absolutely desperate to find its own supplies of oil because, of course, there were oil sanctions against South Africa, and employed three rigs. You can see them there. There's two over there. These two were the two Sedco rigs, and then this one was the Amiga. And those rigs offered full, operated full-time, three of them going all at the same time for 10 years between 1981 and 1991, and 183 wells were drilled in that time. So that might seem like a huge amount, but if you think about Nigeria, there are 1,400 and something wells offshore Nigeria. However, that exploration did have some positive outcomes in terms of exploration. In the beginning, the first thing to be discovered through that exploration was the FA gas field, which eventually became the gas field that started off the Mossel Bay um, plant. In 1983, a further gas field was discovered to the west of that called EM, and the Mossel Bay plant uh, GTL project was initiated, started building that seven years later after the discovery of the, of the first gas field in 1987. And then later, the late 80s into 1990, there were three small oil, field oil fields discovered, also south of Mossel Bay, first of those being Oryx in 1988, and then 1989, 1990, two more, Sable and Oroby, were discovered, but not yet developed. So this is just a map to show you where all of those discoveries uh, were made. Here you can see there's Mossel Bay. I hope you can hear me. There's the FA gas field. To the west of that, the EM gas field. So that was the very first uh, discovery offshore through this frantic apartheid era exploration. And then three small oil fields further south of that, um, also offshore Mossel Bay. Twelve years after the discovery of that first gas field, the FA gas field in 1992. Those of you who lived in Saldana will remember the construction of the jacket that supports that huge structure that you can see there in the diagram. Twelve years after the discovery, production began, um, and that continued at 195 standard cubic feet a day for decades. And at that time, we also had, of course, went to the GTL plant, and at that time, it was the largest GTL refinery uh, in the world. So this just shows you some of the subsea um, arrangement of what was going on at the time. So uh, let me just move on to that as well. So the first uh, development was based on one TCF of gas, 
and it operated at full steam for nearly 20 years and then carried on at reduced uh, capacity for almost another 10 years and has just recently, of course, ceased production. But the refinery was producing petrol, diesel, kerosene, and so on, and was later supplemented by gas from uh, further south, deeper into the basin, in other wells that had been drilled for, for uh, oil exploration, in fact, but had discovered some amounts of gas. So then in 1994, of course, um, democracy eventually arrived in our beautiful country, and we were able to open uh, licensing to offshore investors, I mean to international investors once again. But our very first license round, unfortunately, did not produce any takers. So no international oil companies came to South Africa. It was a completely unknown region to the international oil and gas community. There was very little data. There was no production other than the gas coming out of uh, the FA gas field. And there was also a fiscal regime that didn't really fit oil and gas. It was heavily skewed to hard minerals like gold and so on, because that is what South Africa's main extraction business was at the time. Nonetheless, a few years later, um, a Canadian company, Phillips Petroleum, approached us, formed a partnership with Cecil and Pan Canadian, and they were granted a license off the East Coast and drilled the first post-apartheid well in 2000, which uh, unfortunately was dry. Um, during that time, the first little uh, oil fields in the Bredasdorf Basin, south of Mossel Bay, came online in 1997, the Oribe field, followed by uh, the Oryx field in 2000. They operated for many years and produced nearly 46 uh, million barrels of oil before they were suspended. One of those rigs that drilled, the Sedco rig, was converted to a floating production and storage offshore facility and was rechristened the Orca. You can see that over there with its tanker serving, serving it coming and going, taking oil uh, back and forth to shore. Then, in 1999, Petroleum Agency was established, a very, very important year for us. Three years later, uh, Sukor merged with Moscas and parts of SFF and formed what is now known as Petri SA, and very importantly, the MPRDA, which is the legislation under which oil and gas exploration and production uh, is carried out today, uh, that, that was passed by Parliament. A couple of years later, or a year later, the last of those little oil fields discovered off, Bredaz, off uh, Mossel Bay in deeper water in the middle of the Bredasdorp. The sable field came into production. This was new technology. It went to a Dutch vessel called the Glasdauer which is also a floating production and storage facility. It produced oil into a tanker, but there was a shuttle tanker going back and forth, taking the oil to refinery. I think that op operated for about five years before it stopped. Um, in that early exploration, there were also discoveries made on the West Coast, notably up here, a little oil discovery called AJ discovery, and over here, a K discovery which discovered gas, and in 2000 and 2001, that was followed up by a company called Forest Oil, um, and they were able to then define the Ibubesi gas field from that work. Then, in 2004, the MPRDA finally became operational. Um, Petrus A took more gas from the South Coast project into their facility, and very importantly, in 2008, the Royalties Act and Income Tax Act were enacted, and that put us in a position where everything was known. Everything was certain. We had the MPRDA to show how oil and gas exploration was going to work in South Africa. We had the Royalties Act and we had the Income Tax Act, so oil companies were absolutely certain of the deal that they were going to get when interacting with the South African state in terms of oil exploration. So we ran a first license round, uh, or a further license round, yeah, first license round in terms of the MPRDA in 2009. And we're very, very pleased to attract Shell, Silver Wave, and our own Petri SA. So here is a map showing you what things looked like before all of that was in place. Um, there's the EEZ, which we've spoken about earlier today in the light blue, that's South Africa's territorial water. There's activity going on here that was Petri SA's activity. 
and a little bit of activity going on on the West Coast. A couple of years later, once we had that license round, we had attracted Shell, for example, Silver Wave, and other companies were coming to South Africa, were interested in South Africa. You can see these little green and yellow areas. There are a lot more of them covering South Africa's EEZ. And by that time, we had about 315 offshore wells and quite a lot of seismic, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of 2D seismic and nearly 10,000 square kilometers of 3D seismic. So as we moved into 2014, the oil price really, really started to pick up. And by July 2014, it had reached $113 per barrel. And if you look at this map, very, very interesting compared to the 2011 one or even the 27 one, almost the entire EEZ of South Africa is occupied by uh, licenses for petroleum and gas, or oil and gas exploration, or applications for such licenses. So we were really riding the wave. Things here were really starting to pick up. Exploration was really moving. We had a really vibrant offshore industry. We had a whole lot of production rights, a whole lot of exploration rights, and other interest in various different types of permits and so on that Pumla explained early this morning. Here's just a, a group of some of the uh, explorers involved. You can see there were over 20. Very interestingly, three of the major five in the world. Shell over there, ExxonMobil, and Total. That's three out of the five of the biggest oil companies in the world were exploring, actively exploring in South Africa. They started to gather new data. Um, the top section there shows you the explorers themselves gathered, at that time gathered over 21,000 uh, square kilometers of 3D. And then we had a whole lot of companies that came along to gather spec data, and they also gathered tens of thousands of, data, of kilometers of new 2D data. But then, so that was all up to around about July 2014 or so. Towards the end of 2014, this is West Texas Intermediate. It is uh, one of the bases for push setting the price of oil, very much like Brent. Uh, you can see there, we're pushing $110, $110 a barrel, and boom, went down very, very low. Brent even went down to somewhere around 20, and there are even stories of uh, producers having to pay um, retailers to take oil. So, in fact, oil turned negative in price. So all the smaller companies went away and ceased their, their exploration activities in South Africa, but some did carry on. For example, Petrius A tried very hard to try and to increase gas supply to Mussel Bay um, and their GTL plant. They drilled FO wells, three of them, using new technology for South Africa and did an incredible technical job using the Transocean Marianas. And very luckily for us, Total, a very big company, was able to weather the storm of very low oil price. They had identified um, a very interesting prospect to the south in our, uh, of South Africa, in our south coast, in deep water, uh, in an area called the Brill Pudder, I mean the Pudderfizzy Play, and their first prospect was built Pudder. They tried to drill it in 2014 um, using the Eric Rauder. The Eric Rauder was not able to handle the sea conditions, and um, they gave up. They started in April of that year, gave up in September, having uh, penetrated only 500 meters below sea floor. But they went back to the drawing board um, and got themselves another rig from Norway and they also brought in a number of other partners to share the risk, being Qatar Petroleum and our own South African Main Street. And they used Otfeld's Deep Sea Stavanga. And that began drilling in December 2018, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was on Christmas Eve of 2018, and drilled into 2019, and I'm sure everybody is aware that they made a world-class discovery of gas and condensate in a well called Brilpada, which is about three and a half k's below sea level, um, but also yeah, so about two kilometers below sea floor. 
A year later, they drilled the next prospect in the area called Lapit, and this was extremely successful. They intersected 73 meters of reservoir that contained uh, condensate and also a bit of oil. They tested this well, the flow rate of this oil, and produced 33 million standard cubic feet of gas a day and just over 4,000 barrels per day of condensate, and that was on a very, very strict choke. It was very good news for them. The reservoir turned out to be far better than the models had shown, and it de-risked all the prospects in the area. So they have only drilled to date two out of five prospects. This is a world-class accumulation of gas and condensate and perhaps some light oil. And we have now heard that they are moving towards um, submitting a uh, production right application that is out in public already to, to PASA. So that is imminent. So we are really looking forward to that. Um, and that is very, very good news for us. So where does that bring us now? So unfortunately, this slide, I think the, the uh, writing is a little bit small. But just in, in summary of the history, you can see the first seismic acquired in South Africa, sort of in the late 60s, last seismic in South Africa last year. Some areas have only had very minimal seismic, like parts of the Wild Coast only had seismic acquired in 74 or so. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah, and nothing since then. Wells, we've had drilling from, from, from the late 60s with the last drilling in 2020 last year. So, what now? Where does that put us? Um, I've shown you the discoveries made by uh, Total and their partners. There's Leipzig, there's Brillpada, there are three others waiting to be drilled. This is the area that's going to be, de be developed initially. Further work that they have gone through has indicated the existence of another system further to the east, which may very well be just as prospective as this. So we very well have or the great possibility of having an absolutely world-class accumulation of oil of gas in that area. There's also been discussion of the discoveries in the Orange Basin today by Tatal and Shell. And of course, there's also been pointed out that that area um, extends into South Africa. There is far more of the Orange Basin in South Africa, and there is a great deal of prospectivity waiting to be looked at in South Africa. And my very last slide, just ending with a statement from Phil Birch, who uh, is Impact, that's one of the companies involved in exploration in Namibia and also South Africa, his exploration director. There, I'll just read the last part, he is talking about those wells in Namibia, the wells, uh, the discoveries made by Total, all pointing to what is now regarded by the international oil and gas industry as highly prospective Southern African oil and gas play, extending all the way from the southernmost part of Namibia to the east coast of South Africa. Thank you. One minute and 22 seconds. <laughs> yeah, one minute, 21 seconds. He made it within, so I'm very glad about that. We are recovering slowly but surely. Thank you so much, Dave. That orange basin, I don't know who else can just smell the opportunity here. It's on the West Coast. There are some interests from the West Coast that are represented here today. And this is precisely why we are here, isn't it? To, to, to have voices being heard and uh, the right ears listening and ensuring the consultative process when it should get underway happens the way that it should and there's a spread of the total ownership of economy. This is the sort of language South Africa should be engaging more and more, more meaningfully especially, and there's absolutely no reason why not, now that the cat is out of the bag as it were, that that should not happen. Thank you so much, Mr. Thunder Spey. Shonisane Manyaga. Senior Economist at the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, ensuring energy security and socio-economic benefits from the oil and gas industry. More of what we have just seen. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, good afternoon. It's, it's very difficult to, to be presenting um, after, after such a good lunch. And I know that uh, uh, people now are tired. Uh, it has been a long day. Um, let me first greet my DDG and DDG from, from Environment Department, CEO PASA, um, member of the board, um, my colleagues from both DFFE and DMRE, and from the local and, and provincial uh, government as well, um, fellow presenters um, and panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, not forgetting the, the fishing community and leadership. Um, my name is Sean San Maniaga, as highlighted. I'm with the Department of Mineral Resources. I'll try and, and borrow back the one minute that Dave um, stole um, so that we'll be on time. Um, the topic on ensuring energy security is a contentious one. It's a, I'm not sure if I'm going to do justice to that topic within 20 minutes. Um, because we all know what is happening in this country with regard to, to, to energy. But I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, this will be the outline. I will outline the, um, some of the policies that we have in government and legislation, um, the issues uh, regarding the energy and the socioeconomic benefit and potential that can be realized from, from oil and gas. Um, the energy consumption by source currently, uh, globally, and in South Africa to see where we, we are as a country. Uh, then we'll have the gas market as, as the gas is seen as a transition fuel, globally. Um, highlight on the market within South Africa um, to say where are we uh, as a country with regard to the, to the gas market and then the socioeconomic benefits uh, that we can realize from development of oil and gas. Then, then I will conclude. Um, unfortunately there, I think there's a, there's a challenge. Um, um, it, it all starts with the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, from section 24, I'm not going to dwell much on that because it has been explained earlier. And then in 1998, we, we developed a policy on, on energy. Um, then that was followed by the National Development Plan. And then we had, we've got our <clears throat> integrated resource plan um, that became policy in 2019. Um, all these talks to us having to uh, develop our own energy sector for security and for independence as well. And in the agenda from around 1998 was, was the gas, which today is seen as a transition fuel. Um, recently, uh, we all know that uh, our president made announcement that uh, we, need, we need to focus on developing our our energy and our ministry was given a marching order to say we need to expedite um, uh, processing um, and the determination to make sure that we cover the gap that is there um, so that we can, we can have capacity in our country. I'm not sure uh, what is wrong with the, with the TV in front of me, but some, some words are some sentences are missing. Um, uh, the, what is the issue that we, we're talking about when we say energy security and, um, and the socioeconomic benefits that can be realized from, from this sector? Um, number one, South Africa is, is very much um, energy intensive. Uh, we use a lot of energy as a country. Uh, we, are, we are an energy starving country. That we must, we, we must appreciate. Um, currently, there's high fuel prices, um, and, and we are exposed to external shocks. For example, uh, with, this, with what is happening in Russia, 
and Ukraine. We are very vulnerable. Um, and as a result, uh, we're all aware that there was a strike a day or two ago, uh, wherein our own communities are saying uh, things are very expensive. Um, it's because we are, we are exposed to inflation and the external shocks um, and, and, and the geopolitical dynamics uh, that happens uh, globally. Um, number three, we heavily dependent on export when it comes to petroleum products. Um, we import from Nigeria, Mozambique, and, and other places as well. So it's very key that we, we review that and, and see what we can do as a country. Um, this is the negative balance in payment um, that the countries pay, actually, uh, because of not having our own indigenous um, resources, oil and gas resources. And now, what is, what is the problem? We, we need to have an energy security as a country. We need some independence. And we all know, um, as highlighted in the NDP, we've got the triple challenges, like poverty, unemployment, etc. Um, with this graph, it's, it's primary energy consumption by source, um, 1999 and also in, in 2021. Um, we look at ourselves as South Africa. This, this, is our, of our, our, this is our profile of, of the energy technologies that we were using then and the percentage contribution to our economy. And this is 2021. If you zoom into this, you realize that between 1999 and now, there has been a slow movement in terms of change in our profile on energy consumption. Okay, then we zoom into countries like China, for example. 71% um, coal, 21%, I think it's oil, little bit of nuclear there, ETC. Then we look at China today, 57% coal, increase in oil, infusing of gas, in, in their energy mix. Um, so between 1999 and, and 2021, as it stands, the color, I don't know what is this color, what is this color, uh, maybe, it's purple, yes. <laughs> there, there's been more increase in the purple color in profiles of countries um, around the world. That color, ladies and gentlemen, is called gas. Um, this is because when countries were developing economically, then they infused more of gas so that they can be able to meet their climate commitment. This is not my number, and, and certainly it's not Dave's number. Um, it's what is there out there. So, so there's a need for us to look into, into that. Last, my last point on this slide is the change between 1999 among, amongst countries and 2021. Even though they are infusing more of renewable resources in their mix, but countries tend to protect their own base load, um, which is your, your, your coal, your gas, your oil, and your nuclear. No. Okay. Look at the people. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, so from from that picture, um, you can actually see that the countries, even when they are trying to meet the climate commitment, but they tamper with their best load with technologies that have been proven that they can be able to sustain their economies, and that is very important. Um, now I've got the challenge with the movie. <laughs> Can somebody help me, please? Put 
Seems so. like we might have a battery. Oh, okay. Look at that. Okay. Thank you. Um, with the graph up there, it's, it's, it's the case scenario um, uh, for the market outlook uh, globally. Um, just to try and explain, maybe with the, with the simple um, bar graph here, the industries are still going to demand gas. This is from 2020 and projection to 2040. We are expecting industries to still demand a lot of gas as they, de they develop their own energy industries, the transport industry and the building industries. So, so the need for fossil fuel in the name of gas will still be there um, globally. These are just um, projections from, from var various uh, institutions. Um, so what is interesting from this, if you look at the stated policy scenario, um, the stated policy scenario is, the, is this yellow one, or orange. As, as we witness the war in Ukraine and, and, and Russia now, you know, countries are adjusting their own policies to say, we, hang on, we are in trouble. Russia cannot supply us with, uh, with the gas that we need. They cannot supply us with the coal that we need. So they adjust their own policy um, to suit their own economic and social needs. So based on the policy, this is what will happen to gas. It's going to go up. Um, the, the green one is the ambitious one where in these the countries meet their own net zero target. So there's going to be a reduction in gas. But currently, based on the policies that governments have, that is what is going to happen. The, the, the demand for gas is going to go, to go up. Uh, this is our own context um, in, terms, in terms of the, of the market. Um, Currently, we have got around 56,000 employed within, within the gas market. Um, we consume about 180 petajoules as a country within sin fuels and industrial fuel. And these are the provinces um, that are consuming the gas that is coming. Just to highlight that the majority of the gas that we have in the country, uh, we are getting that from, from Mozambique. Um, and this is the tax revenue that government benefits out of, of the gas from Mozambique. Okay. In terms of the market, how the market is specially located in South Africa, we've got the northern market and the southern market in, the, in, in South Africa. The southern market, that's where you have got your Petro SC, uh, GTL facility, ATC. The northern market, it's, it's around Mpumalanga and, and Gauteng, which is the one that is generating the 56,000 jobs. Now, there is a risk that is well documented, that uh, the reserves in, in, in Mozambique is declining, um, which is going to affect the, the market that we have currently around Mpumalanga and Gauteng and the 56,000 jobs. Um, so, so something's supposed to give there. Um, as a country, we are dependent on it, so we are going to import more of that, which, which affects the balance in payment. From socioeconomic benefit study, there's a study, it's an independent study that was done on 11B, 12B block by, by total, the discovery by total, what sort of benefit the country can have. Um, this is what the countries tend to benefit annually from through GDP contribution, over 22 billion annually from the development of that resource. This is what we stand to, to, to benefit through capital formation, 103 billion upward of that. 
This is the total employment from direct, indirect, and induced. Just under 40,000 employment. This is a model that was done, or a study that was done by an independent company. So we, we really need to think deep to say what should give. Um, and I'm glad that the, the theme is uh, coexistence, because there is this opportunity. Um, from fiscal point of view, this is what the countries tend to benefit annually, 8.6 billion. Balance of payment, about 25 billion annually. This is not Shonisani's numbers. It's a study that was done. What is my, my conclusion? My conclusion is opportunity exists. Opportunities there offshore through development of, of gas project in the country. And case, an example is, is the total discovery. Um, deployment of our own oil and gas resources Will, will provide the necessary energy security and energy independence, as we all ex aspire. Um, there's a room within the oceans for coexistence of all sectors, oil and gas, fishing, marine transport, ETC. But it's through the engagement that we can all unlock that potential. Lastly, South Africa is a is starving for, for reindustrialization. So our laws should be able to encourage coexistence of this sector sectors so that we can ensure social and developmental agenda of government is, is it's achieved. It's through this initiative that we'll be able to and this engagement that will be able to unlock this potential. Thank you. The International Energy Agency, the 2022 Africa Outlook. This is the latest research of its kind. I'm going to read verbatim to perhaps offer even more context as to what lies as opportunity in relation to gas and oil. Africa's industrialization relies in part on expanding natural gas use. Natural gas demand in Africa increases in the SAS, but it maintains the same share of modern energy use as today with electricity generation from renewables, outcompeting it in most cases. More than 5,000 billion cubic meters of natural gas resources have been discovered to date in Africa, which have not yet been approved for development. These resources could provide an additional 90 BCM, that's cubic meters, of gas per year by 2030, which may well be vital for the fertilizer, steel, cement industries, and water desalination. Cumulative carbon dioxide emissions from the use of these gas resources over the next 30 years would be around 10 gigatons. If these emissions were added to Africa's cumulative total today, they would bring its share of global emissions to a mere 3.5 percent. What this essentially characterizes is the opportunity far outweighs the opportunity cost in relation to further exploring South Africa and the continents at large gas and oil production. This is quite in line and in keeping with the opportunities proffered by the country profile that my brother has just offered now. We have one more speaker for the segment, Dr. Alex Luririo, Scientific Director at Energio Alliance. What makes a consultation meaningful and informative? This is now essentially how we bring the coexistence element to bear, noting, contemplating, and incorporating all the voices necessary as we engage these questions. Dr. Alex, I understand you are joining us virtually. Please do confirm that you are on and alive online. 
Is the doctor there? The doctor there. Talking about people Talking online, about people I have online, got good authority got from good authority our communications from team our communications that we are touching on 900 online. online. So this clearly so this does clearly demonstrate does the demonstrate need for such conversations. For such conversations. If, they if they can be a first and a second as what today is, there surely is a requirement for a third because the demand on the ground is evident by the participation physically and online. Alex Loririo, are you there? Are you there? Good afternoon from Cape Town. from Cape Town. Hello, can you hear me? Acoustics team, Acoustics give me the team, thumb. Give me the thumbs up or down, please. Please don't take um, pictures as I'm of me. Doing this, as I'm this doing is tended this. to this be a meme to be for a many a politician. I can think of the immediate former president. There's a meme of him doing something like this, like as, this there is of the as there is of the previous minister for water and sanitation. I, I would know if I become a meme, it will be somebody here. And I've got all your, your email addresses. Number, all your e Please do not do that. I just can't see the acoustics team because we are supposed to be joined by Dr. Luririo. If in the next 30 seconds we do not get her to be online, I would probably propose that probably then we take a short break we'll take a and short move break on with the and move on with the program, and we will find a way to incorporate her because the panel is going to be talking about how can South Africa improve, South improve its engagement with communities, communities to achieve sustainable, sustainable coexistence, coexistence of the upstream petroleum and fisheries, and fisheries, fisheries and industries. Fisheries what industries. I mean by that is what I mean what by that Alex is going to be talking to essentially will tie up with the moderated session. So. Acoustics team, Acoustics thumbs up team. or down? Thumbs up or down? Thumbs down. So we cannot get thumbs through down. to Dr. So Alex Luririo. I propose Lurio. we take a I stretch break, a five minutes, break, while, five we minutes assemble while we assemble the, 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 session. The, 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 the session. Oh, goodness, Q&A, yes, that. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, goodness, hey, yes, that dreaded <laughs> Q&A. I'm here, are you able to hear me Question now? and answer session. Okay, now Dr. Alex is back. Hey, technology. Technology will make you a liar, I promise you. Dr. Alex is not there. We're not doing the Q&A. We're doing the Q&A. Dr. Alex is back. Let's do Dr. Alex, please, and we'll give her her respect and her time, and then we will continue with the program. Alex, good, good afternoon. Hello. Hopefully you can all hear me okay now. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yes. Just give we me one second. We can hear you, Alex. Can that's, what, that's probably happening because you were not muted. All right. Are you able to hear and see me Go now? Go for it, Alex. All the best. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon and good morning from Houston. Thank you for having me today. I'm really looking forward to sharing some insight into how, how mitigation and monitoring together with community engagement can help uh, exploration and fisheries successfully coexist. Briefly, for those of you who might not have caught pre Peter's presentation earlier this morning, I represent the Energy Alliance, which is the global trade alliance for the energy geoscience industry. I am the scientific director and a marine biologist by background, and my role with Energeo is to ensure that the industry is guided by the best available scientific information. Our members are dedicated to conservation and implementing environmentally sustainable practices, and I'm here to advise them on how to achieve that. So we've heard quite a lot about seismic exploration and its uh, connection to oil and gas, but I want to remind everyone that geophysics is the first step to energy development for a variety of resources that includes hydrocarbons, wind, geothermal, carbon capture and storage. And our members are working to meet the challenges of energy discovery for the energy evolution and ensure sustainable development of and equitable access to the energy resources on which the world relies. So just to give you a quick outline and a sense of what I'm going to cover today, first up, I want to talk about environmental impact assessments and the importance of stakeholder engagement in that process. Next, we'll talk specifically about how the energy geoscience industry manages fishery interactions to ensure that process is respectful and mutually beneficial. And finally, we'll talk about standard monitoring and mitigation measures that are implemented. So these are primarily focused on marine mammals, but we also know that a healthy food web is essential to ecosystem well-being as a whole. I want to start with covering the Energy Alliance EIA Handbook. This is Energio's exclusive industry guidance document that is specific to the energy geoscience industry and designed to ensure that members produce the most comprehensive and useful analysis of potential environmental impacts possible. 
Probably the most common question we get regarding the EIA handbook is why do we need industry specific guidance? Don't governments set EIA requirements? And the short answer is that yes, in many jurisdictions, requirements for EIA development are in place, but that's not universally true. And EIAs are still important even when they're not required by law. Further, while the government requirements set forth the content that's required for compliance, compliance requirements alone usually do not present best practices for conducting the review and the analysis. We want to make sure that the EIA process is never just a box ticking exercise to satisfy requirements and get a permit. We believe that the EIA process should be more than just satisfying those compliance requirements. And the end goal is to produce a document that's useful for the project proponent and for any other interested stakeholders. The EIA handbook is intended to help guide project proponents through completing the most useful possible document, not just one that achieves the goal of authorization. So to put it simply, our EIA guidance helps our members go above and beyond what's required. The handbook was developed to fill a need identified by our members, both in areas where there is no formal EIA process in place, as well as for areas where the EIA process is poorly defined. For example, cases where there's a requirement for some kind of environmental review, but no specific directives. More broadly, we also wanted to ensure that the handbook was useful to apply in areas where there's a highly prescriptive process. So with that in mind, we've structured it so you can use parts in isolation where appropriate. Our goal for development was to create a standardized set of best practices for EIA development that would be applicable to the unique needs of the seismic industry. So previous EIA guideline efforts have been more general. They might cover the entire oil and gas industry. They might focus on one specific aspect like underwater sound, but they don't provide comprehensive guidance. And the challenges for the seismic industry are truly unique because there are a number of potential impacts that we can't visually see and that are difficult to quantify. So the process of identifying and mitigating potential risks for invisible drivers can be very different from factors that we can physically see. And further, we need to communicate this with stakeholders who probably do not have a comprehensive background in acoustics. So while I've taken physics classes and I deal with underwater sound every day, I am no acoustician. This content is extremely technical and it needs to be appropriately analyzed by experts, but then also communicated accurately and comprehensively to stakeholders. So companies employing the EIA handbook will still tailor the document to the unique requirements of each country, but it provides a path forward and best practices for general oversight. This is an outline of the ultimate goal for the EIA handbook and what factors contribute to a useful EIA. So I won't go through all of this, but there are a couple of key points within this framework that I want to touch on for what makes for a strong EIA. First of all, transparency. In many jurisdictions, EIAs are public and product proponents may want to consider making it public of their own volition. Transparency in that process ensures that all stakeholders understand the importance of the proposed projects and the potential impacts that should occur. Second, an EIA should always be thorough, but it also needs to be succinct. We want to ensure we've covered all applicable areas of concern with the appropriate level of depth, but also consider that these documents can very quickly become overly technical and burdensome. It doesn't matter how wonderful the analysis is, it's not useful if no one reads it. So our handbook is designed to eliminate unnecessary fluff and ensure that every bit of information included is valuable. And finally, the EIA process needs to be systemic and replicable. An outside observer should be able to follow the entire process, understand the goals and the objectives. There's no smoke screens and no black boxes here. I do want to specifically highlight a section on stakeholder engagement because this is an absolutely vital core piece of this process. The first step is to identify high priority stakeholder groups. These groups are the ones that are most vulnerable to potential effects or changes due to the project. We want to specifically focus on spatial use conflicts. For seismic surveys, those are temporary, but they are critically important to those with commercial interests in that area. For example, fishing communities that may not be able to operate when the vessels in the vicinity for safety reasons would merit additional consideration. We also want to scale the level of engagement to the level interaction. Of course, fishing communities are an example where there's going to be a substantial interaction well before, during, and after the survey. And that leads us well into the next point I want to cover, which is our fishery interaction checklist. So this is a document that Energeo members use to ensure they are working correctly with the local community and have covered any potentially affected fishery stakeholders. The goal is always to minimize potential impacts on fish and on fisheries. The research demonstrates that changes in catchability are temporary and transitory, but local fishers are still displaced during operations. 
This checklist provides a route to cover all the basics where there are no specific stakeholder requirements, but can also be used to guide how exactly to work with fishery stakeholders during a process. The engagement process is divided into steps to take before, during, and after a survey. Not every step will apply for every operation, but it's important to review all the options and determine whether they're appropriate. Before a project begins, operators should conduct a thorough environmental, social, and health impact assessment. This is covered in the environmental assessment, which includes human and social health factors as part of the environment. So we want to assess whether there are any required or optional assessments which may make sense for the project in question. Next, we need to establish two-way communication with local stakeholders. This means that simply posting a bulletin or placing a newspaper ad, while it may be sufficient for the general community, is not enough for those key stakeholders like fishery operators. We want to make sure they've received the communication and respond so we can open up the dialogue. We also need to identify any maritime authorities in the area. These folks are critical to safe operations and can serve as the go-between while operations are underway. In some cases, a fishery li liaison officer can be particularly helpful, and this is especially important in areas where the project proponent might not have knowledge of the local language or culture, or if there are specific fishing techniques that require additional consideration. And finally, the crew needs to complete cultural awareness training. It's imperative that the survey crews are mindful of and respectful of local customs and recognize that they are newcomers to the area. Typically, the energy geoscience is the first contact that we have during energy development, and we want to make sure that we are the best possible ambassadors during that process. During operations, Energeo members are encouraged to remove and safely dispose of marine debris, including ghost fishing gear. In the last five years, our members have reported to us the removal of over two and a half million pounds of marine debris, and much more than that is never reported back to us. This is, of course, a huge benefit to all ocean users, but particularly important for fishers who are directly affected by ghost gear removing fish from the environment. This is also the time to engage in social projects that benefit the local community and beyond. These should be decided in advance in order to ensure that they meet the community's needs. And finally, communication during operations is absolutely essential to avoiding potential accidents. This can be direct with fishers or it can be identified during the pre-scoping process via fishery organizations or through maritime regulars as necessary. Once the survey is complete, we want to prioritize recording any potential grievances that arose during operations. Those cases need to be assigned to someone to manage them and see each one all the way through to resolution. Next, operators should engage with the scientific community to communicate any new environmental information that they may have gathered during the study. So I think the folks at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, who we heard from earlier today, are a great example of scientists that can take that information and use it to build a study that's going to answer the questions that may have arisen. And finally, we want to communicate with the local fishery community and address any immediate questions or concerns, but also identify areas for mutual growth in the future. I'm a firm believer that open, honest, and consistent communication breeds trust, and trust is how we all make progress. And finally, I want to touch on marine mammal mitigation measures because these are a part of ensuring that we have a healthy and thriving ecosystem. So before we dive into mitigation measures, I want to put into context what these measures are intended to prevent. First, I want to talk about measures intended to prevent hearing injury, and to do that, we need to define what is meant by injury. In this case, I'll define injury as a permanent threshold shift, which is a change in hearing ability over part of the hearing range that will not be recovered. And that differs from a temporary threshold shift, which returns to normal within hours or days. It's extremely unlikely that marine mammals will experience a hearing injury as a result of a seismic survey, and I only say unlikely because I'm a scientist and I don't like the word impossible. This is because seismic surveys don't produce a shock wave such as that associated with pile driving or explosives. Sound exposure levels, or SEL, which is a measure of energy flux over time, is typically a better metric for predicting the onset of TTS or PTS than sound pressure level, but SEL-based guidelines work best for tonal continuous sounds, and a seismic survey is the exact opposite of that. And because seismic survey sounds are broadband, the sound frequency needs to be weighted to the hearing capabilities of the animals. So it's a bit of a push and pull scenario, but the takeaway is that hearing injury or even temporary suppression is unlikely. And once we talk about injury, next question is, well, what about behavioral effects? 
I think the first point to mention here is that detection of a sound does not automatically mean any sort of impact will occur. Animals and people are constantly detecting and responding to stimuli in our environments. So this is obviously an oversimplification, but let's say for the sake of argument, your phone rings when you're about to eat lunch. You have some choices here. You can answer the phone, you can eat while you talk to whoever's calling you, or if you're like me and you're pregnant and you're hungry, you just go ahead and eat lunch and you call that person back later. So in all of those scenarios, you've not lost your opportunity to eat. You've either delayed it or you've chosen not to react to the stimulus. How serious the consequences of this disturbance are and what your response to that disturbance will be depend on your state in that moment. Are you pretty much content? Did you just have breakfast? Then waiting an hour or so might not be a big deal. Are you on the cusp of starving? You're probably going to listen to the phone ring while you go ahead and eat because missing that opportunity would be a big deal. If the phone rings right as you're about to eat every day, that may change things too. You might habituate to it and start ignoring it. You might choose to move away from that location at that time. It's all going to depend on what your specific response to the stimulus is. And this is effectively what a population consequences of disturbance approach aims to do at a population scale. So we're looking to answer the question, at what point do responses of individuals become biologically meaningful on the population level? The PCOT approach is a useful tool to separate biologically meaningful consequences from the insignificant behavioral reactions that constantly occur. And finally, it's important to note that sensitivity to anthropogenic sound is highly variable both within and between species. So some species that have been hunted extensively like bowhead whales in the U.S. Arctic are extremely responsive, whereas other species like bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico have lots of experience with anthropogenic noise and generally are not. But the specific response of each individual will vary, and those responses will vary based on the context. Obviously, there's a lot more to say on this topic, but I want to shift into mitigation measures, bearing in mind that the measures implemented are inherently precautionary and intended to mitigate potential effects that are unlikely to occur. There are two sets of mitigation and monitoring guidelines that we generally recommend our members follow if there are no prescribed guidelines in place. These are the JNCC guidelines from the UK and the IOGP and our GEO joint recommended guidelines. They're quite similar in terms of their content. Once we've decided on which guidelines to use, we move into the implementation stage. And this is what we typically think about when we discuss mitigation, the actual act of monitoring and mitigating in the field. So there's a number of important options, and it's important to select those measures that are proportional to the potential risk. Um, so let's talk about each of these options. They're in order of preference of application. So first is complete removal or modification of the sound producing activity. So this is difficult for geophysical surveys because producing sound isn't a byproduct of the activity. Producing sound is the activity. And the amount of sound produced is going to depend on the ge geologic features that are being imaged. So this is generally not an option for geophysics, but it can be for other activities like construction. Next is avoidance of known areas of importance or concern. So this can be accomplished in some circumstances when we know of specific areas, for example, seasonal breeding grounds or migration routes that are important. However, we also need to be mindful that not all cases can this be implemented in practice, so other factors might make this difficult. For example, if there's year-round presence or if there's seasonal presence that conflicts during the only time of year when it's safe to perform those operations. Option three is ramping up the sound source gradually, which increases the level of sound over a set period. And the idea behind this is to allow animals in the environment to detect that stimulus and move away if they should decide rather than suddenly introducing that sound into the environment. And the next method is detection and modification of sound output. So that would include things like shutdowns or power downs within a set proximity. Sound screening works quite well with stationary sources like pile driving. So that can include things like bubble curtains to minimize the sound propagating away from the site. And finally, we have acoustic deterrents like pingers, which are aversive and designed to move animals away from the area. So that's often used in aquaculture. Mitigation is always going to be a mix of science, standard practice, and common sense. So not everything always has a clear scientific basis, but the core is always science-based. The recommendation is that we start from that hierarchy of preferred mitigation measures we just talked about. So removal or avoidance, if possible, that sounds simple, but we need to keep in mind that the period of time when it's physically safe to do the operation might overlap with those periods. When we think of other mitigation measures, I think this quote sums up the goal quite well. The most effective way of eliminating risk is to separate the seismic activity from the animals in space and or time. 
In other words, mitigation or monitoring measures that affect the duration of a survey can conflict with this ultimate measure. So what we're ultimately attempting to do is minimize interactions. We need to balance that with responding in the moment versus implementing overly restrictive measures that have the opposite effect actually and increase the duration of the survey. Regarding some more specific measures, implementing a preclearance watch, um, preclearance watches are allowed to provide uh, sufficient time for animals to be detected and move away. Um, ramp up period, again, it's allowing animals to move away should they detect that sound in the environment. And we see a 500 meter uh, safety zone pretty uniformly integrated across the industry. Um, and why, why is that? So this 500 meter radius is based on those injury criteria that I mentioned previously. And for commercial seismic sources, 500 meters is a conservative distance for preventing potential injury to low frequency cetaceans, the large whales. And I emphasize that because mid and high frequency cetaceans, that distance is much smaller. If the threshold is reached at all, these animals usually cannot detect the low frequency the, where the majority of the energy in a seismic signal is concentrated. And hearing injury cannot occur if the sound is not detected because there's no mechanical response. So we want to be mindful of avoiding compounding precaution even further here, unless you have a source that is exceptionally different from the standard 500 meters is already precautionary. Adding more precaution actually makes the survey take a longer time and it makes it difficult to get this done within a period one that's allowed and safe for operations, but then it also increases the number of potential interactions in the environment. So a couple of key points that I want to leave you all today. First, communication is absolutely vital to ensuring a successful consultation process. We want to communicate early and often and really build that trust with our colleagues. And I think what we're doing today is a great start for that. Next, I cannot overstate the importance of local expertise, including indigenous communities, especially here. So especially in areas where exploration is occurring for the first time, it's imperative that we understand the local community and any applicable standards. We also need to ensure that all applicable stakeholders are engaged, and this means two-way communication for key stakeholders. This is not the time to be passive or assume that communication was sufficient. Early planning is critical to performing a robust analysis and allowing time for an iterative refinement process as necessary. And finally, we want to be proactive and realistic about mitigation. Energio and our members are proud to promote best environmental practice in the exploration geoscience industry, and I appreciate you having me with you today to share this with you. And with that, thank you all so much for your time. I'm happy to take questions during the Q&A, but please do feel free to reach out to me via email or phone if you have any additional questions. Thanks. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lurerio. Alex Lurerio is a scientific director at NGO Alliance, offering her thoughts on what makes a consultation meaningful and informative. And of course, precisely for that last point that you parted on, follow up, we now shall engage the question and answer session. And I'm hopeful that we will get some of the members of the audience to, and the drill is pretty obvious now, to stand next to a microphone need to confirm who is standing there and at that point and fire away. Comments and questions coming through from the online platform, which I will now take the opportunity to read out and direct to some of our presenters with the hospitals are alive to their name and the question posed to them whilst our audience members just sort themselves out. I shall fire away. Dr. Kim Prochaska, a question for you. What are the numbers of the total catch of abalone caught and how will the department assist in the establishment of said abalone farms? The question is not clear in relation to the time period, but I think you can give as accurate a reflection on numbers as possible. This is from Gary Kay for Dave van der Spey. Could the current speaker indicate the time it takes from license to explore to commercial production of gas stroke oil and the success rate of holes drilled versus productive wells? Two questions so far. For Mr. Manyaga from Richard, the price of oil determines the viability of our oil finds. 
what is very rough or what is a very rough estimate of the cost of the gas and oil to be extracted relative to present world prices? Those are the three questions I have. And just a reminder for those in the room and for those who are following online, if for whatever reason you feel as though your question has not been attended to or you just generally wish to make follow-up, kindly send an email to, open quote, events at petroleumagencysa.com. Events at petroleumagencysa.com. And in that email, state your question, preferably the person to whom you are asking or requiring um, further engagement so that the time lag between the question and the answer hopefully can be as little as possible. We are done with the online and virtual platform. We are now in the physical realm. I have one, two, three. Gentlemen here in front, please look at me. Mama, mama, sorry, you are number one. The gentleman with the cap is number two. The gentleman in black is number three. Data at the back is number four. And the gentleman in the front is number five. We have five questions from the floor. And then we are quickly going to have the responses. And then we shall be done. Number one. Uh, thank you, sir, for the um, platform. Uh, actually, I'm Fabian Mohammed again from Dwarangbai. Uh, this one is going to the DMR. Um, I have a concern. We as a community in Dwarangbai is having a concern which is uh, actually now happening at the present moment. There is a, a mining company, <laughs> uh, Transhex, who was having a mining right for C concession 13A, which did expire on the 11th of March 2020. This mining right, according to them, was valid for 30 years. Uh, after 11 of March 2020, the company Transhex changed the company name to Moonstone and renewed the mining right, which is now valid till the 8th of October, from the 8th of October 2021. To 7 of October 2051. And that includes our beach also. The environmental consultant of this company now, uh, of mining MDA, MDM, is called Arshin Resources. We as a community was having a concern and, and approached them regarding the mining activity. Uh, we asked them for the EA, that is an uh, environmental author authorization, they don't have. We asked them for an environmental management program, which subscribe the mining activity, the mitigation and the rehabilitation, because it concerns our, our bits. They don't have. Uh, they describe this area, which they are now actually active mining, that is about 31.9 meters below the low water tide to about one kilometer meter offshore. Uh, we are now actually cut off to a customary food security right because that site is now being declared a mining site. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Let's move on, please. The number two, the gentleman in the cap. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was looking at the Please class. just drop the mic, dear brother. We can't hear you quite. Thank you. That should be fine, hopefully. Uh, I was looking on the graphs there when the when doc, doctor there on the fisheries was talking. Uh, I see uh, the, there is a shortage of uh, species on our ocean. So I, I want to know how are they going to improve the, the law enforcement to protect these species against poaching? <laughs> and uh, it's more than even poaching. It's, it's about raiding now. They raid our ocean. So I want to know how they will improve the law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Number three, please. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, my question is for U Kim from the DFFE, I think. Uh, my first question is, what exactly did you mean when you spoke about illegal uh, fishing of abalone? Because there seems to be a problem when small-scale fishers and small-scale and small uh, fishermen are trying to make a living, they are then characterized as poachers. But then when Oceania and the likes are fishing and exploiting our people, they are not characterized as poachers. Meanwhile, they are the original poachers. They found our people there fishing. They got their, their rights, however they got them. And then today they continue to exploit them. So I want to understand that. Firstly, I want to understand what did you mean by uh, illegal fishing? Because this is the same terminology that is used by Oceana, uh, that they call them poachers and so on and so forth. Um, I also want to understand what is the DFFE's plan to support small scale fishermen, not only support them, uh, but also how are they going to make sure that they m move from being small scale fishers to being commercial uh, fishes and supplying big markets and not only being exploited by the likes of Oceana. I then want to move on to the oil and gas issue. Um, firstly, we understand the need for uh, domestic production of oil and gas, yes, we will, but we also, we also say to the oil and gas that they need to operate within the, within, sorry, they need to operate within the terms that are set by the local communities. So any oil and gas company that comes into South Africa needs to consult and make sure that the local communities are happy with what's going on. Excellent, excellent. No, I'm not done, my brother. I'm going to ask you to finalize, please, uh, champion. We're running behind time. You've asked three questions already. The third and final one goes to uh, the senior economist. So. SA seems to be the only country that is moving from fossil fuels to renewables throughout the whole of Africa and throughout the world without a proper phase. We, there's a report by the World Bank that says that in order for us to move to renewables, we need to increase our mining by 500%, and then also, which in turn means that we need to mine three billion tons of minerals. I don't know how we are going to do that. I don't know what's the plan of the, the DFFE and the DMRE because it seems as if we are being pushed into a direction and we are being forced to go into renewables without a solid plan. So we need to, conti we need to continue. Um, we need to, the oil and gas companies need to continue uh, exploring, but only on the on, but only on the terms of AMA, AMA communities, AMA local communities. We can't continue to have a situation where reports such as the Meridian reports are dictating the future of South Africa. So my final question to you: What is the plan? Because it seems as if we are just being pushed into a corner. Yeah. It seems as if we are we are just being pushed into a corner without there being a phased-in plan. Thank you. Number four, please. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, my name is Charles Jordan. Uh, questions for energy, whatever, and the deaf people of DFFE, because they're deaf. My question is like this. Who's to blame for the declining of the fishing stocks? The bylaws. Who's making the bylaws? Deaf people. Because why? I grew up in a village fishing village center in Abbey. And when I, before I went to school, on the age of nine, I'd been part and parcel of the fishing industry. There was a certain season for allowing our people to harvest the fish from January till July, August. Then the factory is closed. And then we, on January, the next season, you go to sea, there was, there was always fish there to harvest. We love him like kings at time. And I have to say it, it was under the apartheid regime. But since the 1994, everything changed. 
the bylaws change, the exchange, the marine living resources exchange, and we suffering now at the moment. And those telling seismic whatever, you must remember one thing, if I understand you right, you already issued the, uh, the concessions rights and stuff like that. 81, calling from 18, 1981, you're still busy and still issuing permits in whatever you need to drill. So why only come now? Come and address us now. Because why? You've been busy for the situation for how long? Since 1981 and now you come to the prison villages asking us. Now you're coming with, coming with a social economic, uh, whatever you call it, which we don't benefit. Talking about the, uh, the economy, we really don't benefit the economy because it's going to the departments in the government itself. 81, since 81, I never see one cent in person to our communities. Ministers or DDGs or DGs, whoever you are, it's time you wake up. Open your eyes and open your ears and listen to the people on the ground. We have been suffering for years. The local of the ANZ a better life for all. So we vote for the, the governing party now. DG, whoever you are, DG, whoever you are, it's time you come into the ground floor. Thank because you, sir. We, the people, have to govern. That is the ANC logo. But we can't govern because whatever you say, we must understood or be ignored. Time is up. Now your time is up. Thank Why you. Thank you, Oum. We have a very good time. We have a very number five. Weerens, kijk eens. Um, mijn vraag is aan die meneer die voor ik wil staan. Um, Ierland er al een geruime tijd al in ons zeewater. Zonen ons als communities, even over zonen indigenous. Nog iets en te zeggen dat ons koor het goed of ons het niet goed niet. Ons zijn niet onze steen developing niet. Maar om zonen die indigenous communities besluiten te nemen, is unacceptable. En dan wil ik ook vragen, als er enige iets een plek gezet voor die local vosse mannen, en praat ik speciaal voor die traditioneel lijn vosse mannen. Ik hoor u praat van 2020, het hele gedrol. 2020, van 2020, 2019 afval, krijg ons al beet seasons. Pas bij je mensen, wat kan samen stem. Rondom die seasons en oos as traditionele lijn vir sy manne, die local, die klein manne, wat die klein skuitjes het, moet die moutertjes sê toe gaan, ons krij nie meer vissie. As die groot skuire, wat die vis in die 45 mil, in die 16 mil, en daar verder gaan vang. Maar hier, die nie so, wat ons alle jare die vis vang, 5 mil, 6 mil, 7 mil, vang ons glad nie meer vis, vir die apelkloop 3 jaar, wat ons nie meer vang nie. En die hele drill al van 2020 al en afver drill die hele zonder onze consent. Nou ons sê vandag weer eens as ons een boodskap duidelijk aan die hele. Die hele moet uitkom die as die refusing community sê. Die is een paar van ons dat die sê. Ons kan nie besluiten nie namens onze vissers hier binnen nie. Hier die government moet uitkom na onze refusing community toe en kom luister wat hulle te sê rondom die oil en gas wat plek van binnen in hulle communities en ek gaan het weer sê duidelik van my kant af as chief van die katskorane royal is ons stel nie belang aan olie en gas in ons areas nie vooral nie in die westkaap en in die noordkaap nie stel ons glad nie belang aan hierdie goed nie van ons onse livelihoods wat hulle kom die stuur Kijk aan gans. Baie dankie, baie dankie. Dit is een belangrike vraag. Dave van de Spijs sal dit beantwoord. Gaan jy nie? Oké, aan wie is die vraag? Oom, asjeblief gauw, aan wie is die vraag? Die laaste vraag vir u. Aan die regering, nee. Misschien iemand van die regering sal een antwoord gee, 
Ich weiß nicht, wie man uns die Frage Bye, danke. Shall we have a response from Dave, closest to me? There were questions for you, so to the extent that there were questions for you, just come through, Dave, and respond. Okay, um, thank you. I, as far as I could work out, I, there were two questions um, for me. The first one was, um, what is the timeline from discovery of oil and gas to production? It's a very difficult question to answer, and it depends entirely on the circumstances. If it is oil, it is usually far easier to move to production more quickly. And I think the record held from discovery to production is still in West Africa, Ghana, um, who managed to move from discovery to production within three years. You saw that our own FA gas field took 12 years to move to production. Um, our smaller oil fields off Mossel Bay took around 10 years, eight to 10 years between discovery and production. Um, Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of huge discoveries of gas in Mozambique, world-class, massive, massive discoveries of gas in Mozambique. Those discoveries were made in 2010. That is 12 years ago. There's still no development of those. So I hope that answers the question from that gentleman. It's not a definitive answer. It entirely depends on what infrastructure is available, how the markets see it. Um, oil generally moves a lot faster. Then the second question I was asked is, what is the success rate of oil and drilling? When I started off, which in the oil and gas industry, which was a very long time ago, <laughs> 35 years ago, ye goodness. Anyway, the success rate that was regarded as good was around 10%. These days, technology to work out what is going on subsurface has vastly improved. Um, and I must say, the latest drilling that we have had in South Africa, the success rate has been 100%. So things have certainly improved. Um, in that field. Then I'm going to try and do justice to translating um, the question that was, was posed in Afrikaans from the traditional leader gentleman over there. He said, is there anything put in place for small-scale fishermen, for line fishermen, um, by government. There has been drilling, he is aware and heard now today that there's been drilling in 2020. Um, what was put in place for the very small scale fishermen? Small scale fishermen go out in small boats. They work close to shore. They are working um, in an area between five to six miles from shore. Um, and he has he reported that there are just no fish in that area. Correct, sir? This is what you're saying, yeah? He wants to also um, say that government must come and speak to them, must come and speak to this community, must get permission from them to go into these areas, must hear what government has to say about oil and, I mean, what, what that community has to say about oil and gas, he also made it very clear that that community, and he said it twice, that community, the community of small-scale fishers who go out into shallower waters close to shore do not want oil and gas exploration in their area. I'm not too sure who that statement was for though. I am not going to try and answer it. <laughs> Hi again. Um, I'm the lucky one. I got the most questions. 
Um, the first one was an online question. It was about uh, what are current abalone catches. Um, so currently the abalone total allowable catch is set at uh, 50 tons per year and uh, that total allowable catch has been caught over the last few years. There was also a question in there about abalone farms. Um, I just want to uh, say that in fisheries we are a team um, and you have asked, uh, you've asked me questions that are team questions, which are not necessarily my questions. So we have other people who are more expert on some of these areas than I am. Um, so the issue on farms would uh, generally go to our aquaculture section. Um, as you know, there are a number of abalone farms around the coast. Those have been farms that have been started generally uh, privately uh, by people. Um, but there are, um, as far as I'm aware, there are uh, plans to get small, smaller scale uh, abalone farming operations uh, going around the coast. These are, go these are going to be um, uh, ranching operations, so in sea farming as opposed to on land farming. But for more details, I will need to refer you to my colleague who I I'm sure you know, uh, Mr. Bellamani Somali. Um, the second question was on this side at the back. There was a question about law enforcement. Um, so I think, uh, I think there's a lot of things that the department does in law enforcement that uh, people just don't know about. Um, so in terms of the bigger picture, uh, we do have a thing called a vessel uh, monitoring system for all, f for all of the larger fishing vessels. It doesn't operate for small ones, but it operates for big ones. Uh, to monitor those vessels, we also have a, um, uh, um, we call it the ops room. We have a we have a, a setup with technology in our department, which uh, people sit there and watch screens and they watch fishing vessels moving around. That also ties into the international uh, automatic identification system for vessels, so we can see when foreign vessels are entering our waters. Um, they can also see on those screens if those foreign vessels are just driving through our waters, which they are perfectly allowed to do, or whether they're slowing down and then it's suspected that they're fishing. If we suspect they're fishing, we then uh, send patrols out to go and uh, see what those guys do. And you know that on some occasions we have caught some uh, foreign vessels in our waters, which is a good thing that we've caught them. I think we're fairly confident that... Um, we are good at detecting foreign vessels coming in and uh, attempting to fish in our waters and to, to shut them down. Uh, then we also have inshore patrol boats that patrol the inshore waters and you know some of those small red boats. Um, and then we have the, the foot soldiers on the ground, the fishery control officers, the ones you know as inspectors. Um, we also engage in, uh, through Operation Bakisa in joint enforcement agencies with SAPS um, and various other enforcement agencies, including uh, on occasion the Defence Force when that is made available, when that facility is made available. So those are some of the things that we do in terms of, of law enforcement. Uh, the, the illegal fishing that I was talking about in relation to abalones, to answer the gentleman from the back here. Um, so I'm talking about the large scale illegal fishing of abalone, which is driven through, uh, it's primarily driven through, um, through Asian syndicates. It's linked to drugs and, uh, and organized crime. I wasn't uh, pointing fingers at, uh, at local communities uh, in that regard. Um, but in relation to that question, there was a big question on small-scale fisheries development, and I would like to call my, uh, my colleague Abangili up here because he is the master of uh, small-scale. Thank you. And Abu, just before you start, can I just finish on mine, and then I can sit down, relax, and enjoy your answer. Um, so the question from the back on that side 
uh, was about fish bylaws and who makes them. Um, and I think there's different levels of regulations on fisheries. Um, you know that we have the Marine Living Resources Act, which underpins everything that we do in relation to fisheries. That act also has regulations that go with it. And then each fishery also has permit conditions that, uh, that fishers need to, to abide by. Um, the different levels of regulations have to get adopted at different, uh, different levels of governance. Um, and so, and we do those appropriately as is required uh, by the law. Thank you, and then I'll hand over to Abel Gili. Thanks, Abel. Thanks, Kim. Um, maybe just to respond to the issue of the small-scale fisheries sector and the need to support them. Maybe let me start also and add on the issue of poaching. I think we can agree that poaching is a serious problem that is a threat to the livelihood of fishing communities. And we have to deal with it. Uh, I think uh, with all the partners that are involved in that particular process, we have to deal with the sketch of poaching because that is a threat to fishing communities. Then in terms of providing support to the sector, I think it's one of the uh, priorities of government in ensuring that we provide the necessary support to all the communities that have been allocated fishing rights. And there is a lot of progress in that regard in the Eastern Cape, in the Northern Cape, and in KwaZulu-Natal. And we are putting our energies on the Western Cape. The reason why in the Western Cape we have not done so as yet, we have to formalize the sector. And we are starting, hopefully, by this coming September, in recognizing small-scale fishers uh, formalizing them into small-scale fishing cooperatives and also allocating 15-year fishing rights. Coupled with that is identification of the support programs that will be required and also for the department to facilitate for those uh, support programs. Thank you. Yeah, that, just to respond to questions related to us and... and my colleagues will assist where, where you know, I'm missing something. Um, I'll start with a question regarding the mining right by Transex, um, of which they're saying they don't have environmental management plan and they don't have environmental authorization. And that license has since changed hands. Um, as we all might be aware, South Africa was operating under the Minerals Act of, of 1991 um, before... before 2002, actually, when the MPRDA uh, was, was passed by Parliament, but that became effective in 2004. During that period, companies were, would have the environmental management program that they operate under, and not the environmental authorization. So when the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act was introduced and became effective in 2004, there was a requirement now to say we should beef up the environmental requirements so that we can safeguard our, our environment. So it's those licenses that were granted after 2004 that will have some form of environmental authorization. However, trans has for sure, because they were operating under the old order, which was in terms of the Minerals Act of 1991, they should be having environmental management plan. Um, secondly, regarding the change of hands um, in terms of that license, the law allows for that in terms of Section 11 of the Act. Um, however, whenever licenses exchange hands, the new company that is taking over must demonstrate that they've got financial and technical ability to take the project forwards, as, all, as well as complying with the, with the other terms and conditions of the license. Um, however, if my, because I'm not familiar with the matter, if, if my answer is not satisfactory, although we can link um, the, 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 the member who has asked question with the regional office, office so that they can contact them. Um, the other question is regarding the country being forced to move to renewables and uh, and. Um, we believe that they believe that the country is not ready for that. Uh, just to respond to that, I think 
the country the country's blueprint in terms of energy now is the is the integrated resource plan which is the policy of government and if you zoom deep into that it it talks to energy mix which means renewables it allows for there's still 3000 megawatts of gas that is still needed and even coal is still is still um, included there as one of the technologies that should provide energy for the country um, so as as the country there's a whole lot of noise about us having to to move from fossil fuel to 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 to, to renewable energy, but we will do that systematically according to the to the policy of government. That's how I will, I will respond to that question. Then there was a question online um, regarding the prices um, that 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 was used in in actually arriving at the conclusion with regard to the socio-economic benefit. Um, the base case. Uh, with regard to that, that was used in, in that study was the $70 per, per barrel. So whenever that price reduces, um, there is, it brings more, more risk to the project, and which means it might end up not even making profit at the end of the day. So that was the base price that was used. Understanding that is a guess, um, but it, they, used, they converted that into energy equivalent. Um, to, to, to arrive at the $70 oil price. Um, lastly, there was a question or a concern that, uh, yes, we need to develop oil and gas, but there need to be consultation um, as before the companies operate. That's the reason why we, we have even this engagement. So that, so that we allow communities to have voice before any, any license, whether exploration or production is granted. Thank you. That concludes then, ladies and gentlemen, this session. I am advised that we should please take a five minute break because the last session will be a very truncated session and closing remarks and especially because the program in the greater sense is not concluded by the conclusion of today, but rather there will be remarks from the authorities and the department about the minister's presence tomorrow. That is Minister Gwedema Ndashe, and all that relevant information will be canvassed in the next session, which will start five minutes from now. So let's just take a quick leg break, coffee, do what you will. In five minutes, strictly please, because of the time constraints we have, we're going to get moving on together with that truncated panel, which will be moderated. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.
Let's try and gather, please. Let's try and gather. I had said five minutes. That was my instruction. I intend to hold on to that. If you look at your program presentation seven, how the upstream offshore oil and gas industry can coexist with the fishing industry, that shall be combined in the panel discussion to be moderated by Mr. Sam Kokeli. So Robin Sutherland, the seismic researcher, scientist, expert, will still have his say just in a panel setup as opposed to the monologue that it was initially planned for. Please may I ask that we take up our positions so that we can have the quick and fiery final session with Mr. Sam Mkokelu, who will introduce the panel and its speakers. Some are returning from earlier submissions today. And of course, we will have the official closing remarks from Mayor Bonengambule, the Chief Director in the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Mr. Mkokeli, I shall now yield the platform to you, and I will allow you to work your magic with the crowd. You're a strong woman. <laughs> if we could kindly settle down, please, ladies and gentlemen. Doctor, please. Uh, we've changed it. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sam Kokeli, uh, accompanied here by uh, Triforsa. Triforsa reminds me of a time uh, almost a decade ago when we were saying our final goodbyes to Babu Madiba. Uh, President Obama gave in a, a beautiful uh, delivery, and there was somebody who delivered the message and told us about prawns, prawns, prawns. Horses and horses and horses. Maybe the gentleman had good foresight to tell us about uh, the importance of this conversation as we uh, get on uh, today uh, with uh, the important uh, conversations. We'll go through this conversation. I'm going to be very, very brief. I'm going to be running through it like somebody who's on a horse and rushing to have uh, those prawns, uh, that gentleman. They called him Bombi, uh, the sign language interpreter uh, for that uh, beautiful memorial uh, we had. Uh, I'm rushing through because... Very shortly, we're going to lose the audience uh, on the stream on the Sunday Times Live and YouTube uh, account, but we'll carry on with the conversation here, and we'll make sure that they get to hear about uh, the outcome uh, of the event. Do join me now as we have a wonderful conversation, uh, taking in what has happened uh, during uh, the day. You've met Mr. Loiso Pantua, Fish SA already. Uh, you've seen some change in the program. Robin Sutherland, such a seismic, uh, is joining right next to me. Uh, after this, uh, Dr. Pindila Masangane will give an address that wraps up everything that uh, we have talked about. 
another wonderful woman on the program, Megan Rogers, a director, Cliff Dacre Hofmeyer, and Donovan Fandi Yeden completes our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Donovan, let's start with you. Forgive me, I'm going to throw 120 seconds at you. You give us your take on uh, the, today's proceedings. What is the biggest thing that uh, you've picked up today? What did we miss? You've got 120 seconds. First of all, I have to, restart, I have to start respectfully um, saying that what, I, what you will hear me saying here today is merely a repeat of the voices that you've already heard. Um, so I will merely reiterate and speak out those voices and messages a bit louder so that you who need to listen that I hear of the other stakeholders from the petroleum industries, from government, whoever, so that we can be sure that you are listening to us. So for me, one of the lessons even that I take from this is that we need more effective listening. And when I say more effective listening, I don't even want to go yet into the detail of what we're discussing. I want to start with the process of effective listening. You heard the challenges that we had here today with regards to language barriers, etc., with regards to time constraint. You know, you've got one minute to present, but we come from communities that we present hardcore issues where we never get listened to, and now you get yeah. this opportunity and then you're silenced within a minute, okay? So bear with me when I say this is a great example of exactly this process now of petroleum jelly, I mean, of pet uh, gas and petroleum and uh, exploration of um, whatever developments that industry chooses okay. to undertake versus the community, and it's because there's, people are not listening. Let me interrupt you there because I want to listen to you. Part of the exercise of listening is that I throw back at you so that I fully understand. Somebody isn't listening. Who is that one person, if you could just give me that, or institution? Uh, government isn't listening. Thank you very much. Please hold on to that. We're going to come back uh, to the uh, particular... Uh, we're going to move right across in a line. But Lois, you spoke yes. earlier. A question was thrown at you about uh, these uh, seismic uh, surveys and uh, research. You s talked about the research that hasn't been done yet. A lot of research has been thrown back at you. What do you take out of all of it? Well, I wouldn't say some it was uh, thrown back uh, at us, but I would, I mean, of course, we, 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 we accept that there would have been research in other parts of the world, like you, you've seen with, with the Australian example. But it's, it's, but it's very limited. It still doesn't speak to, uh, you know, the South African context, one. Number two, it still has not engaged. Uh, you know, the broader community of the marine science, including some of the, uh, you know, the, the science people we use. We, our position is that it's inadequate. And of course, that is born out of, out of the interactions we have had as well, both within the department and also with the, with, the, with the industry itself. It's not to say we discard it completely, but in terms of the scope and the understanding of the fisheries and the multidimensional aspect of our industry, it hasn't touched it. Those, uh, uh, those aspects. And of course, there's inherent weakness in the research because it's looking at, at, at this time. It will look now what it, is, what it is performing. So it doesn't look you know, further down the years what will happen because that's not the mandate right now. The mandate right now is to go and, 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 and explore gas and you know, uh, 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 try to minimize the, the, the impact within the area where the explosion is taking place. But we're looking at a very delicate situation here in terms, of, in terms of resources. But also, again, there are many different sectors that are affected. And often, the data that's currently available is probably uh, not enough. And I'm not a scientist uh, uh, in saying that. Uh, and I think uh, you know, uh, my colleague here is going to come in on this one. But the country has not built enough you know, a warehouse of data on our, on, on our shores on this question. So we think that needs to improve in a manner that collaborates, of course, with the different stakeholders. Okay. Uh, you and me, both uh, same uh, WhatsApp group. We're not scientists. The closest I am to science and social science is probably not going to help anyone here. You say the research and science and the outcomes of it are probably not uh, adequate. I would imagine information out of Australia, out of uh, the waters of Australia, applies to South Africa. You extrapolate from that. We can't wait 25 years uh, for development and we'll hold it off because the research has not taken off. We use the research and extrapolate from the research we're getting. So this, we make an assumption, an informed assumption, and then we put up mitigating factors. 
don't you think? Uh, no, no. I think, I think we would have to look at uh, our industry, the uniqueness of our industry, the potential of our industry as a fishing community, uh, uh, and, and, and the contribution that it, that, that it makes. And over and above that, that very same study is, is of itself limited. I mean, you, you had, they were looking at uh, adult fish, for example, and there were many other aspects scientifically that they didn't look at in terms of the full cycle uh, of, of some of these marine resources. And I'm not only talking about the fish, but you're also talking about the entire ecosystem, which has a bearing on, 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 on what we harvest out of the sea. Okay. So ultimately, while having a comparative study is definitely encouraged, but you need unique data that looks at species that are endemic on, in your waters. And over and above that, uh, I don't think there is much comparison we can make with Australia in all respects. I think okay. we've got to develop our own data, our own research protocols, and also borrow from international best practice. But we can't say because in Australia they have done the research and therefore you know, we, we, we pass that on. It's a tick box, box exercise. So we can't do that. I think that would be irresponsible to do that. Uh, as a, again, we accept okay. the experience internationally, but we think the data must be developed within our waters and it has, to be, it has to speak to our own unique environment in our ocean. Okay, before you, Jonathan said, <laughs> Jonathan said the government must listen, and you, I'm sure the government is here uh, listening uh, to what you are saying. I'm loving the theme uh, that's building out. Uh, Megan, uh, welcome. Thank you. Your take on today's proceedings and this broadly, the conversation. I think the, um, and these are important platforms and and um, dialogues um, and forums. And I think that the, the department has done particularly well. I think there has been a listening element. We're here today because they listened. They said create a forum so that we can engage with you. I think that comes through in, in these colloquiums, this of course being the second colloquium. Um, engagement is, is critical, but also information sharing and that listening element needs to flow both ways. The, um, this is, the oil and gas sector in particular is a very scientific, very complex sector. And um, you're not going to get it at the first bite of the apple, so to speak. So it, it, it requires constant engagement, constant um, information sharing, knowledge management, so that we upskill as South African people. Um, we understand the industry better. We understand the processes better. And the misconceptions are essentially removed in relation to the oil and gas processes through our learning um, and through the knowledge flow from, from oil companies, the departments, to, um, to the communities, the fishing communities, you know, the average man on the street. Um, this, I believe, is the start or at least the continuation of that form of engagement. So I welcome the initiative. I think it's a fantastic platform, um, and I hope that we continue to engage at, at this level and at these platforms and these numbers. Um, so phenomenal initiative from my perspective. <coughs> Difficult engagement, always. Um, we have many rights as South Africans. Um, we have fishing rights, we have oil and gas rights, we have constitutional rights, and it's about how we balance those rights. It's about how we mediate to create that equilibrium, that coexistence, um, ultimately, is, is what this platform seeks to, seeks to achieve and um, engage on. Okay. Uh, Mr. Robin Sutherland, Searcher, Seismic. Great pity we missed out on your presentation earlier because we're enjoying everything about this event and the time got in the way. But let's hear a little bit from you and what you take out uh, of today's proceedings and also what you would have shared uh, with us uh, very briefly before we lose uh, the uh, uh, colleagues and compatriots and everybody who's watching us online. So can I start with what I would have shared? Um, we are right in the middle of a consultation process at the moment, which is obviously very topical with this, this discussion. We can see that, that we're improving on how we did it last time. Uh, we recognize there were some deficiencies there, and we want to continue to improve. And we really uh, appreciate everyone being here to help us to improve, because the questions you ask helps us do that. I, I, was, I observed some of these consultations. Remember, these are independent consultations done by the environmental um, assessment practitioner. 
So our presence there is somewhat uh, concerning because sometimes people feel we're getting them to just do that tick box exercise because we're there supervising. That's not the case at all. I was there to observe and to understand what the concerns are. And to me, they, they fell into four main categories. First one is that we impact the actual fishing activities themselves. Uh, Luiso commented earlier that we'll say yes, but we have mitigations in place. We don't. The environmental assessment practitioner writes those mitigations to say these are the problems, these are the mitigations. The DMRE approves that report after consultation, obviously, with everyone concerned. And then we live by that rule book. We have to obey those rules. They're not our mitigations. They are given to us by those that know, because we're geophysicists. We don't understand what goes on in the sea. We don't have that knowledge. So I just wanted to make that point. The second one is that on the subject of ocean health, biodiversity, and fishery sustainability, um, there were some mentions today about Norway, and I wanted to bring that up as an example. Uh, that is an area where fisheries and the oil and gas business certainly coexist, and they, recognized, they are recognized as a world example of that. They have a sovereign wealth fund of $1.3 trillion, which has been built up on the back of oil and gas business, which has allowed them to invest in all sorts of things, including decarbonizing their economy. 85% of new cars in Norway are electric, full electric vehicles because they're subsidized by the government. So Norway is a big gas producer, big oil producer, a massive fish producer. They sold $12.8 billion worth of marine produce last year. So those industries are coexisting magnificently. And the only mitigations they have, which were mentioned earlier by the marine scientist, are that they avoid migrations, and they avoid spawning areas during spawning times. South Africa, you do not acquire seismic between July and October, the snook breeding season, for instance. So we feel that, that the scientists have informed us what to do in that environment, and we've mitigated properly. Now, there will be an assessment report coming out, which will be open for consultation. We'll be having another round of meetings, and we hope everyone will be there to consult with us to explain to us where you disagree and see if we can get to some landing on how this should work. Uh, the third part, and there's something again raised by the communities on the West Coast, is climate change. We think it's imperative to explore for oil and gas in order to assist South Africa on its climate change journey. You may find that a little odd. Uh, it's not what oil and gas people are normally saying. There are still deniers in the industry, but whatever. South Africa is a very heavy user of coal. Its economy is largely based on coal. And I want to give you two examples of where that's detrimental to South Africa's climate change journey. ESCOM produces over 200 million tons of CO2 a year. That's just ESCOM. And that's almost half of South Africa's total emissions. We could reduce that by two thirds by using gas in combined cycle plants for base load instead of coal. Okay, so the, the long-term plan to, to continue to use coal we think is detrimental to South Africa's climate change ambitions and commitments and that replacing that with gas will have a big impact. The second one is oil, believe it or not. Uh, Sasol Secunda plant is the biggest single emitter of CO2 in the world produces 57 million tons a year to create 160,000 barrels of oil products a day. Conventional production and refining would produce five or six million tons a year, a tenth of what Sasol produces through their coal to liquids technology. They produce a massive amount of CO2. But it's wrong for South Africa, in our view, to move away from that because it's a domestic resource of hydrocarbon products that is very, very important and it pays a lot of tax, but it generates a huge amount of CO2. If we can find domestic oil resources, we can replace that coal to liquids plant. There's no need for it anymore and we can be, be protected against these oil price spikes that we're seeing that are causing everyone grief. There was a taxi driver strike here yesterday on the very subject of the cost of fuel. It's important that we protect ourselves against this. I'm not, I'm not saying that we're going to solve the world's problems. I'm just saying these are why, in the South African context, oil and gas is actually very important. 
The fourth one was, well, how do we benefit? How does South Africa let and how do local... You, let me interrupt yes, you. Sorry. Please allow me to be rude. Now, what are you talking about uh, the importance uh, of uh, this conversation in the context of oil prices? And uh, There was an article uh, during the week uh, from Youth Formation, uh, SIAC. Uh, it talks about the various issues uh, uh, in our economy and the importance of building uh, capacity for refineries and also there seems to be correlation between oil-producing economies and uh, fuel prices. So topics like this, we probably don't have enough time to get into, but your submission here is something I wish I could read in an op-ed uh, one day and uh, we get to further detail about it. But I have to move, uh, mm. Donovan. Donovan, let's come back to you. Listening, at what point do we satiate your need uh, to, uh, for, uh, to be heard? Because there has to be a difference between being heard and agreeing with you. Tell me, at what point will you be happy? So... This is, this is a good start. How are we engaging here today? It's just a pity that it's a little bit late. Because these kind of engagements should have already taken place, as you've heard from the floor. The exploration is already happening. And we're sitting here while it's already happening and communities are already suffering, they're already complaining, they're already seeing the results in the fish stocks that, are, that have moved from the areas, etc. So while this is a good engagement, it's a good start, it's a little bit late. Um, coupled with that, it should be what I think the intention of this as a start is, as a next step to take it to grassroots level. As one of, one of our, our, our leaders said earlier, he, he doesn't represent, this doesn't represent, our presence rather doesn't represent as a few years, leaders and representatives, doesn't represent our community's sentiments, our community's feelings. So grassroots level engagement is really where it should be taking place. The community should be actively part of this. So in saying that, I want to disagree with the gentleman that says uh, consultation. And yes, some people dismiss it as um, mere semantics. For us, it's not just mere semantics, participation versus consultation, etc. It's real. For us, consultation means you come to our communities and it's a tick box exercise. You come and tell us what you're going to do. You don't engage with us about the consequences, etc., etc. Let me interrupt so, you, please. If you could write the memorandum for consultation, what would it say, very briefly? It should be active participation. English, so please. What does active participation mean? So, engaging with communities. We were, we were victimized um, by one of the speakers the other day by saying, uh, oh, the reason why they can't actively communicate with us in communities is because there's so many differences between, within one community between different leaders, etc. You know, but that's kind of victim blaming. It's kind of putting the blame back to us, that we are the problem now. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? We should start looking at those issues and rectifying those kind of insults to our community. Um, because we are definitely not okay. to blame. We want to engage, we're not anti-development, as once again one of our leaders said, but it's how you engage us, and it's at what level you engage us. My sister said, for argument's sake, um, it's about information, and I also said information, but coupled with government, coming with the information, it's more than just information that we need from government. Information is important, knowledge is important, we need education as well. You know, you, we could, for argument's sake, let me, let me take the moment to make an example. These kind of discussions, if we learn from countries abroad like Japan, etc., why are they so advanced? Because these kind of issues are tackled in the, at primary school level, at high school level. The chill, our future generations that are going to suffer if there's bad negative consequences of this. You know, we need to educate. My, my son needs to be educated on this when he reaches primary, high school, and he needs to be sitting yeah, much more empowered than what I am. You know what I mean? My knowledge comes from Google research, being out at sea, seeing the, 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 the results of um, big uh, 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 factory ships from Russia, um, the bycatches that are left floating on the ocean, etc., etc. I would love to see my son and our sons and daughters sitting here tomorrow much more empowered, educated on these subjects in a better way than we are today. Okay, okay. So the audience agrees with you. The audience agrees with you there. Sorry, one last point which is very important coupled with that. 
because it just speaks it just speaks to that point as well. The gentleman, you said um, scientific data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's one of the big problems that we have in communities that you need to understand. We don't have a we have, there's a great mistrust towards science and scientists because you do not engage us at that level when you do the research. You do not incorporate. Once again, I'm reiterating what's been said. You do not incorporate our indigenous knowledge and skills. You know, so we don't trust science. You know, we don't trust the data because if you look at the stocks, well, the examples have been made. Um, we get told that there's not enough crayfish in the ocean. Then you see how many tons of crayfish get washed out at shore. And it's like, but the scientific data was bullshitting us. Sorry to say that. But yeah, interesting. But also be mindful of the anecdotal evidence versus <coughs> scientific evidence because what I see and feel, it's as simple as the weather. Whenever it gets cold, it feels like the worst day ever. By scientifically, somebody says, wow, the coldest day was actually 1988. But anyway, let's say goodbye to our audience online. We carry on uh, with this conversation, Jonathan. But we're also going to be mindful, Jonathan, of making uh, the string endless. And when we say we want this, we want our sons to know this. At the same time, development has to take place. Uh, jobs must be created. And we must agree at least on a minimum program and find consensus on uh, particular issues. Uh, are we able to find consensus as South Africans uh, as to where we are and what meaningful uh, consultation is? Well, I think broadly we can find consensus. I mean, in the country where the product, post-94, where the product of, uh, uh, you know, uh, CODESA negotiations and oh, yes. finding each other, there's no reason why we cannot. Now, all the players in this space need to act and play their part. They know now what the law is. The Constitutional Court has told us what a, a consultation that passes the legal master is. There is a nice definition given in the, in the law uh, what the court will accept as, a, as, as, as consultation. If you go into various cases, I don't want to, uh, to mention them, but I mean the oil and gas industry knows those cases. And I'm not mentioning it because they lost in some of those, but it is a fact. They know that it's not a tick box exercise. But now, besides that, if you just simply pass that responsibility to the industry and leave out the regulators and leave out the lawmakers, then you will have a problem because they, they, they are not there. They are not there to do necessarily the developmental agenda of the fishing community or even the small scale. They are there to look for the resource and ensure that the resource is available, important as it is. However, the regulator then needs to say, if the constitutional court defines consultation this way. Then let's, go to, let's go to all the affected stakeholders to develop a protocol. And then that protocol, then everybody gets to know that if it is not done this way, then it's going to fail. Then there will be no need to go to court down the line. There will be no need to halt projects that would otherwise go through if that was developed. So an initiative like this needs to result into a protocol, takes into account what uh, my brother on my left was talking about from a community point of view, from the commercial industry, including labor, by the way, because we employ quite a number of people as well, including the industry. And also the other sector that is probably not here, which is uh, the conservation sector that is looking after some of the animals in, in, in our sea. Now, once that protocol is developed, you will see less and less of these tensions because everybody will know what consultation means, what has been taken into account, who does these environmental assessments and what within that is, has to be looked at. Because in most instances, we get hundreds of emails, even as a fishing industry, being told that we're going to block C and we will be drilling. And of course, we have to accept because, well, this is a company that was approved. And I'm not taking any jab on them. But the reality is, do we even know that that company has capacity to look at all these other factors that affect the modern life that affect the resource in the sea, that will affect the resource down the line. We don't know, because again, we don't have a protocol, so who really can tell that that environmental assessment, including the proposal that uh, my brother here spoke about in terms of the mitigation. If they come up with a mitigation and say, well, in order to mitigate here, yeah, this is what you need to do. But we, we, we doubt the capacity in the first place because there is no protocol. You know, in other industries, before you can undertake but let me check. that important work, he sorry, doesn't, He doesn't, <laughs> forgive me, my brother. He doesn't say the, the mitigating factors are theirs. 
They are there, they've been established, there's rules and there's laws, there's NEMA. So the mitigating factors are already there. Am, am I missing you? No, no, I don't disagree with that. No, certainly, I don't disagree with that. But what I'm disagreeing with, uh, of course, is that at the end of the day, if we have a protocol that speaks to what my brother on my left was talking about on consultation, the tensions would be less. So we don't want to rely only on the legislation because even that, the adequacy of those legislations themselves speak to the challenges you often find of people running to court to stop these projects. By the way, the fishing industry accept the coexistence of you know, other industries in, you know, in terms of sharing the modern special life. We have no problem with that, but it 